Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our colleague, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments, idol natin, kaibigan po natin, isang masipag na mababatas na uh, marami ng uh, bihasa din po sa usapin ng constitutional amendments at inikot na po ang Republika para maghiring dito. So gusto natin madinig ang kanyang panig dito dahil alam natin na uh, very strong views ang uh, hawak niya dito at uh, napag-aralan niya na mabuti. So thank you for uh, allowing the creation of the subcommittee, uh, uh, Senator Robin, Chairman Robin, at uh, we'll give you first crack uh, for your uh, opening remarks, sir. A'udhu billahi mina shaitanu rajim, bismillahi rahmanu rahim. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Isang uh, pagbati po ng isang magandang magandang umaga po. Isang bagong umaga para sa inang bayang Pilipinas. At ako po ay uh, uh, umaapaw po ang kaligayahan sa aking puso sapagkat yung akin pong uh, idol senator na uh, yun pong matatawag kong uh, isa sa mentor ko po dito sa uh, Senado ay akin pong uh, kasama at uh, siya po ang uh, chairman ng subcommittee na ito. Alam niyo po, isa pong uh, karangalan talaga na isang, uh, isang senador na abogado, isang senador na ekonomista, siya po ngayon ang uh, chairman ng subcommittee na ito. Maraming salamat po sa usapin na yan. Sa mga taga-Pangulo po, uh, dadating naman po ang ating uh, ginoong Pangulo. Babanggating ko na rin po siya. Maraming salamat sa aming uh, ginoong Pangulo, uh, Senator Big Subiri, sapagkat uh, siya po ang uh, namuno sa hakbang hakbangin na ito na maamendahan ang uh, economic provision sa Saligang Batas. Ako po ay sumasaludo sa aming uh, uh, ginoong Pangulo. Ako din po ay uh, nagbibigay pugay kay uh, Sir Gary Teves, ang akin pong tumatayong economic advisor. At uh, ako po ay naliligayahan at uh, kasama po natin siya ngayon uh, bilang isang uh, atin pong uh, uh, resource speaker. At ganun din po ang aking kaibigan na si Orion. Sir, maraming salamat po at nandito po kayo. Noong paman, batid naman po ninyo ang aking damdamin tungkol sa pag-amyenda ng ating saligang batas. Simula nang ako ay mahalal bilang senador at may talagang tagapangulo ng kumiting ito, ay isinulong na po ng inyong lingkod ang mga mungkahing susog, partikular sa mga pang-ekonomiyang probisyon na sa aking paniniwala ay nagiging hadlang sa ating pag-arangkada tungo sa tunay na pag-unlad. Subukan po nating lagyan ng unteksto. Ang ilan sa mga economic provision sa 1987 Constitution na hinahangad nating amendahan ay minana pa po natin sa mga naunang saligang batas. Marami-rami ng dekada ang nakalipas. Ito po ang panahong sariwa pa sa kaisipan at damdamin ng mga bumalangkas ng Constitution ang napakahabang mga taon ng pananakop na mga dayuhan sa ating bayan. Kaya't pinalakas ang Filipino first. Ito ang prinsipyong isinasaisip at isinapuso ng mga delegado. Fast forward po tayo sa kasalukuyan. Ano po ba ang kinaharap ng Pilipinas bilang isang bansa sa kontemporaryong panahon? Meron pong isang termino, globalisasyon. By definition, Globalization is the word used to describe the growing interdependence of the world's economies, cultures, and populations brought about by cross-border trade in goods and services, technology, and flows of investment, people, and information. Sa isang kalungkutan, ang mahigpit na probisyon po sa ating saligang batas ay hindi na angkop sa pandaydigang kalakaran sa ekonomiya. Nabanggit na rin po natin ito noon. Sa kasalukuyan ng ating bansa ay pangatlo sa 83 na ekonomiya. Sa pinakamahigpit sa mga regulasyon, regulasyon 
base sa foreign direct investment regulatory restrictiveness index ng Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. Base sa foreign direct investment attractiveness scorecard noong 2020, ang Pilipinas ay nasa dulo. 13th sa 14th na ekonomiya sa Asia Pacific. Pang 13th po tayo sa 14th na ekonomiya sa Asia Pacific. Batid naman po nating sinubukan na itong gamutin sa pamamagitan ng pagpasa ng Public Services Act. Subalit nga po, nung ating binigyan diin nung nakaraan at binanggit din ng ating Senate President Juan Miguel Subiri, ang nakabimbing pang-question po nito sa Korte Suprema ay nagbibigay pa rin ng alinlangan sa mga dayuhang mamumuhunan. Ito po ang dahilan kung kaya't hindi pa tayo makaarangkada sa implementasyon ng batas. Sa paghahain po ng resolusyon bilang anim ng ating mga iginagalang ng mga senador, Senate President Subiri, Senadora Ligarda at Senador Angara, natutuwa po ako na mabibigyan ng pagkakataon ang diskusyon sa pagpapaluwag ng ating konstitusyon tungkol sa mga restriksyon sa mga pampublikong kagamitan, institusyong pang-edukasyon, at industriya ng advertising. Ako po ay nagpapasalamat sa tagapangulo ng Senado sa kanyang malawat na pangunawa sa prinsipyong aking tinitindigan, gayon din sa aking mga kasamahan dito sa Senado. Muli po, ako po ay nagpupugay sa ating Pangulo ngayon ng subcommittee na ito, Sen. Sani Angara, sapagkat ito pong hakbang na ito ay tunay na aking pong pinaniniwalaan na makatutulong sa pag-ulad ng ating bansa at makawala po sa tanikala ng pangungutang sapagkat sa usapin po ng lohika, kapag ka may investment, ibig sabihin may puhunan. Kapag ka may puhunan, ay merong iikot na pera. At pag umikot ng pera, magkakaroon po ng trabaho, magkakaroon ng tamang sweldo at magkakaroon po ng ibig sabihin ng pagtakbo at pag-ikot ng ekonomiya. Kaya muli po, maraming salamat at mabuhay po. Maraming maraming salamat, uh, Chairperson Senator Robin Padilla, ang chair ng ating Committee on Constitutional Amendment. Salamat sa... Thank you for the kind words, uh, Senator Chairman Robin. At gusto nating kilalanin din po uh, ang ating mga kasamahan na kakarating lang po uh, Senator Risa Contiveros, our uh, chair, chair of the Committee on Women. Good morning, ma'am. And the Deputy Minority Leader as well. Uh, Senator J.B. Hersito, our Deputy Majority Leader and the Chair of the Senate Committees on Housing and Local Government. Uh, and of Senator Win Gachalian, our uh, hardworking Chair of the Committee on Basic Education and uh, Energy. I always think your energy. <laughs> um, ways and Means. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for your trust uh, and the chairman's trust in uh, having me chair this committee. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge our very distinguished guests, and uh, we're very fortunate today to have them with us. We, also, we have them in person as well as online. Uh, we have no less than former Chief Justice Hilario Davide Jr., uh, who is with us. Uh, I think he's come all the way from Cebu. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have former Justice Adolf Ascuna, uh, who was also here last week uh, for the uh, suffrage or... Uh, electoral reforms uh, hearing. And also we have uh, online another framer of the Constitution, Attorney Christian Monsod. Can you hear us, Attorney Monsod? Yeah. Morning, sir. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, and our legal luminaries, no, uh, a known constitutionalist, uh, Justice Vicente, or VV for short, Mendoza. Good morning, sir. Uh, we have from the IBP, or the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, representing uh, uh, President Pido, is Attorney Marlo Distura. Morning, sir. Uh, and of course, not just legal luminaries, meron din po tayong magagaling na mga ekonomista. Uh, we have Dr. Gerardo Sikat from the UP School of Economics, who was uh, one of the first NEDA uh, Director Generals, if I'm not mistaken, sir. Uh, we have, uh, maybe we could say from the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, uh, Sunny Africa, uh, an, a graduate of... Uh, they say it's a good institution, uh, the London School of Economics and representing the Ibon Foundation. Morning, sir. Uh, we have a former finance secretary, uh, Gary Tevez, uh, is with us. Sir, good morning. 
and uh, from the Constitutional Reform and Reunification Movement, we have uh, Mr. Orion Perez Dumdum. Morning, sir. Uh, I didn't miss anyone. Thank you. We invited more, more, but I think some could not make it, and some submitted their position papers, which we will share with the members of the committee and the public. Hopefully, we can post those online as well. So I'd just like to ask, uh, before I turn it over to our distinguished uh, uh, resource persons, tatanong ko lang po sa ating kasamahan, baka meron silang uh, pangunahing uh, gustong sabihin, or initial remarks. Uh, Your Honors, yeah. Senator Risa, go ahead, ma'am. Salamat, Mr. Chair, at uh, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Um, maraming salamat po sa inyo. Salamat kasi ang hearing natin na ito para sa resolution of both houses, RBH 6, ay tanda na parang suspended rin muna ang diskusyon dito sa Kongreso niyang huwad na People's Initiative. Kaya sana nga yung temporary suspension ng COMELEC ng mga proceedings sa PI maging permanent na rin. Itapo na natin sa basurahan yung PI na yan. In any case, dear colleagues, hindi po nabawasan ng pag-alala ko sa mga probiso ng saligang batas na nais i-amienda ng RBH6. Kaya salamat po sa pagkakataong pag-usapan nito dahil magbabantay talaga ako na hindi tayo mahaluan na mga panukalang magpapahina lang sa ating demokrasya. I will definitely be one of those not to allow any provisions that will make our critical industries and institutions and our irreplaceable resources vulnerable to foreign takeover and exploitation. Sa bagay, mas madali kasing sisihin ang walang kamalay-malay na dokumento kaysa sisihin ang mga totoong dahilan. Korapsyon, red tape, malabong burokrasya, at mataas na singil ng kuryente ang nagtataboy sa mga lokal at dayuhan na investor. Walang pananagutan ang 1987 Constitution sa mga bagay na yon. Una sa lahat, yung sinasabi nilang restrictive, restrictive, di umano, hindi po yan totoo. Bukas na bukas na po ang ating tindahan, ladies and gentlemen. We have introduced numerous legislation that have already liberalized our sectors. Ilan lang dito ang RA 10641 or amendments to the Foreign Bank Liberalization Act, the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, the Public Service Act, the Foreign Investments Act. So much of the Philippine economy is already open to foreign participation. Kung restrictions lang sa ekonomiya ang pag-uusapan, yung ating kapitbahay na Singapore, na mamayagpag kahit na may restrictions sa critical industries at public utilities. Ang ibang bansa sa ASEAN, gaya ng Thailand at Indonesia, may kanya-kanya ding industriya na inaalagaan. Eh, tayo? Kulelat pa rin. Kahit maluwag na nga ang ekonomiya at marami ng probisyon para makapasok ang pera. Kaya hindi po solusyon <coughs> ang cha-cha. Kahit sasabi nilang purely economic provisions para bawasan ang mga tunay na iniinda natin. Yung mismong roadmap nga ng pamahalaan sa pag-unlad, ang Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028, wala ding, wala ding nabanggit na dapat mag cha para dumami ang trabaho, puksain ang kahirapan at pataasin ang kalidad ng buhay ng bansa. Wala ito sa napag-usapan. Kaya, Wag sana nating gawing collateral damage ang konstitusyon, ang mismong kaluluwa ng bansa. We, the Filipino people, will determine our destiny, hindi yung ambisyon lang ng iilan. Hindi rin natin hahayaang mabaliwala ang pagsisikap ng ating mga mamamayan, ng civil society, mga mass movements, na gumawa ng paraan para magkaroon ng totoong pagbabago sa lipunan sa pamamagitan ng lehitimong paraan kaysa sa ginagawa ng mga ilehitimong puwersa dyan sa tabi-tabi na tinira tayo ng pailalim. May the 1987 Constitution light our discussions today. 
ladies and gentlemen. Handa po akong makinig at makibahagi, Mr. Chair. Salamat po. Well said, uh, Senator Risa. Uh, I just like to, before I uh, recognize uh, Senator Wynne, we just like to acknowledge some of our colleagues who have arrived. The uh, chair of uh, the Committee on National Defense, uh, a public order, sorry, public order, <laughs> Senator Ronald Bato de la Rosa, former chief of the PNP, and of course, our uh, very much in the news, our chair of the Committee on uh, Electoral Reforms, the uh, favorite sister of the president, <laughs> Senator Amy Marcos. <laughs> Madam, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Senator Wynne, yes, please. Uh, go thank ahead. You, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a brief opening statement. First of all, I'd like to thank the uh, chairman of the subcommittee for hearing uh, my resolution. I actually filed the, uh, my, my first version uh, of this um, amendment to the economic provisions of our constitution in 2019, which is the previous Congress. And I would like to, gusto ko rin po pasalamatan po ang chairman ng Mother Committee na ito, Committee on Constitutional Amendments, for holding 10 hearings, Mr. Chairman, nationwide, no? from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Uh, Cebu, Chair Baguio, Davao. Yeah. I'd like to acknowledge also our Majority Leader, uh, yeah. that's Senator Villanueva, and this is Senator Gachalian. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> Senator <you>. Gachalian. <laughs> thank you. So, so I'd like to thank uh, Chairman uh, Robin Padilla for starting the uh, ball rolling. Uh, with 10 hearings. In, in fact, I read parts of his uh, hearing, I read the parts of the transcript of his hearings, and there were a lot of things covered, and it's good to uh, discuss uh, those items in greater detail uh, in the days to come. But Mr. Chairman, I'd like to flash a few, few slides no, that led me to file this, uh, this uh, resolution. First is the FDI restrictive index that was mentioned by uh, Chairman uh, Senator Robin Padilla, we're second in the whole world in terms of restrictedness, in terms of opening up our economy. And because of that restrictiveness, uh, the FDI inward inflow in ASEAN, and this is the next slide, uh, we're actually at the tail end of the pack in terms of attracting uh, FDIs. And if you look at Singapore, which is a, a smaller country compared to us, they're attracting more than five six times more FDI compared to our country. So, Mr. Chairman, this led me to file this resolution. And admittedly, there are many uh, issues and details that we need to discuss, especially unintended consequences. And uh, I'm here to um, listen to our panel of experts as to what are the uh, potential uh, unintended consequences that we need to uh, safeguard. But the overall goal of this representation is to create more jobs by opening up our economy, speed up our growth by attracting more FDIs to our country, and hopefully, hopefully, by um, uh, amending our constitution, we can attract critical um, uh, foreign direct investments to critical industries in our country. So again, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for uh, uh, hearing this uh, resolution. I thank, again, uh, Senator Robin Padilla for uh, hosting 10 hearings uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this measure. Thank you. Parang sinasabi mo, Senwin, dapat mag-10 hearings din ako. Ha? Baka hindi matuwa yung ating mga kaibigan sa kabilang kapulong. But thank you. Thank you for sharing with us those uh, very important facts. Uh, any, other, any other preliminary remarks from our colleagues before we uh, go to our... Yes, uh, Senator Aimee. Yes, uh, very briefly, as uh, your former chairman of economic affairs, the truth is that I was in uh, close contact with most of our foreign investors and locators almost daily. And never once did they mention a change in the constitution. Each time they stated that there was a need for uh, lower rates of electricity, infinitely better infrastructure, less red tape, and a predictable and reliable regulatory framework. At no point did they say that uh, the Constitution needed to be changed. Having said that, uh, I am also puzzled by uh, 
the list that has been provided for public services, given the many problems we have had with NGCP and the constant investigations here in the Senate. We are all fully aware that basic education as well as all aspects of private education are shrinking in revenue, in number, and in uh, employment. So why education will be turned over for foreigners, for our children, also being converted into aliens is a puzzlement to me. Finally, the uh, addition of advertising is also somewhat bizarre, given that the large advertising multinationals are already present in the country, and that advertising involves very little investment at all. Having said that, on the, ed on the economic uh, aspect, may I also um, get uh, perhaps some uh, clarity on the manner by which the so-called restrictive economic provision shall be amended. The Senate version passed by our good chairman um, indicates a constituent assembly without mentioning the name but uh, clearly stating that three-fourths would be involved. However, the House version calls for a constitutional convention or at least that's what I understand from what was passed in third reading in March earlier last year. So if we could be elucidated on the process for the CONCON, uh, which would clearly be far more expensive and which would, in fact, surrender the control of both houses over the subject matter once the constitutional convention has been elected and convened. So what safeguards do we have and uh, what uh, choice do we have between the CONCON -con and the CONAS, um, which once again is a difference between the two houses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very much, uh, Senator Aimi. Very good questions, very good points, and we will seek clarity from our learned resource persons in due time. Uh, yes, Senator Bato, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just would like to state uh, for the record that uh, I am here to support you in this uh, endeavor as our, uh, as our uh, subcommittee chairman and also our uh, main com mother committee chairman, Senator Rubin Hood Padilla. And uh, I would like to listen to uh, our uh, esteemed, highly esteemed uh, resource persons. Na yung ibang pangalan ay memorize, memorize ko na nung ako ay uh, elementary pa. Memorize ko na sa aking uh, subject na social studies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Binima Jo, parang nagpapabata ka daw, sabi niya. <laughs> Maka-college ka na daw nun, sabi niya. Uh, just joking. Thank you very much for the statement of support, which is very much appreciated, uh, Senator Bato. Uh, if there are um, majority leader, wishes to yes, Mr. majority Mr. leader, Chairman, Senator Joel. Thank yeah. you, uh, and uh, good morning to our dear colleagues, especially to our resource persons. This will be uh, just very brief, just like uh, Senator Bato de la Rosa. I'm here to uh, support our colleagues. Uh, first of all, uh, to Senator Robin Padilla, who exhaustively uh, uh, um, heard so many uh, issues about uh, this particular uh, deliberation and of course our uh, subcommittee chair, uh, Chairman uh, Sani Angara. I think it is important to note that uh, ang Senado ay tunay na may isang salita, Mr. President. Um, we began our hearing today consistent with our commitment, the commitment of our Senate President to the President to explore and study amendments to the economic provisions of uh, the uh, Constitution. This will be exhaustive hearings. Unlike itong uh, Peking PI, hindi naman ito ira rush. Um, we will do it right and we will follow our timetable, one that ensures that all voices are heard. This will be um, transparent. Our people will know what is going on and what we are talking about, wala po tayong itatago dito at higit sa lahat, wala pong kalokohan gaya ng mga nadiskubre ng ating mga kasamahan nung nagpunta sila sa Davao ni Senator Aimee, Senator Bato, and Senator uh, Bongo. Ang Senado po kasi, uulitin ko, ay may isang salita. May isang salita. This was our commitment from the very beginning and, the on and uh, we only went off track because of this ill-fated uh, pecking initiative that was pushed by uh, some quarters with the support of the uh, House of Representatives. At klaro po yan, wala naman pong naniniwala na sa kanila na wala silang kinalaman dito. 
we have been told that if the Senate will tackle RBH6, goodbye PI na raw. Gayun pa man, we will continue to be vigilant habang uh, nakatutok po tayo dito sa RBH6 hearings. Todo bantay din po tayo sa galaw ng mga kasamahan natin. Experience has taught us that what they say in the House and what they do can be two different things. Mr. Chairman, we will make sure that uh, their words and actions are consistent. These are parallel efforts that uh, aim to protect the processes involved in amending our charter while we make sure that RBH 6 sticks to the original intention to amend only uh, economic provisions of the Constitution, we will also continue to be proactive in our measures to thwart unconstitutional chacha efforts. Kasama dito po yung uh, investigation natin dyan, na pinangungunahan ni uh, Senator Aimee uh, Marcos. Tinawin ko lang po kasi yung sinasabing ceasefire, eh, ceasefire sa usapin ng uh, PI. Kaya we will refrain from debating on this uh, issue. Pero yung ceasefire po does not mean cease working or stop the PI inquiry. Kasi siyempre kung may nakita po tayong sablay, matawa si Senator Bato kasi ang dami na niyang nakitang sablay eh. Pag may nakitang sablay ang Senado, uh, talagang iimbestigahan po ito. Hindi naman tayo magkikibit-balikat. Yung ongoing hearings are in the process of unearthing evidence and nakita naman po natin, meron talagang questionable sa pagpapirma ng Peking Initiative. May mali po. Why should we turn a blind eye to these irregularities? Ang dami pong tanong, sino ang nagpondo sa kampanya, saan galing itong pondo ng PI, bakit nagkaroon ng traffic doon sa Forbes noong kuhanan ng 2.5? Bakit may traffic? Bakit ang mga chief of staff eh, nagkukumahog na pumunta doon? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ayaw natin na masayang yung salapi ng taong bayan. Kaya ho tayo narito ngayon to, to make sure that uh, we will hear this uh, exhaustively and uh, uh, with transparency. The people have the right to know if their money is being used properly for their benefit and not for the benefit of a political agenda. Ang uh, gusto kasi nung iba, forgive and forget na lang. Hindi naman po tama yun. Hindi na kami magsasalita tungkol sa PI but we should... Let the witnesses speak and we should let the evidence speak. And at the end of the day, kung may gumawa ng labag sa batas, those responsible should be held accountable. So, Chairman, ang bottom line po sa ginagawa ng Senado, eh, yung ating trabaho. Trabaho po natin ito. Kaya naman, uh, sabay natin yung pagdinig at pag-investigate kasi hindi naman tayo ganun kabisi sa paggawa ng mga resolusyon supporting our Senate President or supporting Senator Aimee Marcos. Kasi dito po sa Senado, alam na natin kung ano yung tama at hindi kailangan ng mga ganyan kasi alam naman nila that they have the support of the Senate. Maraming salamat, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Majority Leader. Of course, we will take guidance from you as our uh, uh, the, one of the heads of the institution. Thank you very much. Uh, any others? Uh, Senator JP, yes, go ahead. Yes, Mr. Chair, just briefly. Anyway, we are here to listen. Just like to also um, recognize your efforts so that uh, we can already start the ball rolling and uh, pervert, uh, prevent this uh, um, constitutional crisis, if I may say. And to also, uh, and, uh, also give recognition to our chair of the Constitu Constitutional Amendments Committee, Senator Robin Hood Padilla, for... Uh, for starting this. We are in the democratic society and uh, as they say, we have um, all, the, all the bright bright ideas are needed no? uh, uh, in these uh, discussions. Anyway, Mr. Chair, um, what we should be um, looking at right now is on how we will be able to improve the quality of lives of our people. Um, in, in our efforts here in the Senate, uh, on my part, we already shepherded the Public-Private yeah. Partnership Act, and will soon sponsor the Comprehensive Infrastructure for Master Plan for um, for us to be able to attract for investments. But as they say, um, our constitution was written in 1987, 40 years, and uh, the world has changed considerably. There's, uh, uh, there's There was no such thing as globalization worldwide back then. The world has become smaller. 
And uh, I do agree that we have to discuss on what we will be able to do on how we'll be able to attract for investors. Medyo nakakabahala lang, nakakano, nakalungkot tignan yung FDIs that we are getting. Doon sa pinakitang graph ni Sen. Sherwin, uh, we are really lagging behind. But uh, Mr. Chair, we in the Senate, we are not, uh, hindi po ako uh, sangayo na hindi tayo nagtatrabaho. In fact, uh, we have mentioned that we have already started the... Uh, um, hearing on the priority measures that is designed on improving our economy. No? Yung comprehensive master plan, uh, public-private partnership act, and the rest. Again, we have to look into um, infrastructure, energy, and uh, uh, a lot more things that, uh, that need to be prioritized so that we will be able to stimulate economic growth and provide jobs and opportunities to our people. So again, Mr. Chair, I, uh, congratulations for in advance no, for, uh, for having this hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Senator JV, for the support and the very good uh, remarks. We have with us, we'd like to acknowledge the head of our institution, no less than the Senate President, Senate President Juan Miguel Zubiri, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, to my dear colleague, Senator Sani Angara, our chairman of the subcommittee, together with the chairman, uh, Senator Robin Hood Padilla, to all my colleagues, uh, and of course the guests, all our friends, from the uh, legal luminaries from the um, legal community, thank you for joining us today. And um, what we also have today, economists joining us. I know Tito Gary is here uh, and others that are, are going to assist us in ferret, ferreting out the best uh, way possible to remove the possible economic restrictions uh, in the Constitution. Uh, we'd, like to, we'd just like to put on record that the Senate is working very hard uh, to listen to the clamor of certain sectors to look at and revisit the 1987 Constitution. Uh, but we will not be f falling into a trap on any deadline because to discuss uh, such an important matter needs time. It needs study. It cannot be rushed like any regular bill that is just approved without thinking. So we, ladies and gentlemen here in the Senate, will make sure that we deliberate this as much as possible and come out with the best outcome for our people. Um, and so with that, I give my full support to our chairperson, Senator Sani Angara. The timeline is in your hands if you feel uh, it uh, uh, necessary that we must discuss this with all members of society, not only our learned luminaries here, as well as different sectors that will be affected by proposed amendments to our constitution. So we leave it all up to you, my dear colleagues, my dear chairman. Uh, you have the full trust and confidence of this institution. And uh, again, let us not listen to the noise. Let us be above the fray. The Senate, as an institution, should be men states men and women that will always look at the best possible outcome for our country not for our localities but for our country and therefore let us filter out the noise and focus on the work at hand so mabuhay pong senado mabuhay ang republika ng pilipinas thank you very much sir maraming maraming salamat senate president zubiri we totally agree with you we thank you for your authority and we thank you for standing as a statesman uh, these past few weeks which have been very trying times for uh, the country. And uh, I think there will be challenges ahead. And uh, with you at the helm, uh, we are fully, fully uh, behind you uh, in all your actions. Salamat po sa support. The chair I just wishes to state that, uh, reiterate my colleague's stand that uh, this is not something that needs to be rushed, uh, given the importance. Kung yung pangkaraniwang uh, patakaran ay... Uh, uh, ay talagang dinidebate natin, mas lalo na po dahil ito ay pinakamahalaga o pinakamataas na batas sa bansa, ang mismong saligang batas. At pangalawa po, uh, klaro naman dun sa sinabi ng ating mga kasama na although maganda yung constitutional reform, hindi ito sapat. Uh, wag natin isipin na ito ay isang milagro na pag pinasa natin ay darating bigla at kakatok sa ating mga pintuan ang mga 
uh, mamumuhunan at mga negosyante. Dahil tulad ng sinabi ng ating mga kasama, maraming factors po yan. Yung ease of doing business, yung rule of law, yung uh, kasiguruhan na re-respetuhin yung mga kontrata, yung uh, uh, red tape ay babawasan o yung mga kahirapan sa byurokrasya. Ayun, there are so many factors and we know this because there are so many surveys. And as mentioned by some of our colleagues, hindi naman sa taas yung constitutional reform. Pero hindi naman to ibig sabihin na hindi makakatulong ang constitutional reform. To the extent that it can, by all means, let us explore the possibilities. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our guests. Uh, and with, uh, with your permission, colleagues, we'd like to uh, start with former Chief Justice uh, Hilario Davide Jr., who was one of the framers of the 1987 Constitution before he became the Chief Magistrate. Good morning, Chief Justice Davide. Sir, uh, we'd like to hear from you, please, uh, on uh, resolution number six regarding the economic uh, provisions of the Constitution. Thank you, sir. You have the floor. Uh, how much time would be given me? Uh, well, sir, uh, Given the importance of the subject matter, uh, it would be ideal if you could uh, uh, spend uh, how much time do you need, sir? <laughs> Probably 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, please. Good morning to all of you. I thank the Honorable Chairman and the members of the subcommittee for inviting me to this uh, public hearing on Senate resolution of both houses number six. I am deeply honored. I shall henceforth refer to this resolution as Senate RBH 6. I have some preliminary statements that concern some procedural matters. To save time, however, I shall uh, just proceed directly to the issues concerning the Senate Bill uh, RBH 6. Let me start with a reiteration of my firm and unchangeable stand that there are no valid, serious, and compelling reasons to amend our 1987 Constitution. What our country and our people need today are not amendments to or revision of the Constitution, but the full implementation of its principles and state policies solemnly enshrined in its Article 2 and mandatory and provisions in its body. In about 150 instances, our Constitution orders the state or Congress to implement them by these solemn commands. Congress shall give highest priority to the state shall, Congress shall, as provided by law, as established by law, or in accordance with law. However, either intentionally and with evident bad faith or incompetence or neglect of duty on the part of our concerned government officials, the state or Congress have not fully and meaningfully complied with these constitutional commands and mandates. Hence, a vast majority of the provisions, especially on social justice, on economic development, on abolition of political dynasties, among many others, have remained unimplemented to the great prejudice of our people, especially the poor, the marginalized, the underprivileged, or, open quote, the least, the last, and the lost, close quote. If at all there is a need to amend the Constitution, it must be based on the most compelling grounds or reasons. It must, foremost, be for the best interest of the country and the people now and in the future, and not for a chosen few. It is to solve serious problems, not to create new ones. It must be in pursuance of and in compliance with the declared principles and state policies at the call to of the Constitution. With these standards and tests in mind, let us now take a hard and serious look at the resolution of both houses number six, Without saying it in clear language, it considers or describes the constitutional provisions covered by the proposal to be the culprits or causes that hindered or will continue to hinder economic growth. There are obstacles to economic development or progress. I must forthwith say that the provisions proposed to be amended 
and all other provisions of the national economy, such as those proposed to be amended in the House of Representatives Resolution of both houses number two, which include the economic provisions pertaining to agriculture, land ownership, and lease, are not the culprits or the causes of our massive social, economic, political, moral, and ethical problems and debacles. These are all caused by the failures to fully implement or enforce the Constitution by poor governance and accountability and open violations of the public trust character of the public office enshrined in Section 1 of Article 11 of the Constitution, which provides open code, public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, and act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. I repeat, our problems are not due to the restrictive economic provisions of the Constitution. They cannot be solved by removing its restrictive economic provisions and completely leaving to Congress, leaving to Congress their future under the clause unless otherwise provided by law. On the contrary, they would create more serious and disturbing problems and consequences, which I will show later. Let us now look deeper into the proposals of Senate resolution of both houses no number six on the provision on education. It leaves to Congress the power to change at any given time the Filipino citizenship requirement in the basic education. I repeat, basic education. Again, that in our educational system, we have the basic, the senior high, and the tertiary education. The proposal opens to foreign control or dominance. Our basic education, which is the most crucial in the development and growth of our young. This should run counter to Section 17 of Article 2 of the Declaration of Principles and State Policies of our Constitution, which provides, open quote, the state shall give priority to education, science and technology, arts, culture and sports, to foster patriotism and nationalism, accelerate social progress, and promote total human liberation and development, close quote. Then, with foreign control or dominance, in our basic education, basic education, we would put asunder the noble patriotic and nationalistic virtues which are constitutionally mandated to be a part of the curricula of all educational institutions provided for in paragraph two of section three of article 14 of the constitution which reads section two, paragraph two, they shall inculcate patriotism and nationalism. Again, patriotism and nationalism. Foster love of humanity, respect for human rights, appreciation of the roles of national heroes in the historical development of the country. Teach the rights and duties of citizenship. Strengthen ethical and spiritual values. Develop moral character and personal discipline. Encourage critical and creative thinking, broaden scientific and technological knowledge, and promote vocational efficiency. Close quote. Can we expect foreigners at the helm or control our, of our educational system to seriously and heartily obey this state policy on education and curricula mandates? For instance, if a Chinese educational entity would now come in, do you expect it to be faithful enough to comply with these mandates? 
would not its teachings focus on Chinese philosophy or even on the life of Mao Zedong? As regards the proposals affecting the provisions on public utilities and the advertising industry, suffice it to say that as to the first, there are already amendments to the Public Service Act. <clears throat> In any case, it would be extremely dangerous, I repeat, extremely dangerous, if we leave to Congress the extent of the Filipino citizenship requirement therein. The day will not be far when public utilities and advertising industry will be under the control or even under the full ownership by aliens. One Congress declares a 100 Filipino, another Congress a 75-25 Filipino, another Congress a 50-50 Filipino, another a 25-75 Chinese, and even perhaps a 100% Chinese. The amendment would be grossly disadvantageous to our local businessmen and corporations or business entities engaged in the public utility and advertising industries. I repeat what I had been asserting before, that relaxing the Filipino citizenship requirement in the economic provisions of the country would easily convert our Congress into a fee, FEE, all capital, market, of lobbyists of foreign countries or businessmen to obtain amendments in their favor. Congress would cease to be a free FREE market of noble, nationalistic, patriotic ideals and ideas. Remember that the Senate is the conscience of the Republic. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Yes, devils will have their day when angels fly away. To conclude, I will not hesitate to say again that amendments to or revision of the Constitution at this time would be a lethal experiment a fatal leap, a plunge to death, a leap to hell. It will be a cha-cha dance to the grave or to hell. It will be a cruel punishment for a God-loving, patriotic, and nationalistic people. It will be claiming our people to foreign domination or control. God forbid that we now amend our constitution. God forbid that we now can no longer proudly and with glorious fervor sing, land of the morning, child of the sun returning, with fervor burning, thee do our souls adore. Land dear and holy, cradle of noble heroes, near shall invaders trample thy sacred shore. Ever within the skies and through thy clouds, and all the hills and sea, do we behold the regions filled with love of glorious liberty. The banner dear to all our hearts, its sun and stars alike, or never shall its shining field be dimmed by tyrant's might. The beautiful land of love, O land of light, in thine embrace its rapture to light. But it is glory ever when thou art wrong for us, thy sons, to suffer and die. God bless the Philippines. God bless the Senate. God bless the beleaguered Filipino people. Thank you all for your patience. Less than 15 minutes, Your Honors. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. God bless you for uh, uh, your wise words. Uh, we just want to clarify, I was conferring with the Senate President and the Majority Leader. The Senate President is the main author of the resolution. Uh, we are the co-authors. The, for regarding the educational institutions, uh, Chief, it's only uh, meant to apply for to higher uh, tertiary education, not to basic education, precisely because of the uh, fears you enunciated that perhaps uh, uh, nationalism might be watered down, among others. Uh, thank you, but thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, next, we'll go to Justice Ascuna, also, uh, who was here with us and shared his wise words during Senator Aimee's uh, hearing. And... Uh, 
uh, where we very much welcome his uh, his knowledge and experience. Uh, Justice, uh, you have the Chair. floor, sir. Uh, uh, Senator Aimi, if we could reserve our questions. Uh, no, it's not a for, question. Uh, Yes. It's not a question before uh, we proceed to Justice Ascuna, who uh, brilliantly uh, explained uh, the situation in a previous hearing. I would like to also share with uh, my uh, colleagues the um, uh, really uh, copious as well as bracing position paper that the Chief Justice Davide um, submitted to our committee for the investigation on uh, signature buying. Um, so uh, it's the second time uh, he has helped us and we'd like to thank him. It will certainly deepen and enrich our understanding and the committee report that will be submitted forthwith. Thank you. Thank you very much. That will be most welcome. Thank you, Senator Aimi. Uh, Justice Azcuna, Azcuna, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Senate President and members of the Senate, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, hearing on the proposal to amend the Constitution to remove some of the restrictive economic provisions therein. The context of the adoption by our drafters of the present Constitution of uh, restrictive economic provisions as, uh, goes back to 1935, our 1935 and 1973 constitutions already contain restrictive economic provisions with respect to development of natural resources, ownership of land, and operation of public utilities. These are not new. If you, uh, It's because of this that uh, we are in dire poverty don't blame the present constitution. It's been there since 1935. What we added in 1987 are restrictive economic provisions in the areas of education, uh, media, advertising. Those are uh, our additions. They were not there before. And uh, in the present resolution of both houses, number six, it is sought to remove uh, or loosen the restrictive portions of these provisions with respect to education, uh, public utilities, and advertising only. Okay. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, removing some, if not all, of the restrictive economic provisions in our Constitution. I believe that it should not be in the Constitution it should be in an ordinary legislation. I'm for restriction, but it should be flexible. It should be in legislative, legislative form, not in a very hard to change constitutional provision. I think the other countries that have restrictive economic provisions don't have it in their constitution. They have it in ordinary laws, which can be easily changed. Economic provisions Economic policy should be flexible to meet changing times in the economy. In fact, the best definition of an economist that I have heard, pardon the economists who are here, is an economist who can tell you tomorrow why what he said yesterday did not happen today. That is, uh, the, uh, that is the definition of an economist. But seriously, economic policy should not be uh, put in a constitution. Now, what is, the, I'll talk about the procedure. What is the procedure to change, to amend? Uh, you have the CONAS, it says Congress, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, may propose amendment or revision of the constitution. You can call for a constitutional convention by a vote of two-thirds again of Congress, you may call a constitutional convention, or to a people's initiative, which is much controverted right now, where you have signatures by the 12% of entire electorate, represented by 3% every district. However, uh, this is not what is sought to be done here. What is sought to be done here is CONAS, 
Congress, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, may propose amendment or revisions to the Constitution. Okay. So resolution of both houses number six is under that. Con us. It's not a fourth method. There's no such thing as a fourth method. There are only three methods. This is the first method, which is through Congress acting as a constituent assembly. They don't have to meet jointly. There's no requirement for a joint hearing. There is no requirement for a joint voting either. We left that perhaps unintentionally open, whether you'll meet together in joint session or meet separately. That's up to you. So Father Berna said, you can follow the same procedure as making an ordinary law. That is, you can present your resolution in the Senate, another resolution in the House, and then have three readings, and if it's adopted, you compare both, and then you reconcile versions, come out with a final version, and then vote three-fourths in the Senate, three-fourths of the House. That is CONAS, that is method number one. Okay, so that's what we seek to do, CONAS. However, I notice in your resolution of both houses number six, that you start with saying, be it enacted, enacted. That is legislation. So don't say, be it enacted. Say, be it resolved, because you are not proposing a bill. You are not proposing to make a law. You are proposing to amend the Constitution. And you have to signal to our people that you are no longer acting as a legislative body. You are acting as a constituent assembly. How do you signal it? You signal it by your resolution, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives in Congress assembled, and so forth and so on. So that's the first change I would propose to resolution of both houses number six. Change the be it enacted into be it resolved. Secondly, I notice that you introduce another word other than unless otherwise provided by law. I, I was the source of this formula, unless otherwise provided by law, way back when Speaker Belmonte was the Speaker of the House, because I noticed that there was a clamor to change the economic provisions. And I said the best way is just to adopt an amendment that says, unless otherwise provided by law, but strategically placed so that you will not alter the basic principles of protecting our people, but only alter the percentages. So put it where it says 60% must be owned by Filipinos, unless otherwise provided by law. Make it changeable by legislation. But in resolution of both houses number six, you added another word, other than unless otherwise provided by law. You added the word basic, basic. Now I see that's dangerous, why? Because you are inviting the house to add other words than unless otherwise provided by law. This particular change of the restrictive economic provisions should only contain the words unless otherwise provided by law. Otherwise you open the gates of changing the very substance of the economic provisions itself. So I would suggest, don't use basic. Let the Congress decide what kind of education should be open to foreign investment. So leave it, educational institutions, except those that are uh, by religious group, shall be 60% owned by Filipinos, unless otherwise provided by law. Ganun lang, that is the second proposal I have. I have no other proposal, just, just those two. And I believe that, uh, of course, this is according to some members of the House, not enough, not enough Dow. It will only redound to 3% increase in GDP. I don't know, there are economists here. But it's a start, it's a start. Uh, I think the only difference with RB66 and RBC2 is, is uh, land ownership. You did not include land ownership. I would suggest do not include uh, development of natural resources. Why not? Because there is a provision in the 
International Covenant of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that says that a people may freely dispose of their natural resources as they deem fit. However, however, it says, uh, a people must not be deprived of their means of subsistence. So you cannot deprive our people by freely disposing of our natural resources of their means of subsistence. Now, the natural resources that are reserved to Filipinos are non-renewable. Ito mga minerals natin, non-renewable po yan. Kaya po, since 1935, reserved now for Filipinos only. Anyway, the uh, foreigners can invest in solar energy and wind energy. They are not covered by the provision of the Constitution. Why not? The Constitution says all forces of potential energy are covered by the nationalistic provision. All forces of potential energy. It does not say all potential forces of energy. Please, the World Bank ask me for my opinion whether or not solar energy and wind energy are covered in view of the fact that according to them, the Constitution says that what is nationalized or must be owned by Filipinos is all potential forces of energy. That's not what the Constitution says. You read it. It doesn't say all potential forces of energy. It says all forces of potential energy. Okay, Forces of potential energy are waterfalls, cataracts, whereas potential forces of energy includes solar energy and wind energy. That's not nationalized. We only nationalize forces of potential energy. So that's open to them. Let them invest in that, solar and wind. Uh, that's all for Salamat. Mr. Chair, quick clarificatory question. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll reserve all questions for after the resource persons have spoken, uh, Santa Risa, with your indulgence. Because if we open the gate to questions, we'll not hear from all our resource persons. I hope you understand. That's similar to what we do in the budget. We ask all agencies to present, and then we allow our members to, to, to ask questions. Well, I hope by that time, hindi pa po nalaos, kasi it's actually a quick clarificatory question to a point made by uh, CJ Davide and then uh, answered yes, by the chair. Yes, yes. You'll have a chance to ask later. Thank you. We'd like to acknowledge Senator Jingo Estrada, our chairperson of the Committee on National Defense. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justice Acuna. As, Kuna, as usual, very clear and uh, very uh, uh, brilliant analysis. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we also have another framer of the Constitution with us online. Uh, Attorney Monsod, Christian Monsod, also a, a framer of the 1987 Constitution, a member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission. Is he still with us? Yes, uh, yes. Attorney Christian Monsod, uh, good morning, sir. Please, please go ahead and share your thoughts uh, with the body. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. I'm asked, I was asked to comment on Joint Resolution Number 6 proposing constitutional amendments to the economic provisions on education, public utilities, and advertising. As to the purpose for the amendments, I quote the president in an interview last January 23rd, quote, the 1987 constitution was not written for a globalized world. We have to adjust it so we can increase the economic activity in the Philippines and we can attract more foreign investors. This is the same president who a year ago said, for me, all these things being talked about, we can do without changing the constitution. The president should know better. He is, after all, the chairman of NEDA, which came out about September 2022 with Philippine Development Plan 2023 to 2028 approved by the president that states that the country is, quote, open for business and enumerated the enactment of our Republic Act 11647, the Public Act 11659 and uh, on uh, telecommunications and transportation, as well as renewable energy. <clears throat> and there is the APRA law 
of 2001, which allows 100% foreign ownership in power generation. The, why did we have a shortages of power at the time when 100% uh, foreign owned uh, generation was, was open? Because the generating companies, the foreign investors, were wanted take or pay provisions from the distributor so that they're, they're assured of their income and profits. And so we had a hard time, I was with Meralco then, in negotiating with these foreign investors. And as for land, lease is allowed for 50 years, even 75 years on government land. By the way, even the Foreign Chamber of Commerce admitted that opening land for foreign ownership will probably will raise the price of land beyond the reach of the poor. As for mining, it is allowed 100% in partnership with government under Article 12, Section 2. And then, of course, there is our signing of the RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. There is absolutely no mention, as already mentioned earlier, of any charter change in the Philippine Development Fund 2023 to 2028 to attain its goals and programs. Moreover, in, the, in none of the 73 billion of investment pledges accrued by the government in its travels abroad, there is no condition for China change. And there is the example of Japanese manufacturing companies leaving China about four years ago, who put the Philippines as destination number four behind Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam. When the China, Japanese Chamber of Commerce was asked why, since manufacturing in our constitution is allowed to be 100 foreign owned, there was much discussions on the pros and the cons, like cons that we that we have good workmen and so on, and the cost and the uh, cons, which is about lack of materials and manufacturing chain, manufacturing chain, <clears throat> the regulatory, for example. Uh, rules. The, but what was finally the factor against us? They said country image, which they said they tried to change but could not. Part of that image was corruption, including transactional legislation which would open the door wider by the insertion of that phrase unless otherwise provided by law in the economic provisions of which corrupt politicians and greedy big business are very adept. Clearly, there is no need or requirement for charter changes in the Philippine Development Plan in the investment pledges to the government. What then is the purpose of convening a constituent assembly to pass these three? provisions. There is there is nothing special about them that will address, address the so-called problem of restrictions for, uh, against foreign direct investment. Briefly, on advertising, the question I raised to an expert and former practitioner who retired from the business about 10 years ago. Is the proposed amendment to the economic provision of the 1987 Constitution on foreign ownership of advertising needed or still relevant? The answer I got, in the advertising industry, the location, the limitation of foreign ownership to 40% has long been rendered superfluous since a new business model evolved in the United States and Europe in mid-1990s and was adopted in the Philippines in the early 2000s. For context, the inclusion of advertising among industries covered by the 60-40 foreign ownership limitation stemmed from its mass, buy, mass media buying function that was a part of the package, the package offered by full service ad agencies. The premise was that those with access to mass media like TV, radio, and newspapers had the power to sway a nation's ethos and must therefore be guarded against too much external influence. But by 2000, the media, depart 
department was unbundled from the creative and account management functions, making it a separate business entity, independent from what became known as the branding agency, that effectively removing the ownership restrictions from the latter. At present, with the onslaught of the social media, the advertising industry being an early adapter has once again metamorphosed to remain relevant and viable. From, from a branding agency, it has become essentially a digital agency. It is doubtful whether ownership will be a significant issue at this time. Perhaps this committee can ask other practitioners in advertising to validate this opinion. If the committee wishes to hear directly from my source, I have permission to give you the name. With regard to public utility provision, is there a need to amend the Public Act 116595549? If none, what's the point of an amendment to the constitutional provision at the cost of 13 billion for a plebiscite? On education, I submit that there is no need for an amendment at this time until the Congress has reviewed fully the report of the Second Congressional Commission Education that was released a few days ago. It says that we have an education crisis and there is nothing in it about foreign holdings in our college and most postgraduate schools. The problem is in, is in preschool, primary and secondary schools. Internationalization of schools is one of the 28 priorities of EDCOM 2 and its substanding committee on higher education will pursue the studies related to 2024, the second year of EDCOM 2. Why not await the results of that study? For now, the priorities are lack of budget, misuse of the budget, the need for early childhood care, and so forth. Because our students after high school don't have the health, learning, and capability to enter college. And the cost of enrolling in a foreign-owned foreign -owned school may be beyond the reach of the poor without government help. Partnerships may be more viable. In the meantime, in, sorry. in the meantime, uh, the, the um, page five. In the meantime, the, uh, the, the, this committee uh, sh should look into the FINMA case, which has grown with 14 local schools plus partnerships in Myanmar and Indonesia. It has two foreign partners with ownership not exceeding 40%. The arrangement holds. In fact, the partnership of AIM and Harvard was terminated amicably about 20 years ago among, among, for among reasons for among other reasons that they said that the Philippines already has the faculty and the experience to go it alone. Today, there seems to be no waiting line for majority or full ownership of college and postgraduate college. In fact, we are cautioned that opening the door to the wrong, of, of opening the doors to the wrong schools with the wrong agenda. In view of the foregoing, why the priority and rush to amend three economic provisions? Is it part of a compromise regarding the discontinuance of people's initiative in return for some charter change? That may be a fair deal for the Senate, but one does not know if it will hold under this precedent. Or as the saying goes, is this only the thin edge of the wedge that would later allow the real purpose of the House to overhaul the Constitution with major revisions on the structure and system of government together with provisions toward an authoritarian Constitution. The committee might review the various proposals for charter change and also the past bills of the House in this regard, as well as any attempt to amend Article 6, Section 28, related to the issues of the budget today. It is our hope 
that the Senate will stand firm against charter change beyond the proposed amendments on the economic provisions of public utilities, advertising, and education. Thank you very I'm, much. Uh, I'm, I am in the context in the context of what's happening there. In conclusion, may I request the Senate to initiate to initiate that the passing of an anti-dynasty law, which is long overdue by 36 years, and to amend the party list system that politicians abuse with just three amendments, an anti-dynasty provision, remove the limit of three congressmen from any party because it is a system of proportional representation, and third, deleting the phrase, quote, with a track record of advocacy, unquote, that enabled the Forbes Park resident to represent tricycle drivers. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Attorney Monsod, uh, framer of the 1987 uh, uh, Constitutional Commission, a member of the 1987 Constitutional Commission, and the uh, former chairperson of the COMELEC. Salamat po for a very comprehensive uh, uh, commentary. Uh, next, we'll have uh, former Justice Vicente Mendo Vivi Mendoza, a known constitutionalist. Uh, Justice Vivi, uh, you have the floor, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, Senate President, Distinguished Chairman of the Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, Senator uh, Robin Padilla, and Senator Angara, Sani Angara, thank you for the opportunity to be heard on this important proposed amendment. I submitted a three-page uh, position paper as uh, requested by the subcommittee. I'm not sure, however, that copies have been distributed. So I'd like to uh, elaborate on that paper. The resolution, the Resolution of both houses number six, as I understand it, seeks to amend the Constitution by giving Congress the power to lift restrictions on the operation of public utilities, educational institutions, and the advertising agency uh, industry. For example, <clears throat> Article 12, Section 11 of the Constitution provides that no franchise, certificate, or any other form of authorization for the pub operation of public utility shall be granted except to citizens of the Philippines or to corporations or associations under the laws of the Philippines at least 60% of the capital of which is owned by such citizens. Now, the resolution of both houses seeks to amend this provision by inserting the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law, so that this provision will read as follows. No franchise, certificate, or any other form of authorization for the operation of public utility shall be granted except to citizens of the Philippines or to corporations or associations organized under the laws at least of the Philippines, at least 60% of whose capital is owned by such citizens unless otherwise provided by law. The same method is followed with respect to the amendment of Article 14, Section 4, Paragraph 2, 
regarding the ownership of educational institutions and Article 16, Section 11, Paragraph 2, concerning the ownership of the advertising of advertising agencies and firms and persons engaged in this industry. Now, Mr. Chairman, my observations on this uh, resolution are two. Number one, it will undermine the fundamental principles and policies stated in Article 2 of the Constitution. These fundamental rules and policies constitute our statement of aims and uh, goals on which our republic is founded. The second observation is that it allows the amendment of the Constitution by methods other than outlined in Article 17 by allowing Congress acting not as a constituent assembly but as a legislative body to amend the Constitution by providing otherwise than is provided in the present Constitution. For example, Mr. Chairman, we declare in Article 2, Section 19 of the Constitution, that we want a vibrant national economy independent and controlled by Filipinos. The proposed resolution amending the Constitution would contradict this. Number one, by allowing Congress acting as a legislative body, not as a constituent assembly, to amend the Constitution and allow the engagement or operation of utilities, educational institutions, and advertising to foreigners. That therefore undermines the basic principles and policies on which this republic is founded. Second, we have an amending clause, and it is basic principle that the amending clause of the Constitution is a very important part of the Constitution because it is the alternative to a revolution. Now, if we don't follow the procedures, I would say the wise procedures of Article 17, the amendment clause of our Constitution, we lose the benefits of several procedures. What are they? In my view, they require Congress as a constituent assembly either to propose amendments to the Constitution, not Congress as a legislative body, or to call a constitutional convention. Now, there are benefits to be derived from such a procedure. Why? Because the two houses of Congress under Article 17 will have to meet as just one body without any distinction whether they are senators or congressmen. 
except that when it comes to the time for voting, they vote separately for the obvious reason that the members of the Senate are smaller than the members of the House. But otherwise, they're required to meet as a body. What's the benefit of that? They will have the benefit of give and take. They will debate the issues without any distinction, whether they are congressmen or senators. Not only that, having approved amendments, they will submit this to the people for ratification or approval in a plebiscite to be held within between 60 and 90 days. All these benefits are lacking, totally lacking in resolution number six because it will allow Congress by mere law, meaning to say the two houses voting separately in two different locations. The Senate here in Pasay City, the House in Quezon City, and they will not have the chance to exchange views, to debate. That's the benefit that you derive from that. And because of that, the people listening to the proceedings of both houses will have no chance to form opinions so that when the proposed amendments are submitted to them in a plebiscite, they will not be able to vote wisely as they should. That's the reason I'm opposed to that. So that two things I repeat, Mr. Chairman. Number one, resolution number six undermines Article Two principles on which our Constitution is founded, our Republic is founded. Number two, it regards the basic principle that any change in the Constitution must be made in accordance with that provision, not by Congress as a legislative body. Let me quote Chief Justice Marshall, and he said, we hear it very often said, the Constitution is the fundamental law of the land. The Constitution is the highest law of the land. Any law that is against the Constitution is void. All this we know. But let's li listen to what was said way back in 1803 when this principles, the sacredness, the higher background of the Constitution were uttered for the first time in the Marbury versus Madison case of which I'm sure many of us here have heard. This is what Chief Justice Marshall said in the Marbury case. As a superior paramount law. The Constitution is unchangeable by ordinary legislative act. If RBH number six is approved, we would be permitting the amendment of the Constitution by a method other than the ordinary, by ordinary method of legislation. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Justice uh, Vivi Mendoza. Uh, next, uh, our last uh, legal luminary to be heard from before we turn it over to our economic experts is Attorney Marlo Destura, the representative of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines. Uh, Attorney Destura, go ahead, sir. Good morning, Your Honors and distinguished guests. On behalf of the National President of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, Attorney Antonio C. Pido, thank you for inviting the Integrated Bar of the Philippines for this opportunity to be heard and to be a part of this historic discussion on charter chains. This is also a welcome milestone in my capacity as a member of the Board of Governors of the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, a law professor, and a citizen of this country. The Integrated Bar of the Philippines represents thousands of lawyers in various sectors of the government and uh, whose opinion on the proposal may be relevant. So this representation will uh, differ the opinion of the IBP on the proposed amendments on three important economic provisions of the 1987 Constitution particularly on the grant of legislative franchise, on basic education, and the advertising industry, particularly on the restrictions on the grant, the ownership, and the allowance of foreign investors in the country by providing as a proposed amendment and these three economic provisions of the Constitution by inserting the words unless otherwise provided for by law. We will look into the method proposed by, by Congress through an amendment by Constitution, Constitutional Assembly by a vote of three-fourths of all the members of Congress. We will also look into whether this proposal complies with the requirement of sufficient standard as well as on the control on the part of Congress in enacting legislative uh, <coughs> laws, uh, legislative actions on the proposed amendments. IBP will thoroughly study the proposed amendments and submit its position on this very important exercise of sovereignty. Hence, uh, your honors, I defer the position of the IBP and commit to submit the same as soon as possible or on the next committee hearing if there be any. Thank you very much. Thank you, attorney. Uh, now we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Gerardo Sicat, who is the first, uh, one of the country's eminent economists and the first director general of uh, the NEDA in the 1970s. Uh, Dr. Sicat, good morning. Good, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to this important uh, gathering on the topic uh, that we are now very concerned with. I prepared a statement which I suspect could be uh, read uh, a little faster so that I can save time for most of us. I would like to say that at the very outset, that I do favor the amendment of the restrictive economic provisions in the Constitution for the reason that they have been, in my view, the prominent provisions of law that cannot be changed for which we have suffered as a nation 
in failing to achieve the goals of economic development over a long period of time. It has made our country more subject to, to uh, uh, greater uh, volatility because of, uh, because of the uh, failure to achieve major continuous progress in our development efforts. Those provisions have hampered this progress because we failed to invite or bring in foreign capital that is so critical to a country that is not, that is, uh, that has insufficient amount of savings to generate that high level of uh, development. For decades now, we have been, um, uh, I, I consider them to be the main cause of the country's relative decline with respect to our neighbors in the Southeast Asian region. I think you may, uh, you will find out that uh, I will uh, refer to this kind of comparison because it's critical to look, our, look at ourselves in the context of the neighborhood in which we live. As a country, I think many of our leaders now do believe that we need to undertake this uh, uh, adjustment in our policies. But I can see and hear, and I can hear from a lot of previous words that we, we have to be very careful about it. However, I'd like to, to be a little more bold in making some efforts to convince you that maybe we have to, to do much more. The economic reforms to amend the constitutional provisions have been very incremental in our case, and they arrive at a very slow pace. They cannot catch up with the need to make those changes. These restrictive economic provisions have been at the heart of our economic nationalism as a young nation, even before we became independent. At this slow process of adoption, we will become a tail ender in overall progress within the region. In any case, even if we now have more or less been on the way toward a better future because we have changed some of the policies, a more rapid adoption of the changes will accelerate further our social and economic progress. Undertaking the amendments will be the biggest boost that we need in opening the country toward more modernity, technological progress, higher incomes for our people, better employment for our workers, greater pride in our country's achievement in, in the economic field, and greater pride in relation to our neighbors as we restore our old position in the past. Uh, I think uh, I've heard enough to say that there is a great distinction between a fundamental law and ordinary legislation. Let me just make the point already pointed out by uh, one of the uh, resource persons in this hearing that we are the only country in this region with a fundamental law that covers the passage of laws on economic and business matters. All our neighbors, uh, I, I'll just cite the the five countries that formed the ASEAN way back in the past. We, were, we, we are one of the five countries, and the other four are Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand. These four countries did not have anything about sacred or fundamental laws on economic relations. They just have simple, ordinary legislation for all economic and business matters. They have also understood, I think, the need to protect themselves. They are not stupid in that respect. So uh, 
they have they have learned how to undertake all the kinds of restrictions that they needed to do. But they didn't have to have to, they, had, they didn't have to put it in and set it in stone in the form of a fundamental law. The fundamental law to which we were all gathered to follow have caused us enormous pain. Whenever we had to undertake a, uh, a need for change, whenever we have policies that required adjustments, we could not do it. We always look for the second best and the third best solutions. And those second best and third best solutions oftentimes lead the country towards greater bargaining of, of positions, exchange of favors, and so on. So possibly you can say that all the other things that lead to corruption and all the things that lead to, to the rent seeking within the economy are fostered with this. In the other cases, well, you know, they made mistakes. If they made mistakes, ordinary laws are so easy to adjust. And so they can make a mistake and correct them within a year or two. In our case, we made a lot of mistakes and eight decades from now. We realized this after the fifth decade. We made the mistakes. We cannot make the changes. We have three decades since the people power revolution, when we thought that we had changed the world. And we, we have not been able to do, uh, we have not been able to correct them because the nation had become divided on many issues. To me, this is one of our problems. The main contents of the restrictive provisions originally went, uh, were of course in the 1935 Constitution. We believed very much in all the things that they told us through our Filipino first policies and all that. And when we wanted to make a few changes, we never could do them. We have known this version of nationalism by the deceptively catchphrase, Filipino first. Of course, uh, it's a very nice motto. But of course, it, al it also led us to a lot of misallocations of resources to the wrong people who could make uh, us better off. Well, we, we know the story, and I don't have to elaborate on that. From the very start, the rules developed for these provisions imparted a set of complex decision rules that could not be changed when circumstances needed change. Malaysia, Indonesia, or the four countries I mentioned, they have no political constitutions, as I said. They principally focused on the, their constitutions principally focused on the aspirations of the nation, the structure and form of their government, the duties and responsibilities of the main officers of government, and the duties and, respons uh, and the responsibilities of the main officers. All business and, bus and all business and economic matters were only uh, matters for legislative agenda. That, to me, I think is the best solution for us to progress. We will have, we can, we have elected leaders to help protect us. Of course, some of us don't trust elected leaders. That's why we have uh, these kinds of quarrels among ourselves. But in numbers, there will be some people who will protect. I, I think, I, I, I believe that that is a better solution than having a, a law set in stone that we cannot change. Uh, where have I? I? I got involved and I could not proceed a little more. But <laughs> the fact is that the restrictive provision, uh, Singapore, let me see, I, I, I got lost. 
<laughs> with, you, with your permission, sir, while you're regrouping, we'd like to take time to acknowledge our distinguished minority leader, Senator Coco Pimentel, also a legal luminary in his own right, and our uh, good friend, the senator from uh, Makati, Makati, <laughs> Senator Nancy Binay. <laughs> Back to you. Uh, would you like time? So we'll, sure. we'll recognize you again. Uh, I will. Uh, what, what I'll do is uh, just keep on going because what, I'm, uh, what I have said essentially uh, can be expressed by the fact that if, the, if under ordinary legislation, if we make a mistake, we can make amends. Under our fundamental laws, if we make a mistake, we get quarrelsome. We get into quarrelsome meetings that never end in resolution. To me, that is a setback for the nation, year after year. And that's why we find ourselves now behind Indonesia. Indonesia has now entered a stage where they are far above us in making decisions on national economic issues. They have, they have made their mineral industries produce for them. They have made their forestry industries produce the papers that we use to print our, our boats in the Philippines. We, uh, they, 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 have done, they have done a lot in this regard. As a nation, we are very slow to react to the needs of the times, and I hope that our leaders will look to the important needs of our people rather than the limited protest against powerful interests and, consti and constituencies. Our actions with respect to the easing of burdens and obstacles toward the opening of the economy for greater competition are very slow and insufficient. We have to keep pointing out that we are far behind other countries that we have surpassed, that have surpassed our economic achievements to make some elements of our policy-making institutions to move forward. As we go through the implementation of these new laws, uh, I am not surprised if some element of society would question the, constitu the consti constitutionality of some of the aspects that, uh, of changes. But precisely because of this, we get bogged down again because projects can get stopped because we wait for the constitutionality ruling, and this takes time, this takes resources, this takes uh, delays, and basically even the loss of projects that should have been there years ago. Uh, in fact, this alone is sufficient to remind us of previous cases in which the stoppage of many projects have happened. I, I can cite a few egregious examples, but I will not do that because it, it, they're already written in my, in my note. Uh, you can read them if you want to, and I have cited them. Uh, I have listened intent, uh, uh, incidentally, I, I'd like to just make the, the following point. I have listened intently to some of the members of the Senate in connection with, with the issue of the uh, uh, amendment of the Constitution. And I can sense some uh, element of distrust on the issue. And perhaps I would uh, like to make a comment on what I've heard. I heard that foreign, uh, at least uh, I've heard it said, foreign investors do not ask for the amendment of the economic provisions. That's true. They don't ask for them, but they vote for, they vote with their feet on the failure of their uh, rates of return when they enter a country, when they fail to, to earn their rates of return, when they fail to undertake the proper, when they get disappointed in the country, they, li they, they leave with their, uh, they make their votes. They leave or they continue with us if they like us. I heard also that the poor and many Filipinos do not understand the issue of constitutional change. On this point, I'd like to make a major note. I believe that this statement serves to sweep 
under the rug and dismiss the benefits of constitutional changes to the poor in our country. The poor are so challenged to improve their living conditions that they are willing to sell their votes to candidates during elections. They attend any rallies to bust them if provided with food and money for any cause and don't care much about. They seek handouts, ayuda, in many forms, only to, to solve their immediate problems. If they understood that this constitutional change on the economic provisions would uplift their lives and that of their children especially, they would embrace these changes gladly, I think. We have to explain these things to them. Moreover, I've heard, uh, well, moreover, the fact that uh, our young people, the first thing they do is to look for jobs abroad and not to look for jobs at home means that their aspirations are not with us because they feel that they have no hope in the country. This thing, I think, will be changed if we make the right moves to amend the constitutions that will help us bring in the foreign investments that I think will raise the level of technology and the level of employment and wages in the country as we move along. There, is also, there are also comments that I heard that there are some priorities that, the, than the that are more important than just looking at the constitutional amendments that I'm looking for. And I've heard that it may be better to just improve the ease of do doing business. That might be the route. Or to reduce the cost of energy, to mitigate the relationships, the economic hardship of the, of the poor because of the high inflationary cost that we have. Or to reduce corruption. Well, my point is this. Various activities designed to improve the economy are likely to improve much more if we attend to the most important need that the country needs. Open the economy in the directions that will really bring the new jobs, technology, and, uh, and uh, opportunities to the few people. This means liberalizing many of the aspects of the Philippine Constitution. Moving the, uh, undertaking the right uh, changes that we need to undertake. I'd like to address the point that, that we have done enough to undertake reforms to meet some of the changes that we have to do. I, I don't believe we have done so. I don't believe very much that we have done so. So I do. I think we need to do, which is to amend the uh, the constitutional uh, 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 issues that have uh, that have stymied our growth on a long-term basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, for a very comprehensive uh, and uh, history-based overview, uh, Dr. Sikat. Salamat po. Uh, next, we'd like to. I would also like to, yes, I think we have acknowledged our colleagues here. Uh, we'd like to go to our former Secretary of Finance, for also a former uh, three-termer of the House of Representatives, Secretary Gary Tevis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, uh, distinguished senators, uh, esteemed uh, resource persons, uh, thank you for your invitation. We, the Foundation for Economic Freedom, have been advocating for the lifting of the restrictive economic provisions in the 1987 Constitution that have for decades served as binding constraint to economic growth and development. We believe that the remo removal of these rest economic rest provisions, restrictive economic provisions, would send a clear and compelling message to foreign investors, 
signaling a warm welcome to their investments and business operations in the Philippines. We recognize that liberalization laws such as the amendments to the Public Service Act, the Foreign Investment Act, and the Retail Trade Liberalization Act have been enacted in the previous administration. However, the Philippines still lags behind its ASEAN peers in foreign direct investment. Data as of 2022 and indicate that Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Thailand have surpassed the Philippines in attracting foreign direct investments. In this regard, we propose to liberalize, fully liberalize and lift the following restrictions in the 1987 Constitution by allowing up to 100% foreign ownership in the following areas unless otherwise subsequently provided by law. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, I will uh, Recording submit our in progress. statement so that this can be useful or be used by your secretariat. These are sections two, three, seven, 10, 11 of Article 12, Mr. Chairman. Section 4, Article 14, related to education, science, technology, and arts and sports. Section 11, Article 16, on general provisions related to ownership of mass media and uh, advertising. Mr. Chairman, we also propose amendments to the Filipino First Provisions in the following articles in the 1987 Constitution as follows. On Section 19, Article 2, Declaration of Principles and State Policies, which presently is quoted as, the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy effectively controlled by Filipinos. And this is our proposed amendment, Mr. Chairman. I quote, the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy, unquote. Section 10, Mr. Chairman, Article 12, again on national economy and patrimony, presently quoted as in the grant of rights, privileges, and concessions covering the national economy and patrimony, the state shall give reference to qualified Filipinos. We'd like to propose this amendment, Mr. Chairman, in the grants of rights, privileges, and concessions covering national economy and patrimony, the state shall give preference to qualified investors. If necessary, this and future Congresses can subsequently impose appropriate limitations, restrictions, conditions for ownership or safety nets should circumstances and conditions warrant those adjustments, just like most countries in the world and our ASEAN peers have done through ordinary legislation and not via constitutional change. The close and restrictive model has been with us since 1935 and contributed to the inability of our country to progress like its ASEAN peers. It is high time to change the business model under the Constitution. The Philippines is the only country in the ASEAN region where restrictions in foreign ownership are embodied in the Constitution. We need to have a legal framework and market conditions that match our competitors. Increased foreign investments in the, in the currently restricted areas would generate high, higher quality, higher paying jobs, boost incomes, provide greater opportunity for more inclusive growth and development for our people and the country. Mr. Chairman, various studies have shown that countries that have embraced a more open economy to foreign direct investments grew significantly faster than others who are more protectionist. There is a direct enhancement in terms of 
technical, technology, technological levels that foreign direct investment brings, which allows for the local labor force to learn from technical sources. To create a more competitive economy, the Philippines needs further adapt, adaptation to new and appropriate technology to reskill and upscale Filipino workers. And the influx of foreign direct investment can help the government in pursuing this endeavor. Mr. Chairman, we recognize that removing the foreign ownership restriction in the Constitution is necessary but not sufficient to attract more foreign investors. Other conditions such as the rule of law, good infrastructure, and ease of doing business among others must be present to compete with other countries in attract foreign investment. However, removing these restrictions is a necessary first step. We strongly emphasize that constitutional amendments should be limited exclusively to removing the restrictive economic provisions. This focus approach reduces the risk of political controversy and division and allows us to focus more of our efforts and energy in improving the welfare of our people. The removal of the restrictive economic provisions and subsequent influx of foreign capital would help improve our competitiveness relative to our ASEAN neighbors in terms of better and more infrastructure, telecommunications, power, and other public utilities. This would allow our government to spend more on education and health of Filipinos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I also submit my statement, as well as an updated talking points on the economic restrictive provisions, which might be helpful to your committee. Certainly, Thank certainly. We'll welcome that, uh, Secretary Gary Tevez. And if any members of the FEF also wish to come, perhaps if they have expertise in the various industries which are... Yes. We will have, uh, uh, with the permission of the Chair and the Senate President and the Senate leaders, uh, hearings on the various industries which will be affected. Uh, so the educational, higher education, uh, advertising, and maybe perhaps the public utilities, although really the provision on public utilities is, is only a reiteration of the uh, Public Service Act which Congress just passed uh, a year ago or two years ago. Uh, we'll convey your suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Next we'll have uh, um, the UK educated economist, uh, Sunny Africa, sir. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, I actually have a presentation. Is it okay to flash it? It might actually make things easier. Yes, we'll ask easier. the... Uh, there we thank are. you. <clears throat> um, I'll be very quick. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, Ibn Foundation is always happy to share what we can, even if there are attempts to silence us, even under the current administration. Um, I would like to apologize for all males. If I knew that this would be the, <laughs> the profile of the resource persons, I would have asked our our female research head to come in. But anyway, um, our bit, puro lalaki kasi eh. Um, sa amin po, yung economic chacha is um, unnecessary and diversionary. Um, so much can be done now if we're so interested and willing to develop the country, but it's also counterproductive. Um, it distracts us from more basic changes in economic strategy needed and actually also reduces our legal leverage to change things. Um, I have a couple of main points, but I think a lot of them are about facts. Um, there's, you know, I think there's wisdom to not leave economic policy making to economists. Um, we do have some facts to blow away this fog of dogma about um, FDI. Um, we strongly believe FDI is very exaggerated as a solution to underdevelopment. Development is a very complex phenomenon, as a bit alluded to earlier by Secretary Tevez, but singling out FDI, including charter change, as some kind of major means development is, we believe, reductionism pushed to absurdity. Um, pinag-usapin yung kaangkupan. Um, this, again, um, it's been distributed to the, to the Senate. We'll be sharing it. But this chart is quite straightforward. Um, the major countries of ASEAN are on the left side, including China. The columns are the different sectors of the economy. 
Um, this is a chart based on the World Bank investing across borders. The last report they made in 2012, we updated with um, data from the UNCTAD Investment Policy Hub and also from the U.S. Country Commercial Guide. It basically shows that per sector, green means open, then reddish all the way down to orange less open. Um, the Philippines is on top because as a result of all these um, changes in the laws over the past decades, starting I think with the Mining Act of 1995, um, even the constitu constitutional provisions, even without the amendment unless otherwise provided by law, laws have provided for many, many um, opening up, many, many sectors to be open to the economy. So I just want to highlight this. We think it's quite important. There is no basis now to say that the Philippines is among the least restrictive economies, it's among the most restrictive. On the contrary, the Philippines is now among the least restrictive economies of foreign investment in the region. Um, that's shown by so many sectors being green as opposed to other countries having more orange and red um, dots. Um, that's basically highlighting that so many countries in telecommunications, power, all the way up even to alcoholic beverages, there are restrictions to foreign investment, 20 to 80%. In many sectors of the Philippines, is 100%. We do want to address the point about flexibility. Um, Maybe the point isn't do we need flexibility or not, but whether these provisions are needed or not. Because whether they're in the constitution or in the law, if they're needed, it doesn't really matter about the flexibility. And I also want to disabuse us of the notion that we're more flexible once foreign investment comes in. Once foreign investment comes in, we're actually less flexible. Like a drug addict addicted to foreign capital, once foreign investment is in the country, we'll always be scared to st for them to go out, we'll always be scared about the disruption, we'll always be scared about the withdrawal symptoms. So I do want to stress that the flexibility argument is quite irrelevant. The point is, do we need these restrictions or not? So many other countries in the region feel they need stronger restrictions than we have right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, just some charts about the increasing foreign investment in the country. Um, the argument that, oh, we're getting so much less than our neighbors is actually also irrelevant. The point is, has foreign investment been coming in? Since the 87 constitution, foreign investment has poured in. UNCTAD reports about $113 billion in foreign investment in the country, whether in absolute terms it increased 40 times since 1987, or as a share of GDP it's increased four times as a share of GDP, foreign investment has poured into the country. There's no point saying, oh, we're getting so much less. The bigger question is, when this foreign investment has come in, has it developed the country? Um, and clearly it hasn't, so in the parang first place, third place. Uh, next slide. This is a very stylized way. It just shows the economic structure of the country since 1947. Um, you'll notice on the highlight three main points. Despite the increase in foreign investment, industrial and agriculture, and industrial and agriculture foundations of the economy have fallen. Um, the Philippines right now, our manufacturing is its smallest share of the economy since 1949, smallest in 75 years. Agriculture is smallest in our country's history. Again, this is despite a lot of foreign investment coming in, despite a lot of trade openness and globalization. Um, next slide, please. Um, a little bit of a case study. This is foreign investment in the manufacturing sector, which um, was already mentioned is 100% open to foreign investment. The manufacturing sector is open to 100% foreign investment, but it has fallen to its smallest share in 75 years. It was 17.9% in 2022. Um, the share of employment in manufacturing is the smallest in the country's entire history. Clearly, being 100% open to foreign ownership in manufacturing has not developed the Philippine manufacturing sector. To make things even worse, about 60 to 70% of our manufacturing is not even Filipino, it's actually foreign. Um, the Philippines right now is the eighth has the eighth smallest manufacturing sector. Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Cambodia, and Indonesia all have much higher shares of manufacturing in their GDP. Um, next slide. Um, again, a short example. Again, um, there's no point gloating about attracting foreign investment and thinking that it transfers technology. Intel and Hanjin were here for decades. They invested billions of dollars. They hired billions, thousands of workers. But when they left for their own reasons, the Philippines has nothing close to semiconductor industry after 35 years of Intel. We have nothing close to shipbuilding industry after 12 years of Hanjin. 
Same reason, when the Malampay natural gas runs out, we won't have any capacity actually to um, exploit our own natural gas. The real test for foreign investment is not what they do while they're here, because if you want to make money, they have to invest, they have to create jobs, they have to have economic activity. The real test is what is left behind. Um, foreign investors without the proper regulatory infrastructure um, will not leave anything behind. Um, locating the Philippines is not developing Filipino industry. Um, next slide. Again, to highlight, Philippine manufacturing is the smallest in 75 years, but the majority of Filipino manufacturing is actually foreign, whether by approved foreign investment, um, the World Bank's own estimates on our national accounts, or even by um, the revenue share in, in um, the top 1,000 corporations. Uh, the fixation on FDI quantities has distracted and shifted the policy, the focus of policy away from development. When a means to development FDI, somehow becomes an end, it stops being a good means to development. Um, next slide. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about what other countries have done. I'm so sorry, there's a lot of numbers here. I just want to stress, um, this chart, this table basically shows the Philippines right now, in absolute terms and as a share of GDP, has more investment than South Korea, Taiwan, and China did, whether in their period of economic takeoff in the 70s or 80s, or even at the present. So this nonsense about increased foreign investment will have development, that was not the case in, in the case of South Korea, um, Taiwan, and China in the 70s and 80s. It's actually not even the case right now. We have much more foreign investment, but much less development, because the problem is not lack of foreign investment. The problem is a lack of vision for industrial development. Um, next slide. Um, it's an important quote. Um, the United Nations State and Development Report summarized the development experience over 35 years. They basically said that the core of national development is industrialization for a great many reasons. And the core of national industrialization involves nationality. It's not about having foreigners in your export zone in a, in a low value added enclave. It's about building a national brand. And you will notice there is no point, no country, no industrial power brags about inviting for investment. They brag about Samsung, Hyundai, Intel. They brag about national brands because industrial development is about having national brands not being an address for them. Um, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, the last few slides actually highlights um, a problem with the thinking that the world is changing, the world is globalizing. Um, we jumped on the globalization bandwagon in the 80s and 1990s, causing manufacturing agriculture to fall to the smallest shares in decades, some in history. Um, the next few slides highlights, on the contrary, in the last 10 years, 15 years, sorry, since 2008, 2009, the number of protectionist measures has been increasing. Um, the previous slide, actually, the green, sorry, um, yeah, the green bar chart, uh, line chart graph shows protectionist measures since 2008. The orange measure shows liberalizing measures since 2008. Um, for a great many reasons, countries have become more protectionist in the last 15 years because that is in their national interest. Uh, the next slide is for investment measures. Again, a, a bit, it's up and down. Green shows increasing investment regulations among new measures. Orange shows decreasing investment liberalization measures. Um, next slide. Also want to highlight, um, we're a bit obsessed about investment agreements, about liberalizing. Um, I think it's useful to highlight, in the last 15 years, over 60 governments have terminated over 400 international investment agreements for being too liberal. Um, and of these 400 international agreements, nearly 200 were unilaterally terminated. Um, the two point I, wanted, I want to stress is, some decades ago, the argument was we can't restrict our foreign investment uh, we can't protect our economies because it's against the WTO, it's against the agreements. That does not hold anymore. So many countries, including Indonesia, are coming up with model investment agreements that are much more restrictive than before. Also, even the WTO, um, with the U.S. blocking appointments to the appellate body, the WTO is now actually um, unable to actually enforce a lot of its um, 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 laws, agreements. Um, last point. Um, in the opening statements, uh, there was a, uh, the OECD investment restrictiveness was shown, um, and the highlight was that the Philippines has the second most restrictive um, investment regime in the world. Um, this, exact same, this is that exact same chart, but I'm so sorry I don't see it right now. The dots are foreign investment flows in each of those countries. 
what's the point? The point is, if the countries are lined up left to right in terms of restrictiveness, yes, the Philippines is on the right end. But if it was true that restrictiveness worsens foreign investment flows, you would have an opposite slope of the dots. The fact that the dots are clustered in the 1% to 5% range of GDP, it actually basically says it is not true on an um, OECD um, 83 country level. It is not true that the more restrictive you are, the less foreign investment. Also, not true the less restrictive, the more foreign investment. There are a few outliers here, Singapore and Ireland, but even actually taking out the outliers, um, that, that, that conclusion is solid. Um, very, very last point. Um, next slide, please. Oh, anyway, this is just showing the flattening out of trade and investment. Um, I want to conclude by stressing um, we all want change. There are a lot of problems, but so many things to improve the economy don't need charter change. We don't need charter change to raise living wages, to give out, to distribute land for free, to provide um, the means for farmers to make the land productive, build more schools, build more hospitals, give more aid. 10 million things can be done right now without charter change. If we think that charter change will make those things much easier, that's actually not the problem. Um, that's it. Thank you. Very much, uh, Sani, for that data-driven uh, presentation. It's a good counter-argument. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Mr. Orion Perez Dumdum from the Constitutional Reform and Reunification Movement, uh, or Correct Movement. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, that's actually the... Um Constitutional reform and rectification for economic, uh, economic competitiveness and transformation. Unification. Not unification. No. Okay, thank you. I, I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Mayong adlaw kanin yung tanan. Labina sa tanan mga bisayang dako din he. Labina si sina Justice Ascuna, Lolo Jun Davide, nga taga si Bugi Hapon Paris nako. Si Secretary Gary Teves nga gikan sa Dumagete, Senator Bato de la Rosa. Senator Coco Pimentel, og si Senate President Mig Zubiri, ako rabang classmate ang imong manghod sa una, nga si Bea, sa French. <laughs> uh, maraming maraming salamat sa akong kaibigan at idol na si Senator Robin Hood Padilla. Assalamualaikum wa shukran. Um, and to uh, both Senators J.V. Ejercito and Senator Sani Angara, pailawin ang ilaw, luce at lux. Mga schoolmate ko yan dati. <laughs> and uh, to all senators and resource persons, greetings. All right, uh, let's go to business. Whether or not we agree with the proposals made in RBH number six, it is extremely necessary, in fact, long overdue, to at least amend or at best revise or even completely overhaul the 1987 Constitution because the 1987 Constitution contains some flaws, as it was unfortunately quite hastily put together at a time when the Filipino people and many of those tasked with drafting the Constitution were a little way too in a hurry and emotional about certain topics. And as such, any full rational analysis, careful and comprehensive research and full deliberation on the advantages or disadvantages or adopt of adopting or rejecting certain options and features was unfortunately not possible at the time. The end result of these flaws has been that the Philippines has been very visibly and obviously hobbled and hindered by the flawed 1987 constitution from achieving the economic and societal success that we so desperately need because some of the systems that we adopted were incorrect and have been proven to be incompatible with the kind of success that the Philippines deserves. If asked as to what we in the correct movement would describe to be the ideal type of constitution set up for the Philippines, we would describe it as follows. We need an open to FDI economic system with a constitution that is totally devoid of any restrictions against foreign ownership of businesses as this would represent the most ideal scenario for a Philippines in which job-creating international investors and global companies can easily come in and set up operations in the Philippines to create millions of jobs that would hire millions of Filipinos so that we would no longer need to become OFW separated from our families. In addition, 
We need a constitution that features an evolving federalism that would empower the regions to set up the appropriate policies that they are aware of, that they are knowledgeable with, that they know are appropriate for them, that could aggressively attract investments into their areas and thus spread out these jobs and economic opportunities to the rest of the country and decongest the already overcrowded and overcongested national capital region of metropolitan Manila. We all talk about traffic, right, and overcongestion, so many, so many squatters. Well, let's spread out the development to the rest of the country, not only Metro Manila. Federalism does that. We also need to have a parliamentary system set up nationally as well as parliamentary systems set up regionally to ensure more effective, efficient, and high-quality governance with real-time monitoring by a shadow cabinet coming from the opposition, regularly watching over every move of the government, also known as the administration, and calling out any anomalies discovered before they could ever cause major problems to arise. I did want to say, additionally, the 1987 constitution was written back in 1986. And at the same time, back in 1986, the Vietnamese government enacted their Doi Moi reforms. Doi Moi means renovation which moved their country away from communist, Marxist, Leninist central planning, and they went with full-on capitalism, or at least they did so incrementally, and they started to get rid of any restrictions against foreign direct investments. And look at the effects. In late 2021, the Philippines was overtaken by Vietnam in terms of GDP per capita. Ayan, naungusan po tayo. And I've been to Vietnam, and I was so envious of their progress. I've worked with the Vietnamese in my projects when I was working in Philips in Singapore. So I've seen how dynamic they are and how they can actually speak very good English now because they need this skill to be able to, um, to work in foreign companies that are coming in droves in their country. Now, um, I mentioned a lot of reforms, right? But because next year, 2025, is an election year, we know that we do not have much time. So let us, for the sake of being, um, well, of time, concentrate first on removing the anti-foreign direct investment restrictions. All right, so constitutional restrictions against FDI, the Philippines is first to be eliminated. Our economic system is one that is characterized by, by a parochial and autarkist protectionism resulting largely from a misguided form of nationalism that is incompatible with the realities of the Philippines, including but not limited to its lack of local technological and scientific innovation, lack of an indigenous business culture, low savings rate, low capital accumulation rate, weak culture of and entrepreneurship, and many other systemic factors that have caused the Filipino first policy to fail and cause suffering for a greater number of our people. By embedding numerous anti-foreign direct investment restrictions in the Constitution, such as 60-40 and 70-30 equity sharing agreements, favoring local investors and keeping international investment participation low, or outright bans, there is hardly any wiggle room or flexibility as these restrictions cannot be changed when the global economic situation changes. Most importantly, the Philippines ends up at the losing end when side-by-side -side comparisons are made, such as when comparing the Philippine constitution against the Vietnamese constitution or against the constitutions of other countries within the ASEAN region. And it is not difficult to see why. The Philippines is the only country in the region with such explicit numerical restrictions against foreign direct investments while other countries have no such restrictions written in their constitutions. While other countries certainly do have restrictions regarding the entry of foreign direct investments or any regulations, they are often not as restrictive and oftentimes not even requiring that the foreign investor have a merely minority ownership share. And more importantly, they are written purely in statutory legislation which can be easily amended or repealed when called for, or when economic conditions change. I'll give an example, just a little bit of an, uh, of a, an analogy. 
Kung magsisipilyo tayo, saan natin natatago ating sipilyo? Kasi madalas natin ginagamit ang sipilyo natin. Lalagay ba natin sa loob ng safe? Na yung safe ay kinakailangan ng combination at may sa mata at saka yung fingerprint at saka kung ano, may five minute na timer? Siyempre, namamadali tayo, di ba? Kapag kinakailangan natin gamitin ng isang bagay na madalas, nandun dapat ready gamitin, di ba? Yung mga hindi madalas ginagamit, yun yung, yung hindi madalas binabago, yun, ilagay mo sa safe. Constitutions are like you're putting it in the safe. And if you put economic restrictions in there, which should be dynamic, they should be changed whenever things change, whenever economic situations are changed, you're not going to be able to make those changes because of the difficulty of doing so. Recently, There have been attempts to address issues by creating circumventing mechanisms through legislative workarounds, such as making changes to the foreign investment negative list or amending the Public Service Act. These attempts at addressing the Philippines' rest restrictiveness, however, are ultimately incomplete and only partially effective because most international investors and global companies look at the Constitution first before looking at legislation. When they find that a country's constitution is restrictive, that country, ought, unfortunately, automatically gets eliminated from their shortlist. How do I know this? Because I've been an OFW in Singapore for a very long time. I've met with many high-ranking people from the HQs in Singapore. Yan ang sinasabi nila. Natatanggal lagi tayo sa kanila mga shortlist at the earliest round pa lang, sa constitutional round pa lang. leaving only countries whose constitutions are silent regarding the restriction of foreign direct investments. This explains why the Philippines automatically gets eliminated early on, while countries like Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, etc. remain on the list and eventually emerge victorious. Again, none of them have anti-FDI restrictions in the constitutions, in their constitutions. Only we do. The problem, truly, is that a misguided ideology of parochialism and insular protectionism have become ingrained within the Pinoy psyche, and yet there is no strong entrepreneurial and business culture supported by a strong culture of frugality and savings that would have allowed, nu that would have allowed numerous local businesses, business empires to flourish and become globally competitive. Instead, the protectionism set up by the Filipino first policy and ideology had spawned ineffectual and inefficient local businesses owned often by the entrenched local oligarchy characterized mostly by rent-seeking and complacency as opposed to excellence and competitiveness. But of course, there do exist examples that prove that Filipino businesses can thrive internationally, proving that protectionism is actually unnecessary. In Singapore, Jack and Jill snacks, of course, from the Gokongwei group, are very popular. In China, the Liwaiwai group's Oishi snacks are extremely popular. And I know this because I, l I lived and worked in China in 2004. And when I was there teaching English and learning, uh, sort of beefing up my Mandarin. Galing kasi tayo sa savior, di ba? So, um, when I was there, some of my students would say, Uh, teacher, teacher, you come from Philippines. Uh, we have a very nice product. It's uh, called Shanghao uh, Jia. Uh, 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 And this is the, this is the big, this is the best, the most famous snack in China. That's what they were saying. They love Oishi. Oishi is Shanghao Jia in Chinese. And they were basically fans of Oishi. And when they found out I was a Filipino, parang, sir, ang galing ng produkto nyo. Ganon. So, ibig sabihin, point ko, many of our companies don't really need protectionism in order to thrive. Doon pa nga sa China, eh, sila nga yung nangunguna. Eh, sila yung pinakasikat na kumpanya doon sa mga, sa mga snack food. So, you know, but I digress, no? Sensya na kayo. The dearth of investments, both local and foreign, have instead created a situation where there are way more job-seeking Filipinos than there are jobs, job openings available. Thanks to the law of supply and demand, it is easy to see why average and median salaries in the Philippines are extremely low. 
as job seekers bid salaries downwards just to have a chance at landing a very scarce job. Jobs in the Philippines oftentimes serve no other purpose than to act as a stepping stone towards overseas employment as the very low salaries mean that most Filipino wage earners will never really meet their most basic needs. And becoming an OFW in countries where job openings far outnumber job seekers ends up becoming the only way for Filipinos to feed their families. Okay, here's where I tell my story. Please bear with me. This is the, these are my experiences as an OFW. I myself became an OFW since the late 2000 when I had made an internal transfer from having worked in Microsoft Philippines and transferred to Microsoft Singapore doing the exact same thing. Okay, I had the same position, same job scope, but instantaneously ended up with a fourfold gross salary in increase. Gross, you know, gross. And once we factor in the higher income taxes and deductions in the Philippines versus the lower income taxes and lower deductions in Singapore, my net income was actually a five-fold increase in terms of the net monthly salary. And many costs in Singapore, at least back then, were almost the same as what we paid for in the Philippines. So enterprise center where Microsoft was in 2000, chicken rice cost 90 pesos. When I moved to Singapore, when the exchange rate was 30 pesos to one, I go downstairs from the office of Microsoft Singapore and go to the food court downstairs. It's three dollars. Pareho. Same price. So, pero ang laki ng sweldo ko sa Singapore kumpara sa sweldo ko sa Pilipinas. And I was already earning quite better than most, most peers. Now, um, it is sad that salaries are often much better abroad than in the Philippines. But it's, this also often means that millions of OFWs and overseas Filipinos tend to be away from their families and loved ones, in some cases visiting only once within several years. And the environment of the host country will not always be as welcoming as I myself recently learned after I defended a fellow Filipina, Miss Zoe Gabriel, also based in Singapore, who was maligned and cyberbullied by a few cyberbullies in Singapore, including the very infamous Serene Ho, who happens to be part of a very small group of anti-Singapore government operatives who seek to exploit the situation of the growing number of foreigners in Singapore in order to try to cause resentment to brew against foreigners, including Filipinos, among Singaporeans, and thus blame the Singapore government for this influx of too many foreign workers and expats. What, what happened there? I, um, they were trying to say, mayaman daw sina Zoe Gabriel. And I stepped in to say, actually hindi, because the cost structure for, for, for foreigners is higher because we do not get subsidies. Okay? School system sa Singapore, hindi katulad ng US, Canada, Australia, where everyone is free sa education. Sa Singapore, if you are a foreigner and you have ch children, you want to send them to a local public school, you have to pay 20 times what the local pays if you are a permanent resident, and you pay almost 40 times that, 40 times what the local pays if you are a foreigner. After I defended our compatriot by explaining why their attacks were based on factual inaccuracies, I became the, big, the victim of their extremely intensely focused and persistent cyberbullying precisely because I had managed to disprove their false narrative that they were trying to peddle. They did everything to try to sabotage me and my family in real life, including stalking me on LinkedIn and calling up the company that was listed as being my employer, and they tried to get me fired, making false complaints against me to Singapore's Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, and even making false complaints against me to the Singapore Police Force. When they found out which parish church I attended in Singapore, they sent fake complaints to the parish rector and even to the archbishop. In addition, they seem to have had access to some database which made them aware of which preschool my son was attending, not far from where we lived. These are real vicious psychopaths. If they were in the USA, they would probably have become serial killers. I made numerous police reports and filed a magistrate complaint, but sadly, cyberbullying seems low on the police priority list. 
We received so many threats and I got severely inconvenienced. I was sub subjected to in intense defamation by these cyber bullies, which destroyed my reputation in Singapore, which eventually led me to lose my job and my source of income. And that is why I am here today in front of you and not in Singapore attending this hearing via Zoom, which is what happened in 2002. I was still working in Singapore then. Our family returned to the Philippines just around two weeks ago, or the, the 14th of January, after selling and giving away many of our belongings accumulated over the, the years and bringing in so many balikbayan boxes. While OFWs and overseas Filipinos may seem a bit more pro prosperous than we had stayed on in the Philippines, some people in the host countries we stay in are, al are not always that welcoming, and ultimately our host societies are not our home. So even if I had become much assimilated in Singapore, having so many local Singaporean friends and talking to, learning to talk the same way that they do, <laughs> Serene Ho and those cyber bullies still saw me as an outsider. And they were singularly focused on trying to get me to leave Singapore. So what is my point? Batang haba haba nito. We cannot forever keep on depending on sending out OFWs to work abroad and be away from our families to send money back home. We need to find ways to bring lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of decent paying jobs from abroad to come to the Philippines. How do we do that? We should bring in more international investors and global companies. After all, we OFWs don't care who own the, the companies we work for. I, myself, worked for American and Dutch companies while I was living and working in Singapore. So let's bring them into the Philippines in huge droves, okay? Now, by removing all anti-FDI restrictions from the Constitution, the Philippines can, at the very least, have a fighting chance in being able to remain on the short lists of foreign companies seeking to invest within the ASEAN region. Eventually, if we play our cards right, the Philippines will succeed in doubling, tripling, quadrupling, or quintupling the amount of job-creating foreign direct investors that Wait, we bring uh, in. Begging your indulgence, Mr. Dumdum, yes, you've taken 20 minutes uh, already. already. Oh, so uh, if, we, we, if it's all right with you, could you wrap up and submit the rest of your okay. recommendations? We, are, we appreciate the passion and okay. the, the love of country. Thank all right. You. So it was a necessary thing for me to show that we cannot continue relying on sending out OFWs. Let's bring the jobs in. So I wanted to say that we in the correct movement therefore agree that RBH number six is on the right track as far as attempting to make the Philippines more open to foreign direct investors. Unfortunately, we wish to state very strongly our position that the use of the phrase, unless otherwise provided by law, while better than the original scenario where such a clause is missing, does not quite uh, in achieve the intended effect of telling the international business community that the Philippines is serious about opening up to foreign direct investments and is sadly a compromise suggestion that was concocted during the Noi Noi Aquino administration's term as a means to attempt to placate his emotional attachment to, the, to his mother's constitution by somewhat defanging such anti-foreign direct investment provisions without deleting Mr. them. Chair. Deletion Mr. Chair. is the only way to go, okay? Now, I, I would say, I would, I'm almost done. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'm almost done. Senator Lisa, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, all of us, members of the committee, have with the chair um, uh, listened respectfully to the input. I, however, do not appreciate the very personalistic uh, criticism against a former president in relation to who the Constitution. No answer, who can no longer who can, answer. You know, it's not humanly possible for him to answer uh, in relation to his mother, also a former president. And uh, I would just like to seek the chair's support in perhaps removing that from the record and uh, gently reminding uh, our resource person is, to... Is that a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, to observe the same mutual respect all of us around the table, members of the Senate and all our esteemed resource persons have been observing since uh, 10 a.m. Thank you, you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you very much, Andrew. Could you state uh, the words you wish stricken, the specific remark you wish stricken off the record? 
Well, Mr. Chair, if the phrase simply referring to former President Noynoy Aquino, his mother, President, uh, former President Cory Aquino, uh, in relation to the 1987 Constitution about sentimentality, I cannot remember the exact words. I do remember the uh, sentiment, and I feel it is inappropriate to the seriousness of our hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I move to strike it from the there's record, There's a motion. Mr. Chair. Uh, they're, they're seconded by the majority leader and the Senate president. Uh, any objection to the motion to strike off the record the remarks regarding the late former president, the two late former presidents, Aquino? Hearing none, the motion is carried. So, uh, thank we'll you, ask Mr. The, Chair, SBN. Thank Bancho. you for, uh, for that. Uh, the uh, stenographers will take note. Uh, yeah, take, go ahead. Good. Okay, uh, please, thank please, you. please wrap up. Uh, okay, Sir almost Dumbo. done. So, RBH number six proposes at best a mere half measure that will not be very effective. So right now there are three um, areas that are being proposed, but on, in reality there are actually six areas, six areas in the constitution that actually are related to foreign direct investment restrictions. My main point in, is trying to say, why not, instead of just having unless otherwise provided by law on these three areas, let us instead delete all, all of the areas that have anti-foreign direct investment restrictions. And I will name them here. Article 12, Section 2, which is about resource extraction and production sharing. Production sharing. Article 12, Section 10, the general 60-40 clause hanging over every sector. Article 2, Section 11, Public Utilities 60-40 Clause. Article 14, Section 4, Paragraph 2, for the 60-40 for Education. Article 16, Section 7, Paragraph 1, the ban on foreigners owning media. Article 16, Section 11, Paragraph 2, the 70-30 for Advertising. This does not mean that we will not have restrictions. I am just saying, just like my colleagues who have said, over and over again, that these do not belong in the Constitution. We can do what everyone else in the region or around the world is doing, which is to put these restrictions, if we need them, in mere legislation so that we can change some of the wording or some of the numbers when things change, when, when global situations arise that we that force us to change things if we put in our constitution words about pager companies facsimile machines tele telegraphs don't you think that we would be absurd seeing that these no longer exist today wala nang mga pocket bell di ba wala nang mga pagers wala nang facsimile wala nang gumagamit ng facsimile i mean things have already been overtaken even dvds na nga nawawala na eh. See these no Sir, are you wrapping up? So, yes, because, uh, I'm just saying. It seems you're taking a, another yeah, no, road. No. I'm just saying, I'm just <laughs> could saying. You, could we. Uh, I'm is, just saying. Is, is the finish line in sight? Is the finish line in sight, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Sinasabi ko lang, ito yung mga nagbabago lagi. Nagbabago sila. And if we put them in, in stone, if we put them in stone, hindi natin mababago. So let's just put them, take them out of the constitution and put them purely in legislation where they belong and which is what everybody else around the region does. Yun lang po. Dagang salamat sa inyong tanan. Thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat ng mga Thank you dito. very Thank much, you. Mr. Dumdum. Uh, we appreciate the input from an actual OFW and from your personal experience. Salamat po. Uh, with the permission of the Senate President of the body, we'll open it up uh, to the body for questions. Of course, we'll respect the... We'd like to acknowledge our Senate President Pro Temp and also one of the authors of Resolution Number no. 6, uh, the beauteous uh, Senate President Pro Temp, uh, Lauren Legarda. Good afternoon, ma'am. Who just celebrated her birthday. Her 50th birthday uh, a few days ago. 49th. 49th pala. So we'll uh, respect the hierarchy of the uh, uh, Senate officials. Yes, uh, Senator Pimitra. No, although I came in late, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may be allowed to raise my issue first because this is not a, about the substance. Uh, we, we're it in is, the question. Uh, it is about the... Pro uh, is it a point of order? Yes, go ahead. Our procedure. Go ahead. If it in, is a point in, of order, please go In ahead. effect, it's a, it's a point of order. Yes, in please. Uh, food for thought na lang po sa atin ito. What, what procedure are we following? 
uh, right now we are gathered here uh, as a subcommittee. But is this a subcommittee of the Senate as a part of Congress in its lawmaking function? Or are we treating this as a subcommittee of Senate as part of Congress as acting as a constituent assembly? Kasi iba po talaga. Yan lang naman yung main difference nun eh. Lawmaking versus amending the Constitution. So, I'm raising the issue of our procedure. Uh, if we notice our rules, we have specific rules uh, when we are acting as an impeachment court. Then we have uh, rules when we are acting as lawmakers. We don't have specific rules when you're acting as a constituent assembly or a part of a one half of a constituent assembly or a part of a constituent assembly. So, uh, are we proceeding now as lawmakers and then at some point in time there will have to be a formal break when we will declare our gathering as already Congress acting as a, as a constituent assembly? Do we do that later or do we do that as early as this moment uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I may, uh, Minority Leader, I think uh, it's a very good point uh, procedurally, but I think it's clear uh, that we are acting with, with our constituent power already because we are pr actually dealing with an uh, amendment to the Constitution. And I agree with you. Uh, our rules are uh, somewhat uh, sparse with respect to constitutional amendments, but if we look at uh, the jurisdiction of committees, uh, Mr. President, under... The, the Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes, it points out that there are 13 members and that it has jurisdiction on all matters proposing amendments to the Constitution of the Philippines and the revision of the existing law. So that is the only specific, uh, unless uh, I'm corrected, that's the specific uh, um, provision dealing with uh, uh, amendments to the Constitution. That's, that's the it, only one I can see upon cursory... Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Actually, yeah, if I may finish, uh, uh, Minority please. Leader, please with your permission. Uh, that's the one I see. So that perhaps is what's giving us basis, but perhaps if uh, we have, if we're not happy with that, we can talk to the, the chairman of the committee of rules, the majority leaders here, and perhaps that can be addressed and we can, uh, the members of the committee on rules can discuss any proposed changes to the rules and then uh, that has uh, parliamentary, uh, that's high in the hierarchy of parliamentary uh, motions, so definitely it's something that we can elevate to the plenary as early as today or tomorrow uh, if uh, to the satisfaction of uh, his honor. Uh. If I may add, Mr. Chairman, that is uh, actually the, the first thing I check. So, pagdating po sa rules natin, as a law-making body, we filed uh, a resolution. It was referred to the proper committee, this one, and then a subcommittee was formed. But then, so, but when we now make further steps, if we now go beyond the committee, the committee will now have a recommendation. My point is there must be a clear break, uh, Mr. Chairman, very clear break when the Senate is no longer acting as a lawmaking body, but we are now performing our uh, duties, our tasks as a... Uh, so-called constituent assembly because we are now uh, acting under Article uh, 17, uh, entertaining uh, to propose amendments to the Constitution. So maybe for today's uh, activity or event, we can justify it using our rules. Yan, uh, sinabi po ng ating chairman. Na, na, and I, uh, I agree, no, bin, binasa ko nga ganun, because a resolution was filed uh, as, uh, in, in Senate as a lawmaking body our rules accommodate it, referred to the proper committee. So, ang aking food for thought, Mr. Chairman, are the steps after, siguro, after this uh, committee hearing that we, if I could just, uh, uh, siguro, advise the majority to start thinking about this point, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we need to make this formal, formal break para klaro na ano na yung ano na yung ano natin kasi because if we do not make this formal break and we treat it as if we are processing a bill so ang tanong ko what is the final product although let us say concurred in by the other house then we have now a uh, an enrolled bill we are treating it like it's a law 
And we all know a law cannot amend the Constitution. So that is the danger, uh, Mr. President. So just, just an advance uh, food for thought, uh, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Minority Leader. That's a very good point. Uh, I Honorable think uh, maybe at the start we should have already said that we are uh, exercising our constituent powers under the fundamental law rather than ordinary legislative power. But uh, since you've raised it already, it, I, perhaps it's apropos to say also that uh, the vote requirement is different and the vote requirement will be as uh, indicated in Article 17 of the Constitution, which is three-fourths of all of the members, meaning 18 of 24 senators. So that's, that's one of the differences that you're ha perhaps alluding to. And uh, on the decision naman to whether to propose more specific rules, I leave that to the leadership of the Senate who's here uh, listening intently to you. Uh, is that, uh, can we settle that perhaps in the Committee on Rules? Uh, yes. Yes. One more point, para lang ma, may ano na rin po yung input. Uh, there is also a kind of law, law ito ha, ordinary law, where there is also a different vote requirement. Diba? I think this is the exemption from tax uh, tax so, That's majority. So, yes. uh, majority so vote, iba, yes. ibang, ibang majority doon, uh, per yes. the Constitution, but that is a law. But, yes, so kaya nga, so... Uh, let us not look at the vote requirement na as if that is uh, because three-fourths ang na-achieve, you na, we are already compliant. We, at the point where... Yes. Uh, basta ang point ko, meron din kasi doon sa... Ano ba sa... We're saying we must be clear in, in which, yes, power, uh, in which uh, capacity we are exercising yes, yes, our power. Yes. And in that sense, I agree with you, uh, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, actually, nung nag-impeachment court tayo, we also made it a point to wear robes just, yeah. to, just to highlight to the people that we are performing a very different function, no longer lawmaking, but as uh, senator judges. Ito naman, we have to do a formal, I'm not proposing that we change, we change, I don't know, we have a dress code, but there must be a for, formal break uh, between our Senate as part of Congress, the lawmaker, into Senate as part of Congress as the Constituent Assembly. Formal break, po, not an informal uh, assume, I assume na lang natin that we did it. So, yan lang po, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you for, for those inputs from our Mr. legal Chairman. and constitutional luminary. Mr. Uh, before I recognize uh, Chief Judge yes, David, I would uh, like I to ask Senator Bina if she has any comment on the suggestion to wear robes. Any, uh, no, no. Anyway, uh, we'd like to recognize uh, Chief Justice David. Go ahead, sir. I submitted a position paper and the preliminary statement, which I not read anymore, kanina, uh, practically includes the points uh, raised by uh, the Honorable uh, uh, former uh, Senate President uh, uh, Coco. Thank you. Chief Justice, uh, Senate President Zubiri. Thank you very much to the subcommittee chair. Uh, we take note of the, the manifestation and statement of our good minority floor leader, and we had a huddle with the majority floor leader. We'll take it up with the committee on rules and come up with specific uh, uh, procedures and rules for once all the discussions on the committee level is done. Once probably you have your committee report ready, uh, Your Honor, uh, we can uh, move towards uh, that particular uh, um, particular meeting as an assembly in, it's on the part of the Senate, on the part of the Senate. So we can come up with the rules at the proper time. We can adopt it on plenary, and uh, it could be adopted rules of the Senate. So, you lama po just for the information of the body. But nothing in the rules will prevent you, Your Honor, Mr. Chairman, from discussing uh, amendments, possible amendments and refinements to the Constitution as it's been done during the time of Senator Kiko Pangilinan when he was uh, Chairman of the Constitutional uh, Committee on Constitutional Amendments as well as Senator Robin Hood Padilla who's had already several hearings on this topic. So, once the committee report and will be taken up in plenary, be done, we'll have a set of rules ready for the implementation of an assembly. Thank you very much. Mr. So, Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator President. And now Majority Leader Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just to uh, put on record our uh, sincerest thanks and gratitude to our Minority Leader for pointing out the importance of uh, ensuring that uh, there's jurisdiction indeed uh, with this subcommittee. And I uh, refer to Rule 10 of our uh, uh, rules of the Senate, Section 18, and I quote that membership of the permanent committees, including the respective chairperson, shall be chosen by the Senate. The chairperson of 
Each committee may be designated the vice chairperson or such vice chairpersons of the committee and create such subcommittees as may be uh, deemed uh, necessary. I think it is important to note also what we have heard this morning, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, as uh, uh, mentioned by no less than our uh, esteemed uh, 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 retired uh, Justice uh, Adolfo Ascuna with regard to uh, the uh, track and path that we are uh, treading upon at this point in time. And uh, what we can say, uh, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, in the uh, light of what we will be discussing in this uh, subcommittee, uh, we are uh, ready to settle all of this in the Committee on Rules so that we can uh, further, further discuss this issue. So we thank the Minority Leader for uh, raising this uh, uh, very important uh, aspect of uh, this procedure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Majority Leader and Senate President uh, and Minority Leader. Uh, now if we could open the uh, period of, of uh, uh, questioning of our resource persons and we thank our resource persons uh, with your permission, may we work through lunch. Of course, we'll respect the hierarchy in the Senate. So, Senate President Zubiri, uh, would you like to ask qu any questions from our uh, resource person? I'd like to yeah. uh, wave and uh, listen to all the sides uh, of this issue, and uh, I'd, I'd like to wave my other. I'd like to wave my my time to other colleagues. Thank you, uh, Senate President Zubiri. Uh, Senate President Pro Temp uh, Lauren Ligardi, you have ten minutes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, thank you very much to our um, subcommittee chair and uh, greetings to my colleagues, Senate President and Majority Leader. Thank you. Very basic questions, and I address this to any of our uh, esteemed justices and former justices of the Supreme Court, our legal luminaries. So let's go back to basics. What are we proposing for amendments under the proposed resolution, which is authored by the Senate President, Senator Angara, and this representation? The proposed amendments to the three economic provisions of the Constitution pertain to the nationality requirement for participation in public utilities, basic education, and advertising. That's very clear. Only three specific economic provisions, no political provisions. While the proposals do not fix the level of participation of foreign nationals in the industries, the relaxing of the nationality requirement is expected to be achieved with the insertion of the clause which we included, which you mentioned earlier already, some had comments, unless provided by law. So, so far, I think it's clear I've laid uh, the predicate of where my questions are going to. So, may I ask uh, Chief Justice Davide, sir, uh, Justice Adolf Ascuna, and uh, our other esteemed uh, uh, guests. What is the effect of the insertion of the clause unless provided by law? Because under the proposed amendment, the extent of the participation of the foreign investors in the industries is not determined at the time of the introduction of the amendments to the constitutional provisions, obviously. It's just a phrase. Instead, the relaxing of the nationality requirements will be determined by the legislature voting separately as a constituent assembly. At some future time, in the exercise of our lawmaking power, which will eventually amend the Constitution. In effect, the amendment grants the power to the legislature to modify only the nationality requirement on the industries covered, which I mentioned which are three, without the more rigid requirements of amending the Constitution. Only the requirements with respect to passing a law shall then be observed when the legislature decides to exercise this delegated power subject to the approval of the executive and the exercise or non-exercise of the veto power. So in short, sir, in five minutes, I have somehow encapsulated the work we will do in the next several months. What it covers, the three economic provisions, the simple phrase that we're adding, unless provided by law, and uh, what it will do eventually, and the delegation of power to the legislature. Might therefore ask our esteemed justices, uh, are you in agreement with our humble understanding of the 
RBH, or the resolution of both houses, which three senators had authored. What are your perception, comments, uh, thoughts on this? And I have a short follow-up question after that. If my understanding is correct, can you kindly critique uh, the method and the three provisions uh, which we included? And if my perception is incorrect on our RBH, we'll be happy to be educated by you. Thank you, sir. Chief Justice, please, and then Justice Escuna. Resolution uh, of both houses number six, as I observed in my preliminary statement, is not very clear. Whether it is calling for a constitutional convention or whether, and rather constitutional assembly, con us, or it is simply trying to pass its ordinary legislation by a vote of three fourths. In which case, like an ordinary procedure of passing laws, once it is voted upon by three fourths, it should pass to the lower house. The lower house will now act on it as if it were an ordinary legislation coming from the Senate. If the lower house will agree to it, it should be by a vote of three fourths. However, on the other hand, if the lower house will add one more amendment, it may be another amendment. Remember that right now in the lower house, you have the uh, lower house uh, uh, resolution of both houses number two, which would include practically all of the economic provisions. The lower house can now include that. Then it will approve with the amendments. What will happen? The Senate and the lower house will call for a conference committee. And that is where the fight, well, probably the end of the fight will come in. On the other hand, if it would be a con us, it would be by a joint resolution. You have to follow the rules on how to call a joint Congress, a joint, uh, a joint, uh, a, a Congress in joint session. There must be an agreement between the lower house and the upper house to call for a joint session, precisely to act as a constitutional assembly. Thank you for that, sir. May I have your views, uh, Justice Ascuna, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I uh, agree with uh, Chief Justice Davide. There is a need to signal that you're acting now under Article 17. Uh, by the way, the word constituent assembly does not appear in the Constitution. Actually, the Constitution merely says Congress is the one empowered to propose amendments or revisions to the Constitution under Article 17. It's still Congress. Uh, however, when Congress shifts from its mere legislative uh, function of making ordinary laws, to one of proposing amendments or revisions to the Constitution, it has to signal the, the shift. How do you signal the shift? Uh, as I said earlier, by instead of saying be it enacted, you say be it resolved. That's already a signal uh, in addition to the title of your resolution, which is to propose amendments to the Constitution. There is no need for joint meeting or join hearing. The Constitution doesn't require it. It merely says Congress may, uh, by a vote of three-fourths of all its members, propose. So you can do that uh, separately. Uh, but you have to signal that you are proposing now amendments or revisions to the Constitution. And I think it is sufficiently signaled by uh, calling it, be it resolved, and then your title. Uh, uh, meaning uh, proposal to amend. And you don't have to submit it to the president, unlike a bill that he has to sign. In amending or revising the Constitution, the president has no role whatsoever. It's just Congress plus plebiscite, the people themselves. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, in the case of resolution of both houses, number six, However, uh, you do not merely put unless advice provided by law, but you change the wording of Article 14 by adding basic to the word education. In other words, you acted 
as if you are revising the Constitution uh, by changing the wording. Uh, the effect, I know, is to limit the uh, nationality requirement to higher, to, to basic education and uh, allow foreign investments in higher education. But uh, you're already doing what Congress should do later on. Just say, unless otherwise provided by law. So just word it this way, educational institutions, etc., etc., unless otherwise provided by law, shall be owned by Filipino citizens. Later on, Congress can pass a law uh, saying that basic education is not, foreign investment is, is not allowed in basic education. That's how you do it. Uh, don't don't uh, change the wording of the law except of the Constitution, except to add unless otherwise provided by law. Uh, and then you can even put that in the title, uh, a proposal to amend uh, the restrictive economic provisions of the Constitution, Articles 12, 14, and 16, by adding the words unless otherwise provided by law. Ganun lang. Uh, what is the effect? The effect, if approved by three-fourths of the Senate, and three-fourths of the House, it becomes a proposal submittable to a plebiscite. And you submit it to the COMELEC for a COMELEC to hold a plebiscite within that 60-day, 90-day uh, formula. And if approved by the people in the plebiscite, then the amendment is carried. The provision in the Constitution is now amended to read uh, uh, education, etc., etc., shall be owned by unless otherwise provided by law. So it's still prohibited, but a law can be made to change it to allow foreigners. Uh, that on ordinary law, that, that's no longer amending the constitution. You can now you are not allowed by the constitution to amend the law. Is that irregular? Of course not. There is already a provision in the constitution now that says that practice of profession shall be limited, uh, practice of the legal profession shall be limited to Filipino citizens except in cases provided by law. Nakalagay na ngayon yan sa Constitution, tingnan ninyo. So that formula is already in the Constitution, accepting. So there's nothing wrong in saying that advertising shall be limited to Filipino citizens except as may be provided by law or unless otherwise provided by law. It makes it changeable by legislation. That's all it does. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, with your indulgence, Senator, uh, Senate President Pro Temp, the Senate President wants to intervene. Really quick uh, on the ideas of, uh, uh, of course, Chief Justice Davide and Justice Kona. Uh, we discussed it also very quickly on the side on the amendment of our rules. Um, we had said that the committee may al be allowed to do the committee hearings, get, uh, of course, uh, the advice and the uh, inputs of different um, uh, uh, luminaries, whether in the legal field or the uh, financial um, side or financial uh, sector, uh, and all other sectors concerned. But at the end of the day, we were discussing with the majority leader what would trigger the creation of a Senate counterpart, Senate Constituent Assembly, was basically the submission of the, and you can add to our suggestions, when we craft our rules, is the submission of the committee report by the committee signed by the majority of members, meaning it can be, it can be taken in pl for plenary action. So that could be a signal. Once that is done, then we can come up with a constituent assembly on the Senate's part. We're actually thinking about the idea not to have it during plenary, ta plenary session at three o'clock, but earlier in the morning, so it'll be treated as a separate uh, entity, a separate uh, assembly, and we can discuss, and I think the minority floor leader agrees with me, because we'll be part of the rules uh, making uh, when we come up with the uh, final uh, uh, amendment to our rules. And then we could make, make the decision wherein the amendments can be voted upon individually. Let's say there's on, on issue on national patrimony, education, and all. It can be done three-fourths vote per amendment. And the reason why I say that is I foresee a problem in the future wherein the House may stick to its guns and add more, seven amendments or even political amendments. And so 
uh, definitely um, that is where I see a bit of a difficulty because we're going to have to look into a bicameral setup wherein um, they will submit to us their version and amended or the approved version of the house and we will also submit our approved version and eventually that will be up for discussion how I think that is what I foresee is going to be the problem there. Uh, how do we reconcile uh, these two documents? Of course, if the Senate refuses to agree to the amendments of the House, then nothing is passed. In other words, we have no amendments to the Charter. So um, that is how we're going to craft our rules for the information of everyone. And that's the suggestion we made to the head of the Rules Committee, which will be discussing lengthily now with the Minority Floor Leader and the members of the Rules Committee. But more or less, that's acceptable, uh, Your Honours. I, I presume that that is an acceptable proposal on the rules. So we will be uh, meeting outside of plenary session because this is not legislation. This is amendment to the Constitution. And how the rules will be done on approving each individual amendment will be discussed there. As long as it is three-fourths vote approved by each uh, by by uh, this constituent assembly uh, headed on the part of the Senate so you know po, chairman and I think um, actually that's exciting we'll be discussing that the rules committee will assist the majority floor leader on crafting the specific rules on that particular on this particular topic on amendments to the Constitution thank you chairman thank, thank you very chairman. much mr. president and back to you uh, mr. chairman and president pro tem uh, yeah. Senator Nancy uh, you just you additional inputs dun sa sinabi po ng ating Senate president Kailangan po bang simultaneous, um, if we call as a joint assembly, should the House counterpart file a similar rules or dapat din pa silang mag-convene as an assembly? They have their own rules of procedure. If, if uh, That's my initial impression. Of course, I could be, yeah, but I could be that, corrected by yeah, the... Would that uh, constitute a constitutional assembly when only one House declares an assembly? But they, they, clearly, um, we cannot pass any amendments if. Uh, but no, no. Let's let's let's, let's, let's address uh, it to our resource persons. Uh, um, yeah. Ask for our any of our resource persons. persons. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Chairman. Pwede po bang one sided? Mr. Chairman, this problem has really been a vexing problem since the adoption of the 1987 Constitution, all because open oversight. You see, the beginning of this uh, problem was this. The Constitutional Commission, which uh, drafted the Constitution, was working on the basis of a unicameral Congress. National Assembly, as it was called. At the very beginning, there was a debate whether the legislative department should be bicameral or legislative uh, or unicameral. So this problem hang until the end of the session of the Constitutional Commission. With two houses, you have a problem. How are they going to meet? as uh, you are now experiencing the problem. The chairman, if I recall, uh, from my reading of the records of the commission, was uh, the late uh, uh, commissioner uh, Suarez. The question was, what are we going to do? On what assumption are we going to work on? On the assumption that we will adopt a bicameral Congress or a unicameral National Assembly. This problem was not resolved until the very end. So, with that problem, it was agreed. It was agreed in the Committee on Constitutional Amendments and uh, transitory provisions. It was agreed this way. Said Suarez, we will keep it like this until it is decided otherwise that it will be bicameral. In what way? He was 
talking with Commissioner Regalado. And what would it be? In the event that we adopt a bicameral Congress, we will insert the word joint assembly, the votes of the two houses counted separately on that basis. So all the provisions of the Constitution, the draft of the Constitution, based on a unicameral Congre uh, National Assembly, were put on suspensions. Then finally, Commissioner Rosales, the chairman of the executive department, said, we have agreed it will be a bicameral Congress. So all provisions of the constitutions were amended so as to reflect this. And so you have several provisions of the constitution. For example, when the vote for president is counted, the two houses meet in a joint session to proclaim the president and the president-elect. When there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president during his term, the president is given the power to, co to, co to nominate and his nomination of the vice president will have to be confirmed by the two houses in joint session voting separately. All voting separately. Number two, number three, when there is a problem, is the president disabled from performing his official duties? And his cabinet believes he's disabled, but the president insists that he's no longer disabled. Who resolves the problem? It is Congress in joint session again, voting separately. When martial law, when martial law is declared and the proclamation of martial law or the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, who can revoke that? Congress, but how can Congress act? It is only here where Congress, although meeting again jointly, both as a whole, but otherwise meeting jointly. In all of these instances, in all of these instances, Congress is required to meet in a joint session but the votes of the two houses are to be separately counted as a consequence of the decision of the executive department uh, to have an executive department uh, committee changing these provisions. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I should say, these are non-legislative functions of Congress. The main function is lawmaking. These are non-legislative functions. The amendment of the Constitution is not the work of Congress. It is also a non-legislative function. It is just as important as the declaration of war or a state of war, which requires Congress to meet jointly as one assembly and vote separately. If you regard the amendment of the Constitution as important as that, don't you think that this silence in Article 17 as to how Congress should act as a constituent assembly, would there be doubt in your mind that it is not Congress as a lawmaking body, but it wears a different hat 
that of being a constituent assembly. And in two decisions of the Supreme Court, Tolentino versus Comelec, Gonzalez versus Comelec, the Supreme Court said, when they act as an assembly, they do not act with any distinction whether they are senators or congressmen. They act as one assembly, members of a constituent assembly. Therefore, I submit, Mr. Chairman, that this body is not a constituent assembly nor a part of a constituent assembly. Because to become a constituent assembly by resolution, my opinion is that the two houses must first agree to sit together and then pass a resolution to constitute themselves into a constituent assembly. It is only from then that you have a constituent assembly contemplated in Article 17, Section 1, Paragraph 1. Otherwise, no. That's it. It was an oversight, and I think it behooves Congress. I've been raising this problem because many times I've been invited to uh, testify before uh, cha, -cha uh, committees, both, both uh, houses of Congress, and in both instances, I've insisted on that. Otherwise, to say that they must vote separately, you are disregarding the fact that Congress is not acting as a legislative body. They are acting, Congress is acting as a constituent assembly. Isa lamang po, isa lamang assemblea, not Congress. Because when we speak of Congress, we speak with the two houses. We imply the House and the Senate. But when we speak of a constituent assembly, we call on the Congress to wear its other hat that is, as a constituent assembly. Thank you. Point of order, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Justice Mendoza. Yes, uh, what's the point of order, Santa Teresa? Mr. Chair, thank yes. you. And with uh, uh, thanks to the indulgence of the Senate President Pro Tempore, I think that uh, Justice Mendoza is raising a prejudicial question. And so my point of order would be until we agree upon and comply with the uh, proper constitutional well, procedure, uh, I would move, Mr. Chair, to suspend these hearings. Yeah. I so move, Mr. Chair. Uh, there is a motion to suspend. What is the pleasure of the body? No, I, I, think, uh, uh, I object, Mr. Chairman, because yeah. I think our rules allow the discussions of uh, amendments to the Constitution. We're talking about yeah. topics such as the economic provisions, uh, even a discussion on how it will be implemented. Uh, we do this every administration, every uh, Congress. So if we not, if we, if that's just, if the prejudicial question would be uh, taken up each time there's an amendment proposed and filed to this committee, then this committee will cease to exist. It will have no no function whatsoever. So I may, may, with due respect to my dear colleague, Senator uh, Risa de Veros, I object to her motion. Yes, I second uh, the motion of the uh, Senate President. Uh, clearly, we have a standing committee on constitutional amendments and are free to discuss it, particularly with such able and distinguished uh, resource persons. Thank you. Thank you, Senator yeah, President. No, let Senator me also Amy. put on record, Mr. Chairman, uh, my Rodriguez objection. And Senator also. Bato de la Rosa for an orderly proceeding. Yes, go ahead. I, I, I would just like to put on record yeah. my uh, objection as well. As, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. We have already put in the record. Uh, with your permission, paper. Justice Mendoza, there are some, uh, we must settle the point of order before we go to the discussion. With as, your permission. As, yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As uh, this representation already read into the records, the basis uh, of the jurisdiction of the committee, including the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, uh, it may be yes, Senator De La Rosa. Yes. Yeah, Mr. President, I just would like to manifest my support to our Senate President, because right now, as we speak, we are not we are not yet wearing our second hat. We still have no hat right now. <laughs> so, 
I thought you were wearing a hat. I thought you were wearing a hat. You have to wear a second hat later, maybe, Mr. President. Right now, there's no pre prejudicial issue. Right now. So, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Scudero, yes. It's Senator Bato who might need a hat, Mr. President. Um, um, may I, to, to educate us as well, may I ask my former professor, Justice Vivi, Yung pag-uusap po ba sa pagitan ni, ja ni Commissioner Suarez at ni Commissioner Regalado na kailangan joint session, voting separately, kapag ka ang napagkasundoan ay bicameral, ay nasa record ng Constitutional Commission o pribadong pag-uusap po ba yan? It's in the record, Mr. Chairman. No. And I can cite the record if you give me time. Yes. If it's in the record, um, Mr. Chairman, um, I think there is good reason to proceed with it cautiously because um, all of these proceedings might be for naught. Because as we know, the debates in all of the laws that we pass form part of the intent of Congress. And in so far as the Constitution is concerned, the debates too would form part of the intent of the framers of the Constitution. And if that is what they intended for it to mean, then we might be treading on questionable, to say the least, waters if we proceed in this manner. Um, baka may bagong akusasyon na naman na sinasabotahe ng personal. It, but it's better to um, proceed with it cautiously and um, take note and take heed of the points raised by Justice Mendoza as well as the other justices and Chief Justice before we proceed, because this is already the beginning of um, our second hat. I think that's the point of Justice Vivi. Um, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, we don't know yet, and um, the committee report will be the product of this um, proceedings. So perhaps we can proceed with the hearing and hear out all of our resource persons. And for today, until we decide on the matter and be guided um, accordingly. Para naman hindi masayang yung hearing today. Yeah. I appeal to um, Senator Risa um, for at least for this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Senator Chief. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Lauren was also raising her hand. I think she wants to speak. And uh, then the minority leader, I think, wants to speak also. So, actually, Senator Lauren, Senator Pro Tem. Actually, yeah. I have not utilized my time. So. Yes, but there's a, yes, there is a point correct. of order. And in the, yes, in the rules, point of I, order takes precedence. Your I Honor. know. Uh, yeah. are the so, let's settle the point of order so we can go back have to you. Have you settled it already? Yeah. We've not. We've uh, not. Not yet. There, we are hearing okay. the arguments uh, okay. for and against, Your Honor. Yeah. May we settle? the point of order, Mr. Chair, then I <laughs> proceed with my questions for the justices. Yeah. Yes, yes, but please, uh, that's why. If we can settle this, then we can go back to you. Yeah. Senator Minority Leader, yes. Well, uh, as I understand the point of order to be, it's not really a permanent uh, suspension. It was uh, just a temporary suspension of the committee hearing. State so PRO, that, so that, no, so that we can uh, digest the inputs given to us. But I think uh, the movement uh, wants to add something, so. Uh, back to the movement, uh, Senator Risa. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and dear colleagues. So just to reiterate, as the minority leader said, my motion was to temporarily suspend the hearings until we answered what I believe is a prejudicial question being raised by Justice Mendoza, until we uh, determine and comply with the proper constitutional procedure. But... And as part of, as the minority leader said, uh, digesting what has been brought up so far, also through reviewing the records of the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission. But in the meantime, uh, in response to the first um, objection of the uh, Senate President and uh, the request of Senator Cheese, um, and having clarified the intent of my uh, point of order, because I feel, most, most of all, Mr. Chair, I feel what Justice Mendoza has raised is a prejudicial question. But for now, uh, I, I submit to the, to the objection and the ruling of the Chair. So I think for it, today, uh, you're chair. not insisting you, on the motion chair. for today. Yeah. I am uh, submitting you're, to you're, the uh, objection, Mr. Okay. Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, graciously uh, doing so. That allows us to proceed. And uh, of course, we want to place it on record. Justice Mendoza's opinion is one of many. And uh, earlier we heard a contrary opinion from Justice Ascuna, who was a member of the uh, 
1987 Constitutional Commission. So even the best lawyers, this shows uh, the public that even the best lawyers can disagree sometimes. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Just uh, to add a little on the controversy, it is just uh, to correct uh, the part of the statement of uh, Justice uh, Mendoza on what happened uh, in the Constitutional Commission. The fact of the matter is uh, I happen to be the chair of the Legislative Committee. And uh, my good friend Adolf here was the vice chairman of that committee. The committee recommended uh, a unicameral body. And at the time that uh, the transitory provision, rather the, uh, uh, the, the article on amendments and revision to the Constitution and transitory provisions were taken up, it was based precisely on uh, the assumption that what would be adopted eventually would be as recommended by our committee, which was uh, unicameral. Unfortunately, unfortunately, during the plenary session on a voting as to the form of government, whether bicameral or the form of legislature, whether bica or uni, by one single vote, the committee lost. And it was the motion of uh, Delegate uh, Villegas who voted that we adopt the bicameral assembly. Same thing happened in the committee as a matter of fact. The committee actually voted for a bicameral body originally. As chair, I voted to break the tie in favor of uni. So that is exactly what happened. But you don't have to worry about it because if you read the commentary of Justice uh, of uh, uh, Father Barnas, one of the members of the Constitutional uh, Commission, in his book, the 1987 Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, a commentary, uh, 2003 edition, page 1297, it is very clear that Congress may do so propose amendments either a single body or in a joint session. If it were a single body, each one can propose. And that was what I answered before to the question of uh, Senator uh, Legarda. What Congress can do in the first instance would be a simple legislation proposing an amendment. So the Senate can do that, propose an amendment. Or once it is approved, the proposal will go to the lower house. The lower house in the regular process of legislation will act on it. There may be debates as earlier, earlier, there may be amendments and several amendments may be proposed. On deck, for instance, is the both, uh, resolution of both houses number uh, six now in the lower house uh, authored by uh, uh, Congressman Salceda. It will open up the entire provisions on the national patrimony and economy. Uh, not only three, not only four in the, the resolution of uh, Senator Gachalian, which is your uh, joint, uh, which is actually your uh, 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 resolution about houses number one. That was the first, that was filed in July yet of 2022. And it was submitted to the Mother Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes and public hearings were had their own as earlier announced all over the country. But uh, we do not know yet uh, what had been the proposal of uh, the mother committee. And that is exactly the reason why I also uh, raised in my preliminary statement whether after this subcommittee shall have acted on this resolution number six, the, committee's rep the subcommittee's report will go back to the mother committee and the mother committee to treat it simultaneously with the uh, resolution of Senator Gachalian. If it had not been acted upon, there are no reports. If there had been a report, we should like to find out. Now again, if there had been no report, does it mean that by tra treating this particular resolution, we will be abandoning resolution number one? So that is the issue that I raised. So now, <clears throat> since it was, go back to the issue of uh, BICA and UNI, I would uh, request you to, it's uh, embodied in my uh, uh, position paper, and it is also in my position paper 
submitted to the Committee on Electoral Reforms and uh, People's Participation of the Honorable Amy Marcos. So these are the clarifications I would like to put. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice Davide. That was very clear. Uh, anybody else want to weigh in? We, we'll go back to uh, Senate President Pro Temp uh, Legarda. She still has uh, six minutes left. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Justice Mendoza, for making that very important and relevant clarification on the goings on, uh, which you said are on record in the 1987 Constitution, because in no uncertain words you had clarified that both houses of Congress, even if it was unicameral at the time, had envisioned that the votes will be counted separately, and therefore any joint voting must be deemed separate. I think that's very clear, Justice Mendoza. Uh, we are grateful for that clarification once again, and it is evident that the People's Initiative, as worded, that has been going around in different districts in the country, it renders it illogical or an aberration based on the statement you made on the intent of the framers of the 1987 Constitution. Thank you, sir. It's very clear. Now I go back to my questions on the inclusion of the clause unless otherwise provided by law. The addition of the clause under, unless otherwise provided by law, while giving us, the legislature, both houses in this case, the power to modify the nationality requirements in the future by legislation should be read together, obviously, uh, with other provisions of the Constitution, including Section 10, which you mentioned, Article 12, on the national economy and patrimony, which has been discussed in the past several weeks, because we know that we're only amending Articles 12, 14, and 16. I will not read the whole section into the record, but perhaps Section 10, when it says Congress shall, upon recommendation of the Economic and Planning Agency, when the national interest dictates reserve the citizens of the Philippines or to corporations, at least 60%, and we know that. And at the end, it says, the state shall regulate and exercise authority over foreign investments with its national jurisdiction and in accordance with its national goals and priorities. So my question is, because we are amending to our RBH number six, only articles 12, 14, and 16, how, and we are not amending the national economy and patrimony provision, uh, how can we be aligned without touching this provision? Will we be consistent with other articles of the Constitution if, unless otherwise provided by law, is only instituted in Articles 12, 14, and 16? Will it be, in short, will it be consistent with the national economy and patrimony uh, provision of the Constitution, several lines of which I read into the record? Thank you. I address this to Justice Oscuna, Chief Justice Davide, and Justice Mendoza. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, may I answer that question? Go ahead, it's Justice. True, it's true that under Article 2, uh, Section 19, it provides that the state shall uh, establish a national economy that is independent, uh, resilient, uh, independent and effectively controlled by Filipinos, effectively controlled. Uh, now, if we amend sections, uh, articles uh, 12, 14, and 16, to make the economic restrictions on the percentages changeable by legislation, it does not mean that uh, it will result in an economy no longer effectively controlled by Filipinos, because you can still, uh, provide, for instance, a 5149, uh, 51 Filipino, 49 foreigner, is still effectively controlled by Filipinos. It doesn't have to be 60-40. Uh, uh, in Spain, it's 51-49. And the foreign investors are happy with that. Uh, they, they, uh, they don't like 60-40, but they are acceptable to 51-41. So, 51-49, so it's still effectively controlled by Philippines. So it's not inconsistent, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, you can also put safeguards such as reciprocity, safeguards such as uh, what is provided for in the, the International Covenant on civil, on economic, social, and cultural rights, that uh, a nation may, a people may uh, uh, allow uh, the foreigners to enjoy their resources in accordance with the principles of mutual benefit and international law. So you can uh, introduce that. So when you say it's subject to legislation, uh, number one, the restriction continues until legislation provides otherwise. Number two, uh, the legislation should take into consideration the framework of uh, investments under the, the rest of the Constitution, which is that uh, it is uh, supposed to be an economy effectively controlled by Filipinos. So uh, it has to be consistent with that framework and uh, the the entry, the entry of uh, foreign investment must be for our mutual benefit. That's why I, I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, that we should not uh, remove the restriction with respect to non-renewable resources because uh, that would uh, imperil the effective control of Filipinos over the entire economy. So advertising, even education, uh, and public utilities uh, will not necessarily remove the effective control of Filipinos from the entire economy. Thank you. Thank you. The views of both Justices uh, Mendoza and Davide, please. Thank you. Uh, perhaps? Justice Mendoza. Uh, these many provisions, Article 12, Article 14, and Article 16, simply carry out a general statement found in Article 2, Section 19, which says that the state shall develop a national economy that is independent and controlled by Filipinos. So, if you do not want these provisions in 12, 14, and 16, which are exclusively Filipinos, you want to open these activities to foreigners. Just remove that provision of Article 12, Section 19, because that is a basic principle, and they simply carry out that provision. In that way, you leave it to Congress to decide what the policy on economic uh, activities and the patrimony of the nation should be. It has been said here that in other countries that simply led to legislation, ordinary law, but that's probably they don't have the same constitutional provision that we have. But as long as Article 2, Section 19 on national economy is there, you will have a contradiction, Senator. What you declare in Article 12, Section 19, you contradict because you leave it to Congress by ordinary law to change what the policy or principle should be. As it stands now, and I'm trying to help the committee with its uh, resolution number six, Resolution number six sounds more like an amendment to give Congress the power to amend the Constitution rather than an amendment of economic provisions. The emphasis, as I see it, is more on the power of Congress to change what has been declared as fundamental principles in the Constitution. 
Now, we, don't, we cannot have a constitution that is self-contradictory, that carries with it the seeds of contradiction. You declare solemnly in Article 12, Section 19, that we have to have a national economy controlled by Filipinos. And yet, you amend, you want to amend the provisions of 12, 14, and 16, and open this to foreigners and remove control in the hands of Filipinos, we will have a very contradictory position. That's just like saying, amend the Constitution in this manner, and then you have a provision there that the people have a right of revolution. Thank you for that, uh, Justice Mendoza. That was actually the crux of the matter, my question, because we're amending 12, 14, 16, but uh, focusing on the article or the section on national patrimony and economy, uh, where it says that the economy will be uh, run by Filipinos. My question answered it very uh, distinctly. Uh, is there an alignment or is there a need to look at a broader view? Because we may amend certain articles, but it may be inconsistent, uh, which you said it could possibly be. So thank you for giving me clarity, but it also brings me uh, more questions, but I may not have the time now. I would like to have a session with the three of you and perhaps at another time on the second round, ask and persist on that question. But you have validated uh, my, my thoughts that there could be some non-alignment or uh, inconsistency, uh, but that's something to be studied about. Thank you so much, uh, Justice. Chief Justice, please. Yes, uh, I am glad that this matter was taken up <clears throat> because at the end of the day, what would be actually amended would be two sections of Article 2 of the Constitution on state principles and uh, policies. The first uh, would actually refer to education, the state, that's section 17 of article two, the state shall give priority to education, science and technology, arts, culture, sports to foster patriotism and nationalism. I read that earlier. Accelerate social progress and promote total human liberation and development. The second is what uh, Justice uh, Mendoza had said, but it is actually section 19. The state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy effectively controlled by Filipinos. Now, these are the fundamental state policies which are actually uh, uh, supposed to be uh, implemented by way of specific provisions in the succeeding articles. Consequently, the succeeding articles cannot be amended by any guys whatsoever if it would affect the fundamental state policy. Now, if you are going to amend education, uh, public utilities, or advertising, or media on the other parts of the economic provisions, you will in fact be amending section two of the constitution. When you amend section two in the constitution, which relates to state policies, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, fundamental policies. It would mean, therefore, an, not just an amendment, it is a revision of the Constitution. Now, a revision cannot be done by this time. You have to open the entire Constitution. And now, this is what I will say. Any proposal to adopt the parliamentary form, the federal system, mentioned by uh, resource speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Numdum, even in the matter of the economic emancipation proposed by uh, our former secretary, uh, Gary Tevez, will open actually the constitution to revisions, not merely amendments. Are we prepared for a revision? There are again two ways, according to section one of uh, uh, article 17. What shall we do right now? Shall we call for a constitutional convention? We should open the entire constitution, not only what is being desired today, probably adopting a parliamentary form or a federal system. 
You can do that, but it should be by revision. I am not prepared for a revision. As I mentioned earlier, I am against any kind of amendment to the Constitution. When I voted for the draft of the Constitutional Commission of 1986, on the final draft, I said that this is the Constitution I am willing to die for. Why? Because actually, uh, this is uh, probably, this is now the time that I could say it. <laughs> Why I did I say? It is the only constitution in our country and even in the whole world that is pro-God, pro-life, pro-Filipino, pro-people, pro-poor, pro-social justice, pro-human rights, pro-family, pro-marriage, pro-environment, and I will add now, pro-youth, pro-women. Shall we amen? Shall we revise? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice. You have two minutes left, uh, Madam Pro Tem. I have longer questions, but I will yield my two minutes, uh, Mr. Chair, to the others who may ask uh, on the second round or the second hearing. Thank you, esteemed Justices. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Senate President uh, Pro Temp Legarda. Next is Majority Leader uh, Villanueva, and after that, Minority Leader Pimentel, then Senator Chairperson Robin Padilla, then Senator Risa Ontiveros. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, uh, put on the records how uh, grateful and blessed uh, I am as a member of this uh, August Chamber to be here this uh, morning, this afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and listen to the great minds of our uh, justices, economists uh, present here today. I uh, cannot overemphasize, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the overwhelming uh, joy and uh, gladness that I am feeling, that I am here with you sitting in uh, special ringside tickets, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, listening to our idols, our uh, legal luminaries. I just have some few points, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to uh, raise, considering that uh, this representation is the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Rules. And the uh, Senate President made mention about the, uh, the direction that we are about to tread up, uh, after, after a series of hearings probably and uh, when we come up with a uh, committee report. Just to put on record, Mr. Chairman, I'm here to listen and uh, I have yet to uh, make that decision on whether or not uh, I am for or against uh, charter change. And uh, it's, it's, it's such a great privilege to be in that position, to, to have this opportunity to listen to uh, experts. May, may, may I just ask our uh, legal luminaries, uh, Justice uh, Ascona, uh, Justice Davide, Justice Mendoza. Uh, the Senate President made a statement a while ago that after uh, these hearings, series of hearings, the uh, subcommittee, this mother committee would come up with a committee report, and uh, once we have the committee report, can uh, the Senate actually uh, enter its function as a uh, constituent assembly? And uh, with that, we will be, as uh, Senator Baton mentioned, we will be uh, by then wearing our second hat. And uh, as the Senate President made mention a while ago, we can do that in the morning so that it will not interfere with our legislative function as a Senate in the uh, afternoon session. Um, I also wanted to know if uh, based on the records of the Constitutional uh, Commission, what should be the next step so for the Senate to formally assume the uh, function as a member of a constituent assembly and not merely as a uh, legislators. I mean, do we need to uh, to have another joint resolution or will an ordinary resolution uh, suffice, uh, Mr. Chairman, or uh, this RBH uh, number six be sufficient for uh, this purpose? These are questions that time I, I, I would like to uh, seek clarification, uh, humbly uh, submitting to this uh, uh, body uh, and uh, uh, waiting for the uh, uh, answers by our uh, resource persons, Mr. Chair. 
Yes, uh, any, anybody can weigh in uh, from our legal experts since it's a procedural uh, question. Uh, anyone care to answer from, uh, from our three justices? Uh, Justice Ascuna, yes, I see you <laughs> reaching for your mic, sir. of the chair, uh, I respectfully submit that uh, the Senate can act uh, first or independently of the House in proposing amendments, as long as uh, it's very clear that they are acting uh, under Article uh, 14 and not under Article 6. Uh, there's the, the ideal way is to have resolution of both houses worded the same way. That's why it's called resolution of both houses. It should not differ. And it should be approved uh, in the same way, uh, with same wording. That's why a joint hearing is not necessary, but you should co cause together. Uh, perhaps it was better before when there was only one legislative building, when the Senate was upstairs and the House was downstairs, and it was very easy for you to get together. Uh, so now, but uh, with you know, communications like that, you can also get together and informally agree on the joint resolution so that your joint resolution will really be joint. Uh, no need for joint hearing, but the joint resolution should be identical so that uh, there's no conflict if it's approved by three-fourths of the Senate and approved by three-fourths of the House, then uh, you submit it for a plebiscite already. Yan po ang solution. And not necessarily, of course, a joint hearing is uh, ideal where you meet as one body but both separately. That is not prohibited, but to me, it's not required. Uh, the advantage of that is you can hear each other. The congressmen, the representatives can hear the senators, senators can hear the representatives. Uh, but as I said, with uh, modern media, you can hear each other also without having to join, jointly meet. So ganun po, uh, maybe your rules can clarify that. Uh, you don't have rules on how to conduct uh, proceedings to amend or propose the Constitution. As I had uh, recommended earlier, you should uh, amend your quorum. Uh, right now, your rule on quorum is only majority. 12 plus 1. Uh, you should amend it so that if you are considering proposals to change the Constitution, your quorum should be 18 uh, because that's three-fourths. Uh, that way, uh, even if a joint voting is required, you can, uh, you can, uh, you have to require 18 senators to be present in the joint voting. Uh, so, the Constitution says each house can adapt its own rules. Eh? So you are free to adapt your own rules uh, pursuant to the Constitution itself. So you can adapt rules on how to uh, amend the Constitution. I respectfully submit there's no need for a joint hearing as long as you signal that your activity is now under Article 14 rather than Article 6. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Asguna. Did I get it right? You were saying we don't need another resolution other than RBH 6 uh, if we, do, if we uh, conduct ourselves or uh, constitute ourselves as a constituent assembly when we uh, finally deliberate on the uh, committee report. As you made mention a while ago, the, the word be it enacted can also be uh, uh, replaced by the word uh, be it resolved. So that is already a signal uh, to, to, to the other uh, um, uh, house that we have indeed uh, uh, constituted ourselves into a constituent assembly. Is that a correct? Uh... <laughs> uh, my own view right now. Please, huh? Justice. Uh, I do not know if the Senate rules provide for the calling up a joint session. I do not know if the uh, Senate rules also provide for the calling of, of a joint session. Now, if there are none in both, probably uh, the, uh, the speaker and uh, the Senate president may agree to call for a joint session. 
precisely to consider this. Otherwise, you have to go to the other way around, meaning to say you submit it as a single proposal as if in ordinary legislation, with in mind, however, according to the suggestion of uh, Justice Ador, that it is really intended for amendment to the Constitution. I hope, however, that uh, the Senate and the lower house can uh, agree on some uh, amendments to the respective rules, precisely on the matter of calling for a joint session. The Constitution is very clear that uh, you have a joint session for the SONA, for instance, that is a joint session. And, in the, uh, and the provision on um, martial law, the lifting of martial law, you have a provision regarding a joint session. So probably that could be uh, uh, settled. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Justice uh, Davide. In fact, we uh, uh, just exercised this uh, particular uh, rule that uh, we were talking about when we uh, called for a joint session to listen to the uh, uh, keynote speech of uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, Prime Minister uh, Kishida. But, uh, not, but not to vote jointly? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not to vote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I, 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 I just wanted to... Mr. Chairman, <laughs> if I may just uh, say a few words. Please, please. Uh, please. If, uh, if justice is finished, tapos na mo. If okay. Chief Justice Go ahead. David is finished. Go ahead, Justice Mendoza. Yes, yes. I think what should be done here, and this is a precedent. You see right up there the war. The Congress that we had was the Congress of the uh, Commonwealth government, which was a bicameral Congress. If you want a clear example of what they did when they amended the Constitution to grant parity rights to Americans and to corporations owned by Americans, just turn to the pages of Mabanag versus Lopez Beto, because the war destroyed the records. It's there in the concurring opinion of Justice Briones. What did they do? They invited each other to come together. And what did they did? After the invitation of one house was accepted, the two houses met together according to the certification of the secretaries of both houses. They met together in the session hall of the House of Representatives where? In Lepanto. You want to see the clear example of a resolution? It's there. Mabanag versus Lopez Vito, the concurring opinion of Justice Briones. It's not in Spanish, uh, Justice. Because uh, some of his opinions were in Spanish, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> oh, it's not Spanish. Ah, yeah, it's Spanish, but the resolution is quoted. The resolution is quoted. I any majority leader, Hoyan. I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Senator Pia Cayetano, our chairperson of the Blue Ribbon Committee. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, go ahead, majority leader. Gracias, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> another thing that I'd like to... Uh, to uh, and this is my last, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, to, to ask uh, Dr. Sikat, um, Secretary Tevez, and uh, even uh, uh, the Executive Director of uh, Ibon Foundation. I, I was looking at the, uh, the uh, uh, factors deterring uh, foreign investments, no? And uh, Secretary Balisakan uh, noted the uh, NED, the secretary, that uh, said that aside from uh, removing certain restrictions in the Constitution, there's also a need to address uh, issues relating to ease of doing business, high cost of inputs like energy, and the predictability of our policies. In terms of prioritization, uh, perhaps we can also look into this. Ano ba yung, uh, what should come first, no? Removing the restrictions in the Constitution or addressing these other issues? Um, si Senator Aimee made mention uh, a while ago, and, he, and she's been uh, uh, very vocal about it with her uh, dealings with uh, investors, foreign investors, for quite some time, as she has been the chairperson of the Senate Committee on uh, Economic uh, Affairs. Uh, parang hindi ho nabanggit itong, uh, itong uh, pagpapalit o pag-aamienda ng ating uh, konstitusyon. 
Uh, ano ba talaga yung factors that prevent uh, foreign investors from investing more in the Philippines? Uh, you look at uh, BSP for instance, the uh, Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the top three main drivers of foreign direct investment are market size and potential, institutional and regulatory quality, and trade openness. So, gusto lang natin maintindihan gusto no? when it comes to... Uh, Ang sinasabi ng matatanda sa amin sa Bulacan, eh, importante na itatanong yung mga tamang tanong at masiguro na uh, yung mga information na available sa atin ay uh, maintindihan natin gusto bago tayo uh, gumawa ng uh, tamang desisyon. May, may we ask uh, Dr. Asikat to uh, uh, perhaps enlighten us? Your Honors, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Senator. <coughs> the... Uh, there is an interdependence between uh, between the, the uh, restrictions that we have uh, with uh, the ease of doing business. If, if you notice, uh, uh, the uh, for for instance, uh, all the all the restrictions that are listed oftentimes are already indicators of what are not to be undertaken by foreigners. So to some extent, you already get those embedded in the ease of doing business because no one, will, no one in the government would really proceed with undertaking uh, 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 clearances and, unless they have cross-checked many of these items. So one of the one, one of the implications of this, uh, of this statement is that uh, for years and years, the fact that we got to have very complicated ease of do, uh, very complicated rules of approvals in government had, had uh, uh, gotten this from all the regulations we had, which can be traced back to to the restrictions in the Constitution. Now, of course, uh, some of these uh, developments in bureaucracy oftentimes get infected further by the rules and the activities undertaken by management and bureaucracy to see to it that their mandates are also protected. And some mandates of institutions are not necessarily connected with with all these other provisions. So really, uh, the, the, to some extent, we will achieve a lot of easing of the business uh, rules if we had really very simple rules at the top. Now, I, as I said, a great difficulty is that at the top, you have unshakable rules written in stone that cannot be, that cannot be uh, easily uh, changed. Of course, uh, uh, foreign investments, uh, depending on what they do, they have different kinds of, of, uh, of uh, uh, responses to certain uh, incentives provided by the government or by, by institutions. Uh, the main point, of course, is that their, their main concern, I think, is essentially living with the, with the hosts uh, when they are inside, but seeing to it that their borderline, uh, I mean, their, their rules about uh, what they do on, on rates of return and so on should be also respected. When those things get violated, they move out of the system. Thank you, Director Sigat. Uh, siguro, I, 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 I'd pause this question as well to uh, uh, Secretary Teves, who made mention a while ago that uh, with this, and can we just uh, focus on the, the, the amendments uh, based on uh, RB uh, uh, H6? Uh, you made mention, sir, a while ago that after this, if, if it, if it uh, materializes, there is a clear, compelling message to investors that uh, we're open for business. Um, 
um, majority floor, majority leader Villanueva. I hope I can explain it in this manner, uh, Senator. Generally, there are two types of investors. No, one would be the group who would know us already. They're dealing with us, despite all the limitations imposed in our constitution. The other would be group of investors that are not yet familiar, not, they don't know much about the Philippines, but they have excess funds, and they'd like to put it somewhere. So normally, when it comes to, let's say on the left, on my left, let's say these are the potential investors who are not familiar with the Philippines, they would start with conducting what we call a table survey, Sir Senator, so putting, for example, Oh, what's the legal framework in the Philippines compared to Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, etc.? As pointed out earlier by my colleague, if right off the bat they say the legal framework, prohibition against the following activities embodied in the Constitution, and then they see that in other countries these are not there, so the instinct of the potential foreign investors who are not yet familiar with the Philippines is to say, I'd rather than look at more seriously the other countries. So we're losing potentially that group of investors if they realize that up to now we're still putting those restrictions in the Constitution. No? So that's the reason why in our statement, Mr. Senator, we're saying that the removal of this economic restriction it would be necessary, but not a sufficient condition. We still have to work on those areas that you properly mentioned. No? So I thought that maybe that would be really a good starting point, but we have to continuously work on those other uh, things that you mentioned, improving our infrastructure, improving further our public utilities, availability, power, etc. So we are, we would like to be in a similar uh, starting position with the others. We are now at a clear disadvantage in terms of at least the legal framework. So that's the reason why we are, have been advocating for this constitutional change. May I add something which, uh, which as a layman, and maybe I will respect, I will hear my colleagues, but maybe, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Senator, it might be a product of my subconscious, no? Um, we are interested in ensuring that there's consistency among these provisions. We talk about it. As a layman, maybe we can ask, what is, I, can, I could not remember, uh, Chief Justice Davide, what is the fine legal distinction between an amendment and a revision, no? For instance, in our statement, Mr. Senator, we did say that we're proposing also amendments in the Declaration of Principles. For example, we said that instead of the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent national economy effectively controlled by Filipinos and restate this, in my mind, as a layman, is an amendment. Restate it and quote, the state shall develop a self-reliant and independent economy, national economy, removing the words effectively controlled by Filipinos. Would that be an amendment or is that a revision to ensure that there's consistency with our position that we would like the economy to be fully rebel, uh, um, open, liberalized. So that is something that I'm not too sure how to handle it because I'm not a lawyer, but I said my subconscious is working on me as far as that particular position is concerned. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Secretary Deves, and uh, I'm sure it will be tackled here in this uh, committee hearing, but I don't want to uh, 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 spend more time on, 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 on uh, on just this uh, particular issue, and before I I I I I uh, uh, hear the, uh, the the answer of uh, Executive Director Africa, let me just uh, show you something, uh, Your Honors. No, when you talk about uh, liberal ownership uh, rules, 
Uh, sinasabi ho nila, yung uh, foreign direct investment sa entry is influenced by political stability, market size, trade openness, exchange rate rules, skill levels, labor market conditions, and infrastructure. Now, e examples by analogy, uh, Director Africa, no? yung Singapore and Vietnam. These countries do not allow foreign ownership by land. Yet, FDIs, if you look at the slide that I am showing right now, yet FDIs are continuously increasing. Uh, this shows that restrictive foreign ownership will have somehow, if you look at this slide, a very little effect in terms of FDI if there are other incentives to invest in the country. Now, another example is Cambodia. Cambodia, which permits 100% ownership, foreign ownership of companies in uh, most sectors, yet it has lower FDIs compared to other ASEAN countries imposing caps on uh, some, some, some industries, uh, Your Honor. Um, foreign businesses report advantages, uh, uh, report disadvantages vis-a-vis -vis Cambodian or other foreign rivals that engage in acts of corruption or tax evasion or take advantage of Cambodia's uh, poor regulatory enforcement. Last but not the least, uh, Your Honor, no? yung uh, U.S. Department of State also uh, made mention about uh, inputs, ito, very important, and uh, I appreciate what, what uh, Secretary Tevez made mention a while ago, and our chairman made mention that this is not a miracle pill na once we, we go for it, everything changes, no? Kasi itong U.S. Department of State made mention about poor infrastructure, high power costs, slow broadband connections, regulatory inconsistencies, a cumbersome bureaucracy, and corruption remains disincentives to investment in the Philippines as well as inefficiency and uncertainty of the Philippine judicial system. And I just want to, to strike a balance here, uh, Sir, Your Honor, if, if, if you can also uh, give us your views on this uh, particular topic, uh, Director Africa. Um, thank you, Po. Um, I'll speak slower, ha, kasi wala time limit, eh. <laughs> Sige. Uh, I think po... So, na-realize mo na nagmamadali ako dahil inuorasan ako ng chairman namin. <laughs> um, I think po the numbers you showed show how simplistic, simple-minded it is to talk about restrictions and then make 10 million leaps towards development. Eh. Um, I think precisely those are good examples you raised because, um, for instance, there's, a, there's this whining about the flexibil inflexibility of the Constitution, things like that. Pero, for example, um, telecommunications in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Indonesia, it's about, I think it's capped at 49%. Um, some of them, their own transport, their power, they also have similar caps. I mean, it, it's in the, the, the slide we showed. Pero, an point po doon? The point is, um, again, with all due respect, I'm sure investors do the table thing but they're not Bobby investors. Eh. They do have familiarity with the Philippine context. They know how expensive power is. They know how expensive, how, how bad traffic is. They know how bad corruption is. So parang kung hihani lahat ng mga yun, it's too simple-minded to fixate on the foreign equity restrictions. Lalo at lalo na, and I do have to stress, whether it's by law or in the consti, secondary na, it's there eh. Kung baga, <laughs> may pagka-path dependence tayo, the question isn't no longer we want the flexibility in the abstract, but if that restriction is there, whether it's in law or in the constitution, if it's useful, let's keep it there. And I think a lot of the problems with, with discussion about yung cha cha, again, with due respect, parang you want a message, you're, you're open for business. Kailangan na sa ligang batas for that? It's just like, it's so absurd, eh? And I think um, if the whole point is to develop the country, these restrictions were not problematic for the last great industrializer, South Korea and Taiwan in the 70s and 80s. They're not problematic for, okay, walang restrictions in a lot of sectors in China, but they have such huge regulatory administrative um, in licensing interventions. So parang to reduce everything to the equity restrictions, it, 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 it's, it's a bit too much. Eh. So the bigger question is, sabi nyo nga, um, why would the foreign investor come here? Kasi kikita sila because malaki yung domestic market. Because they can sell to the Singaporean market, they can sell to the Malaysian market, the Thai market. Paano benta na sa Pilipinas if because of the inequities sa distribution ng wealth, you have 70% according to the Banco Central, over 7 out of 10 families walang ipon. 
di ba? According to SWS, over 8 out of 10 families either poor or nasa borderline sila. So parang, anong pagkakitaan ng negosyante selling to the Philippines? In the same way, productivity. How can you be productive kung ang baba ng educational system mo, ang baba ng standards ng quote-unquote human capital, ang baba ng productivity nila, ang mahal ng kuryente, grabe yung corruption. May nakuusap ako quite recently, natawa nga ako eh. It was a Korean lamenting about yung problem ng corruption in Korea. At he picked this up from, I forgot what, some textbook I read before. Sabi, it holds today. The problem with Korean corruption, with Philippine corruption compared to Korean corruption, sa Philippine corruption, yung mga corrupt na officials, pataasan ng bayad. So yung investor, hahanapin yung pinaksigurado na makukuha nila. Sa so, Korea daw, standardized yung bayad. So kumbaga, for them, yung predictability ng corruption, that's actually what they needed. Ayaw nila ipapasok sila, magbabayad, tapos six months later, oh my God, ang daming sisingilin. So again, so ang, ang daming permutation. Yeah. I know, Director is, Africa, can yeah. I just uh, stop you there? No? And... Uh, I, I, I get what you're uh, 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 what you're pointing out, what you're emphasizing, and it is good that we can uh, listen to all uh, parties involved and uh, stakeholders, most especially uh, the, the 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 rational of what we wanted to to look into right now is also what we're getting from Director Sikat a while ago. That if there's something wrong, and I think. Uh, Wala naman hong perfecto na konstitusyon. Wala rin perfectong batas. At uh, kung merong kailangan baguhin, ano ba talaga yung paraan? At uh, meron ba talagang kapangyarihan ang uh, kongreso na baguhin ito? No? And uh, another thing that uh, crosses my mind while, while, while you were uh, talking, uh, Director uh, Africa, is the idea na binuksan natin pero hindi natin mapalipad ng husto yung ibon parang nilagay natin sa haula at uh, hindi makalipad ng mas mataas kung kaya niyang lumipad ng mas mataas but let me give you another example no uh, when we pass the uh, public services act in 2022 we also pass foreign investments act uh, at saka yung retail trade liberalization act no and uh, by joining uh, RCEP in 2023 uh, kayo ho kanina ang dami kong nakikitang mga uh, mga mga uh, numbers, figures, and graphs. Mahilig tayo sa ganyan, eh, you know? And uh, I just wanted to find out based on your monitoring and assessment, since their enforcement, no? Ano ba yung respective impacts nito, nito mga foreign uh, direct investments? Because if you look at the foreign direct in, foreign investments approved on uh, on uh, second quarter of 2022, if we can show the uh, the, the slide, it, it was recorded at 59.09 billion pesos, uh, Your Honor. 59.09 billion pesos, an increase of 27.8% from 46.26 billion pesos total foreign investments in the same quarter of 2022. So again, the question is, uh, looks like it's working, the, the, the laws that we pass, but will it... Uh, uh, go higher? Will it increase further if we uh, liberalize it all the more and uh, open up more investments, uh, Your Honor? Um, sir, I, I do want to stress, may ano eh, yung, yung tinatawag na fallacy of composition, um, very appealing kasi na, of course, of course, when an investor comes to the Philippines, of course, they're going to hire workers. Of course, there's going to be economic activity. Of course, there's going to be that marginal contribution to growth and everything. Pero para sa amin, fallacious to think na yung pakinabang in a firm is yung pakinabang ng ekonomiya. At bakit ganon po? Kasi yung problema dun sa ganong klaseng pag-iisip na yung pagpasok ay automatically, pag-unlad na natin yon. nakakalimutan kung pumasok sila pero walang long-term contribution na pag-unlad natin, pag alis nila, walang may iwan sa atin. So sa amin, isang magandang example talaga yung Intel. Eh. Yung Intel came here, their second overseas plant was in the, in, I think not Cavite, Makati, bago yung lipat sa Cavite, in 1973. Um, over 35 years, nandito sila until 2009, they invested over one and a half billion dollars um, they hired about 2,000 workers. They were exporting at some point, I think, 400, 500 million dollars a year. 
Magandang headlines. Tuwan-tuwa yung mga tao every time they report yung expansion trabaho. Pero in 2009, I don't know why, they left, part of the plant went to Vietnam, part went to Malaysia. They shut down dito. Ano ni iwan sa Pilipinas? I think yun, noong time din, 2009, bumayal yung CDR King sa atin eh. And I'm not being facetious. Yun ang problema. They were here for so long, yung metrics natin for the success was yung investment, yung jobs, may technology transfer, wala eh. Kasi pekin technology transfer nangyari. Because they were here, we were coming out with press releases, Philippines, one of the biggest exporters ng semiconductors sa world. Hindi naman tayo yun eh. It's an American firm based, based here. And when they left, walang iniwan sa atin. And there's a logic. Walang iiwan sa atin kasi, if you're Intel, tuturuan ba yung Pilipino to produce another semiconductor? Kakompetensya mo yun. Kakompetensya mo for the productive labor for us, kakompetensya for the raw materials, eventually kakompetensya for, for markets. So sa amin, ang point lang doon, huwag natin ipagpalagay na just because it's foreign investment here, making its money, and in the short term, hiring jobs, contributing to GDP, hindi yun yung long-term develop na kinakailangan natin. And if you talk about whether this Intel or Hanjin, yung nga even naman ng pie right now, yun yung nawawala sa atin eh. Kaya nabanggit kayo na about yung control by Filipinos. We have to learn. We have to learn to produce. We have to have the technology. And that technology transfer, pinagkakait sa atin yan ng mga foreign investors. I've talked to so many workers. May mga ano sila, may mga waivers dyan na once they, they leave uh, um, an electronics firm sa, sa, sa Laguna, halimbawa, for 25 years, yung natutulong nila, hindi na pwede gamitin. So ang um, point lang doon, we have nothing in principle against foreign investment. May pakinabang dyan. The technology's there, the capital's there, the markets, the connections. Pero kung di gagawin yung gobyerno to make sure may magpiga tayo, rush na lang foreign investor eh. They'll want to make their profits while they're here. They want to leave as little as possible para walang kakupidensya. And then when it's convenient for them, aalis sila. So sa amin, um, we're not advocating in any way na magsara. Ang point lang namin, matuto tayo sa leksyon ng the last great industrializers, South Korea and Taiwan, mula, mag, mula mag globalization at everyone's in the race to the bottom to attract foreign investment. Wala na nag-industrialize since then. Ikalawa, matuto rin tayo from what industrial powers right now are doing. The reason the U.S. is spending, I think, half a billion dollars on its semiconductor renewable industry, the reason may trade wars sa China, ito nga industrial power na siya, feeling niya kailangan niya makailang para protectan ng Amerikanong industriya. Paano pa kaya tayo na walang Pilipino industry or, or napakaliit? So again, quick example lang, even sa Jeep no modernization, Oo nga, hindi manufacturers yung mga local firms, they're assemblers. Pero ano mas okay? May assembly na may dagdag ng trabaho dito, or we import ng buong buo, most of the trabaho is dun sa Chinese firm, Japanese firm, Korean firm, American firm. So sa amin, hakbang-hakbang talaga yan, pero kung wala yung orientation, kung wala yung vision na pagpalakas ng lokal na industriya, binibigyan natin lahat sa dayuhan. At yun nga, doon nawawala yung control natin sa ating ekonomiya, sa ating rekurso, sa ating lakas paggawa. Thank you. Thank you, Director Africa. I know I, do, I, I have no more time, uh, Your Honor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to uh, ask questions. Uh, let me just end by saying uh, I thank God that uh, we are all here today. Uh, I can see the chairperson of uh, the EDCOM 2 Commission. The commissioners are here, Commissioner Pia Cayetano, Commissioner Sani Angara. And uh, it is really important that uh, whatever, yeah, I already mentioned the chair. No? And uh, what, what, whatever we do, and uh, let me, let me uh, stress that the, in the uh, passage of Public Services Act, Foreign Investments Act, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, this representation would keep on uh, 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 emphasize and uh, pound on the idea of a working technology transfer. Uh, not because I am a former uh, test the chief, but I think it's very important. And that's why uh, in, even in the uh, idea of liberalizing our uh, education sector, I, I, I would love to see not only in the higher education, but also in the uh, uh, technical vocational education para, para talagang maging world class yung ating mga tinitrain na uh, workers. Maraming salamat, Mr. Chairman, for uh, giving me extension. Uh, I think uh, some of our colleagues would like to uh, uh, ask questions na kaya. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for the very pertinent and uh, practical questions, uh, Majority Leader. Now we turn it over to our committee chair, Senator Robin Padilla, idol. Maraming salamat po. Uh, ikaw po ang idol ko. <laughs> uh, Chairman, gusto ko lamang pong ibigay yung oras ko kay uh, Sir Orion Perez, sir, Dumdum. Uh, the Senator's time is only 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Dumdum. I'll be fast. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. 
Okay. Uh, so, dun po sa sinabi kanina nung uh, mabuting senadora galing sa um, Ilocos Norte, yung tungkol sa yung mga locators, mga kumpanya na natanong po niya, sinabi po niya na wala sa kanila ang nagsasabi na may uh, isa dun sa mga issues daw nila ay yung mga restrictions. Ngayon, sasabihin ko po, ang problema po dito ay yung tinatawag nating survivorship bias. Kasi po yung mga natanong po niya ay yung mga nakapasok na sa Pilipinas. Yung mga na, natagal, nakatagal na sa Pilipinas. So hin, never naging issue nila yung restrictions dahil pasok sila. Pero yung dapat tinatanong po natin ay yung mga naandun lamang sa Singapore o sa Hong Kong na tumingin sa Pilipinas pero di na pumasok. Dahil siguro ay nati, nakita nila yung saligang batas natin na napakaraming mga restriction at dun sila nawala ng gana. So yun po yung kinakailangan natin gawin. Huwag po tayong nagtatanong lamang sa mga sino yung nandito sa Pilipinas na mga kumpanya. Kundi sino yung mga maraming 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 kumpanya na gustong gusto talagang mag-hire ng mga Pilipino. Sa, ako po, dahil doon ako sa Singapore, marami po mga um, headquarters po doon. At lagi kong nakakausap yung, na, yung mga matataas na rango. Dahil meron po akong sideline dati, nag-host nag ako ng mga events, nag-stand-up nag comedy ako paminsan sa mga corporate events. Nakakausap ko po yung mga matataas na rango doon. At talagang bilib sila sa mga Pilipino. Sobrang bilib nila sa, sa, sa atin. Pero ang problema, kahit gustong-gusto nilang mag-hire ng Pilipino, nahihirapan silang pumasok sa Pilipinas dahil nga dun sa mga restrictions natin. At paminsan, ang, ang problema ng mga restrictions natin ay hindi mismong actual na issue. Ito yung mga tinatawag natin impression. Parang natatakot sila na dahil dun sa, sa Article 12, Section 10, parang natatakot sila na, okay, pasok kami ngayon, yung industriya, yung sektor namin, pasok ngayon, eh baka next year magkaroon ng bagong amendment sa foreign investment re, uh, restricted list at biglang mapasok yung kumpanya namin dun sa listahan niyan at paano na kami? Parang ganun yung yung pangangamba. issue ng policy stability is what yun, you're adverting. Yun po. Yun po. Your, your Honor, Mr. Doon. Chairman, if I may just uh, have very quickly, tapos, very quickly. Yes, yes, of course, Majority uh, no, I, I wanted, I'm very interested on what uh, uh, Mr. Dumdum is uh, talking about. What, do you have any like uh, 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 ballpark figure or something kasi tama ho ito eh, magandang mapag-usapan natin yung hindi pa nakakapasok dito, no? Kasi mahirap talagang uh, uh, i-anticipate yan and uh, I'm sure in, in your uh, field nakikita nyo po yan ilan yung, yung mga ganyan yung situation looking at our uh, uh, country as a, uh, 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 a country of uh, Uh, where they can put in a lot of money and invest and uh, hire and uh, uh, create more jobs in, in, in the country. No? Mer meron ba tayong mga pag-aaral po dyan, just to give us... Well, you know? uh, ako mismo wala akong pag-aaral dun. I, I would say uh, Dr. Sikat might, might probably have those. But ang masasabi ko, ito ang masasabi ko, no? magtanong po kayo doon sa mga kumpanya, mga, mga galing sa Western countries, no? so mga European, Uh, European, Australian, British, Canadian, American companies na pumasok sa Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam. Halos lahat ng mga yan, unang tiningnan ang Pilipinas bilang opsyon. Una nilang nakita ang Pilipinas dahil magagaling po tayo mag-ingles eh. Magagaling po ang maraming mga inhinyero natin eh. Pero doon po sila natatamaan nung mga restrictions natin. At paminsan hindi po actual, as I said, Ito yung tinatawag natin na nangangamba sila na baka naman next year eh, masama na yung, yung particular na sector namin. No? So yun yung, yun yung parang thread, ano yung tawag dyan, uh, sword of Damocles hanging over companies na pumasok sa Pilipinas pag nakikita nila yung uh, section 10 ng article 12. Yun po yung isang problema. Uh, isa pa, sasabihin ko lang din, yung lagi natin siyempre paulit-ulit pinag-uusapan yung high cost of electricity and power sa Pilipinas. Pero meron po akong naging talakayan kasama na isa kong kaibigan, kasa, kaibigan po rin namin ni Senator uh, Robin Padilla, si um, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Emmanuel um, Noli, ay sorry, hindi si Noli, yung, ta, ta, yun yung tatay, si Doy, Doy Santos, no? yung kaibigan po namin, na isang ekonomista at uh, pinag Pinag-usapan niya na yung, kasi na, na po siya sa Australia, Australia nakatira. At sabi niya, ang problema po dun sa um, power, yung power distribution problems ng Pilipinas, ay ang kanyang pinakaugat na issue ay yung 60-40 din ng ating, ng ating saligang batas. No? Natatakot pumasok ang mga power distribution companies doon sa, sa lugar na yan. 
So, yung po, um, kumbaga lagi natin sinasabi, electricity daw, pero saan po yung, yung talagang ugat noon? Bakit hindi, hindi ganun kaganda yung ating uh, uh, gen power generation industry? Ano to? Ito yung tinatawag natin high, high capitalization requirements po meron dyan eh. Usually, and high technology requirements. Maraming mga foreign companies po ang may kaalaman dyan, pero hindi sila makakapasok dahil takot sila sa ating mga restrictions na ganyan. I also wanted to mention, ito pong, yung mga constitutional restrictions, paminsan po, ay nawe-weaponize. Nawe-weaponize laban sa ilang mga kumpanya. I will give the example of FedEx. Yung FedEx po, ay isang courier company. Nagpapadala ng mga sulat, ng mga packages, di ba? pakete, ganyan. Ang nangyari sa kanila ay may isang local na kumpanya na nagsampal ng kaso at sinabing sila raw ay isang utility, public utility raw. At dahil doon ay sinasabing unconstitutional daw ang pagiging 100% or majority American-owned ng, uh, ng FedEx. At napunta po ito sa uh, Court of Appeals, no? At sinabing ano daw sila, uh, labag daw sila sa ating saligang batas. Muntik na po yung nangyari doon sa angkas. Ang angkas, yung sa mga motor, no? Ang angkas daw ay sinasabi rin ng ilang mga kalaban ng, ng angkas na ano daw sila, public utility raw sila. Pero, tapos inano daw, unconstitutional nga daw. Dapat 60-40, eh bakit, uh, ano yan, Singapore yung may-ari, si Angeline Tam. Buti na lang si Angeline Tam ang kanyang... Asawa ay Pilipino na si George Royeka at inayos po nila yung mga papeles nila para maging majority owner si George Royeka. Secondly, sasabihin ko, ang katotohanan sa tungkol sa angkas ay hindi naman sila public utility. IT company po sila. Gumagawa po sila ng phone mobile app para makapag-connect ang mga gustong sumakay at sa mga driver ng mga motorsiklo. Hindi po sila... Hindi po sila transport operator, hindi po sila may-ari ng mga motor, hindi po sila em emple uh, employer nung mga nag nag uh, nagda-drive ng mga motor. So, mali po 'yun. IT company po talaga sila, nagko-connect lang po sila ng drive ng ride hailer at ng mga drivers. 'Yun lang po. Pero ang ginawa, kinontrahan sila using the constitutional restrictions. So ito po yung sinasabi nating problema na laging nawe-weaponize at laging nagiging publicized ito sa international business community. Yung nangyari sa FedEx, pinagtatawanan po tayo dahil sa nangyari dyan. Yung angkas, muntik na pong nangyari yun. So yung po, kaya, kaya nga sinasabi ko po, mas maganda po na tanggalin na lang po natin sa ating saligang batas itong mga restrictions na ito. At kung kailangan natin ng mga regulation at mga restrictions, doon na lang po natin nilagay sa statutory sa statutory legislation. Maraming maraming Mr. salamat Mr. President, po. Mr. Thank Chairman. Uh, yes, Senator Pia. Could I ask him if, if it's still within the time that uh, Senator Robin allocated to the resource persons, can I ask follow-up questions? Uh, if it's within the time. Well, I've been strict with members uh, who tried ah, okay. to ask questions, so I just just to let okay. you know, before you arrived, uh, some of our members no, no, wanted I, to ask I questions. I was listening to your, your rules, yeah. so no problem. So, I just thought, uh, We apologize uh, for I that. I just want to be consistent uh, in the application, as uh, much no as I want to no uh, indulge you, Your Honor. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, next to ask questions is the, the Minority Leader, uh, Senator Risa. Uh, Deputy Minority Leader. <laughs> Salamat, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, bago yung mga hinanda akong tanong, I really would like to follow up yung uh, usapin ng prejudicial question, uh, which I believe um, uh, actually a couple already of our resource persons raised, beginning po with uh, Justice Mendoza. Uh, so my, my staff looked at the records of the deliberations of the Constitutional Commission. At kung pwede, Mr. Chair, I'd like to read one paragraph where it says, uh, Mr. Regalado, uh, I also noticed that both sections 1 and 2 are premised on the anticipation that the Commission, not only the committee, will opt for a unicameral body. In the event that a bicameral legislative body will carry the day, has the committee prepared contingency proposals or resolutions. Uh, sumagot si Mr. Suarez, yes, in that situation, we would propose to include the words in joint session assembled. And then the uh, nag-follow-up question si Mr. Regalado, but still maintaining the same number of votes? Mr. Suarez, the commissioner is right. Mr. Regalado, thank you. So, 
Uh, at tingin ko po, Mr. Chair, uh, relevant po ito, pertinent dun sa prejudicial question na kung anong rules uh, ang dapat i-apply. The word assembled kasi po suggests a physical assemblage as proposed earlier by Justice Mendoza. So parang ang intent po nga ay may pagkikita pero magbobotohan ng hiwalay dahil nga may same number of votes. Uh, maybe our framers, those physically present, and uh, if uh, Chris Monsod is still online, maybe our framers could shed light on this. At kasi kaya nga po ako nagmungkahi uh, ng suspension kanina para po magkaroon ng clarity yung ating proceedings. So just to add a little more clarity at this point in time, uh, could our framers of the Constitution shed light on this issue, Mr. Chair? Would uh, Justice Mendoza or Chief Justice Davide like to address this first? Justice Mendoza? Yes, that's what they, uh, they really decided in the Constitutional Commission. And it was only by reason of oversight that uh, the corresponding uh, praise was not placed there. But the other provisions of the constitutions were amended. Oversight lamang, oversight. So by oversight justice, ang hindi po na ilagay ay yung uh, in joint session assembled. Tama in joint po? session assembled. Pero yun po sana yung intent ng framers, at least uh, based on the records of the uh, deliberations. Yes. Yes, because so, we speak only of separate voting if they're in joint session. Kasi kung if they're not in joint session, no sense in saying uh, voting separately kasi talagang magkahiwalay. But precisely because the intention is to compel the two houses to come together and assemble so that the enacting clause will say, be it enacted by the Senate and the House in joint session assembled by the vote of three parts uh, voting separately. Hereby propose. Maraming salamat po. So malinaw, assembled, pero klarong-klaro at consistent voting separately. Yes, because this is just one house. What is required is for the two houses. Sabi ko nga, I don't, I don't uh, believe you were here, Senator, when I said it, Kung gusto ninyo makita kung anong ginawa when after the war, right after the war, we had a Congress with two houses. When the problem of parity rights came up and that required constitutional amendment, the two houses met together at nakalagay doon sa certification of the secretaries that the two houses met together where in Lepanto, San Paolo, where Congress was holding sessions. So that illustrates the uh, application of uh, that provision. Thank you. Salamat po. Opo, wala pa po ako doon. Pero yung mga magulang ko buhay na po noon. Would uh, either CJ Davide or Justice Ascuna like to add to this? Or uh, Chris Monsod? I stick to my original position also that there are two ways for Congress to propose amendments. One, in joint session, voting separately, or in ordinary legislation with one body proposing a, uh, a proposal for amendment to a constitution and approving the same by three-fourths votes. And then that should be submitted to the lower house or to the upper house, as the case may be, voting also by three-fourths vote. And then plebiscite already. Permission, uh, Senator Reese. Yes, I just want course, to acknowledge uh, Senator just, Villar's uh, presence. Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, if I can just uh, say a few more words yes, Mr. to Chair. amplify what I said. Uh, okay, go ahead, sir. <laughs> Beyond this debate about uh, construing the silence of the Constitution, there is some benefit if the two houses come together. 
they can exchange views regardless of their status as senators or congressmen. The Constitution contemplates they are not senators or congressmen. They are members of a constituent assembly. Isang body lamang. So, the benefit of uh, exchange is there, which you cannot have if you leave this policy making to Congress by law. Because one house will be acting here, the other house will be acting over in Quezon City, you will not have the benefit of exchange of views. Salamat po, Justice. And CJ, dun sa second instance na sinabi nyo, the second way that Congress could amend the Constitution, as if through ordinary legislation, and even if, as you propose, by three-fourths vote, still consistently voting separately, obviously, sa second way na yon. I agree, Senator. Because you represent two different interests. The national interest is represented by the Senate. The local interest is represented by the House. That's the essence of bicameralism. Salamat po, With your Justice. permission, yes, uh, Senator Lisa, it's, it's on this point very specific. Justice Mendoza, what if the House and the Senate had a Zoom meeting? Would that fall within the contemplation of the Constitution? Because we had Zoom meetings and Zoom bicameral meetings during the pandemic. So that's not provided in the Constitution, but neither is it prohibited. So I'm wondering, uh, would that fall within your contemplation of a joint session? Or you need to be physically present in the same room? Yes, uh, Mr. Well, probably <laughs> you can find some reason for not meeting together. But as long as you do not discriminate between Senate and House of Representatives. But if you meet in one place, senators and congressmen, and then in another place, senators and congressmen, I think you can see there that there is an effort at bicameralism, excuse only by pandemic. Okay, thank you, Justice. Thank you, Senator for the interject. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're very kind, po, Justice, yung, that we have, we'll find some reason not to meet together. Hindi na po ako magko-comment doon. Justice Ascuna, would you like to add anything to this question uh, before I ask uh, Chris Monsod? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, and Mad Madam Senator, I believe that the, although the records would show that uh, Sensing Suarez said they would, in the event bicameralism was uh, adopted, they would accordingly change article, what is now Article 14, to reflect uh, voting together but voting separately. The fact is he did not. He did not change it there. It's leaving uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an ambiguity to the manner in which uh, Congress will uh, achieve the three-fourths vote. So ultimately, it will have to be the Supreme Court that will decide what is the manner in which this three-fourths vote by Congress will be achieved. So it is good, I believe, that uh, the Senate uh, now is going through the process of adopting a proposed amendment by way of a resolution uh, of the Senate and the House voting separately and meeting separately and submit that later to the Supreme Court uh, to be decided whether that is a proper uh, manner of uh, proposing amendments to the Constitution. Ultimately, we have to have this resolved by the Supreme Court. I think uh, Justice Suarez, in leaving the ambiguity uh, without changing the wording, uh, wanted it to be determined by the Supreme Court, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, Madam President, Senator. Salamat po, Justice Ascuna, which is precisely why, Mr. Chair, I hope that we can clarify this um, uh, one way or, or another. Hopefully the simpler and the shorter time uh, duration way. Uh, in any case po, um, to my first question, um, May mga assurances po that these discussions only concern the economic provisions specified in RBH 6. At uh, nagbanggit din po si na CJ Davide at uh, Justice Mendoza tungkol dito. But a constituent assembly throws the whole 
1987 Constitution wide open for review or amend uh, uh, and possible distortion even, and no provision is actually safe. Tama po ba yon? Anybody can answer, yes. uh, Your Honours. Yes. I mentioned earlier, you know, touching on the economic provisions would in effect also affect the declaration of policies and state principles, state principles and policies. The moment that it will change any particular principle or policy, it would be a revision. Because uh, the provision now on the article on uh, national patrimony, for instance, or on the general provisions or on education are only implementative of the declaration of principles and state policies. The moment you change it, you have to automatically change also the fundamental uh, principles or state policies. At bukod po dun sa, in effect, amending or revising a basic principle or state policy, uh, kahit may assurances or agreements pa, no, prior to limit the scope of the discussions, wala namang magpipigil sa kahit sinong miyembro ng Kongreso to propose other changes. Halimbawa, legislators could initiate changes in our basic laws on foreign ownership even of land, uh, on term limits, on the frequency of elections, on limitations on the use of governmental power, even the fundamental rights of citizens. Tama po ba ito? CJ, pakibuksan yung mic. Those matters are to be taken up, really. It is more than an amendment. It, in effect, would be revisions of fundamental principles. For instance, in the matter of uh, uh, the plebiscit on uh, the proposal in the PI regarding uh, a change in the manner of uh, voting, it should be joined, and uh, therefore, in effect, it would eliminate uh, the Senate. In this, it would eliminate the Senate because you have the massive majority of the lower house. So the moment you approve what is in the PI, it will open the floodgates of everything. Eventually, all changes will be done without already the voice of the Senate. Which is why, po, uh, CJ, Mr. Chair, the Senate opposes and continues to oppose the People's Initiative. Pero gusto, meron din po akong agam-agam at gusto ko pa rin itanong yung possible scenario, kahit sa pamamagitan nitong RBH6, as uh, an initial doorway na dadaanan. That couldn't it lead to that scenario in a constituent assembly, in Congress uh, jointly assembled, that any... Uh, representative or even senator could then, once the door has been opened to amendment or lalo na revision ng isang basic principle pa, fundamental policy, na pwedeng kahit sino sa amin, in effect, mag-propose ng amendment or revision to any and all parts of the Constitution. Very clear under Section 1 of uh, Article 17 that there are two ways of revising the Constitution, amendment or revision, may be done by Congress or by a constitutional convention. The third proposal, however, can be done by the People's Initiative. We are talking here of uh, amendment by Congress itself, and therefore it should be a constitutional assembly acting as a con, uh, con us, no? But considering that the Constitution is not very, very clear about it, mentions only joint, we have the proposal of uh, 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 Father Bernas, one of the commissioners. Now, it could be done in either of the two ways we have taken up much earlier. Either by way of ordinary legislation with the two bodies voting separately and in a separate session. Or in a joint session, voting separately. Hindi po ba parang nagbubukas kami ng Pandora's box at hindi natin alam anong lalabas dito from the depths of that Pandora's box once <laughs> the process is initiated. Mr. Chair Justice Ascuna. Mr. Chair, uh, it cannot go outside of the resolution because of the requirement that a proposed bill or resolution shall have only one subject. If uh, they will add a, to the resolution of both houses, number six, for instance, they will amend it to include a political subject. That will be in violation of the rule that the, a proposal shall have only one subject. So if they want to bring in uh, extraneous matters, it should be another resolution. 
and the Senate will not agree to it, so it won't be a joint resolution. So this joint resolution is limited only to economic provisions. In fact, you can put that in the title, a resolution to amend and uh, economic provisions and for no other purpose, something like that. Uh, then, uh, in other words, limited to the rule of one resolution, one subject matter. Thank you, Justice Ascuna. I'm glad to have that on record as we continue to deliberate uh, this resolution of both houses. Dun naman po sa Senate hearings on the Fraudulent People's Initiative, it was clear as day how many members, um, unfortunately, of the House were willing and able to use the influence and the resources also of government to advance uh, certain uh, interests. Nung mga, even in those early days, tila buong makinarya ng gobyerno ang nagamit para lokohin yung mga Pilipino para sa makasariling layunin. At sa ganitong klima, and again, I'm, I'm uh, proceeding on the premise that of a Pandora's box, not something that can 100% uh, be limited uh, with all due respect by that um, one bill or one resolution, one subject rule. So ano po yung assurance natin na hindi lang ililipat yung ganyang klaseng makinarya para isulong whatever comes out of uh, RBH6? Would anyone want to venture? Justice um, Mendoza, Mr. Chair. I think that that attempt uh, by people's initiative to amend the Constitution when acting as a constituent assembly is the clearest admission on the part of those proposing it that unless you provide, you change the Constitution, the requirement should really be joint session, voting separately. Kaya nga ho, gusto nilang baguhin do sa People's Initiative itong procedure na ito. That is the clearest proof of what I'm saying is the meaning of uh, constituent assembly, meaning joint session, voting separately. And the best illustration of that, as I said, application is when Congress met after the war, it was a bicameral Congress that we had. And they were passing a very important proposed amendment, parity, parity. Parity, economic provisions. And what they did, they met together according to this certification of the secretaries. They met together in the session hall of the House of Representatives. And where is that? In Sampaloc, Lepanto, Sampaloc. That's where Congress was meeting at that time. That to me is uh, the clearest example. And that is to be found in the opinion of Justice Briones in the case of Mabanag versus Lopez Vito, 78 Philippines, page one, page 77 in particular. Salamat po, uh, Justice Mendoza. I'd just like to go into at least my first question, Mr. Chair, uh, on the legitimacy of the need to amend the economic provisions. Na yun yung heart and soul nitong RBH number six. Um, nung Disyembre, nung nakaraang taon lamang, so just two months ago, binibida ni Presidente yung mga nakalap niyang investment pledges sa napakarami niyang biyaheng international sa China, sa Switzerland, Japan, Estados Unidos, UK, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, at uh, Saudi Arabia. Ayon sa kanila, nasa 2.84 2.484 trillion pesos ang nakalap na pangakong foreign investments. At sa lahat nito, as in sa bawat isa nito, wala namang condition na kailangang baguhin natin ang kaluluwa ng bayan, ang saligang batas. So on the heels of that success, di umano, Eh bakit biglang ngayon ay sasabihin kailangan natin 
uh, yung charter change. Maybe, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chai, if I could ask Mr. Africa. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, if he could comment uh, uh, on this. Um, Sunny, go ahead, please. Mr. President, I was talking to the resource ah, person because he's my neighbor. Did not hear the I, question. Maybe. I will apologize for it's him all right, Madam because Chair. I was the taking his time and he may not Senator have heard Lisa. the question. Yes, yes. Uh, hold your horses, uh, Mr. Dumdum. You'll have your chance. Huh? Yes. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Africa, yeah. it's all right, uh, good gentlewoman. Yung tanong ko lamang po, eh, bakit biglang ngayon sasabihin kailangan yung charter change in relation to FDI? Eh, binibida ni Presidente pagkatapos ng maraming state visits nila last year, first one and a half years, just last December, sinasabi nila more than 2 trillion pesos ang pledges na FDI without the shadow of kailangan may charter change dyan sa bawat isang iyon, Mr. Chair. Actually, uh, feeling ko po, I apologize po for the ano, um, that might be a rhetorical question kasi, uh, well, Uda Uda, media and advertising aren't, media, sorry, in education, advertising education aren't really very big areas for foreign investment. So, kung magkaka-argument na, oh no, there would have been more sana, I doubt, actually, there'd be, there would have been much more. But I think, precisely, I do agree, if those were pledges were there, and we assume that they're real, they didn't need um, the, the, the charter change much more they didn't need this specific charter change right now or changing the other provisions so um I, I think it affirms your point but sorry yeah salamat po uh mr africa and then maybe lastly mr chair if i may have one uh, more question uh, well just to let you know it's your call if you want to hear from him mr dumdum is raising his hand uh, i need to ask a follow-up question to mr africa uh, mr chair yeah. Head, go ahead. we'll thank hold your horses mr Dundum. Yeah. thank you uh, mr chair in like manner uh, uh, mr africa uh, kanina uh, foreign pledges without any quid pro quo on charter change kahit sa binuong philippine development plan uh, re referred to by um christian monsod earlier 2023 to 2028 na pinamunuan ng NEDA at si Presidente ang chair nun. So nilatag yung kabuoang plano para sa ekonomiya ng Pilipinas, para paramihin ang trabaho, puksain ang kahirapan, pataasin ang kalidad ng buhay uh, nating mga Pilipino. Eh, nagawa na po ba natin? Uh, yung, uh, I mean, is it going well, yung implementasyon ng buong PDP na yan? At saka, do you know, sa 450 pages ng PDP na yan, meron po bang kahit isang pagbanggit na kailangan baguhin yung constitution in order to implement the plan? I, I don't recall po seeing anything dun sa PDP. Pero siguro ang pinakamahalagang punto po dyan, is the PDP doing well? Um, sa amin, mahalaga for the record, despite yung pinagmalaking mabilis economic growth last year, actually between November 2022 and November 2023, nabawasan ng 70,000 jobs. Um, and the biggest reason na sinasabing lumiit yung unemployment rate to 3.9%, it's because maraming discouraged workers, maraming hindi nagapang trabaho, walang trabaho pero hindi binibilang as unemployed. Um, so, I, pero siguro, ang key point po, I think even our economic managers, in their heart of hearts, uh, absent any political influence, they know there is so much more that needs to be done and that can't be done and isn't being done right now na hindi kailangan ng charter change. I mean, it, na, 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 nandinig ko po yung isang um, statement about <laughs> anong pwede gawin para tulungan yung yung mga mayan na walang charter change. Actually, ayun yun. And I think, I, I do agree, gano'n kasimple lang yun. Um, kung, kung may gusto gawin, ang dahing pwede gawin ngayon, kung papasok pa sa usapin ng charter change, makadistract lang siya, makakagulo lang po siya. Salamat, Mr. Africa. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I move on to another question? I still have time. Salamat po. Uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Two minutes, so maybe just two questions for, for today. Salamat po. Um, kasi nga yung isang focus ng RBH6, uh, public utility. So, uh, talking about, the, for example, the telecommunication sector. So, nervous system siya ng modernong ekonomiya. Kailan lang, binuksan ng Kongreso sa pamamagitan ng amyanda sa Public Service Act. Doon po, sinasabi ng NEDA na yung problema ay yung duopoly. Di umanong duopoly ng Globe at PLDT Smart at kahinaan ng NTC bilang regulator. So, Hindi magamit ng ibang kumpanya ang towers nitong dalawang higante. Mahal mag-text at tumawag sa mga subscribers ng bagong kumpanya uh, sa Globe at PLDT. Hindi makuha ng NTC yung frequencies na hindi naman ginagamit nitong dalawa para magamit sana ng mga bagong kumpanya. At saka kahit 
maliliit na cable companies na pwede sanang gawing mura ang internet, ay kailangan pang kumuha ng prangkisa. Well, sa ating kongreso. So, sinasabi ng NEDA, kahit noong paman, bago pa man ipasang amyanda sa Public Service Act, wala sa border. Wala sa, at NEDA na to, ha, wala sa constitutional restrictions ang problema. So, nandito po sa loob ang problema. Ibig sabihin, sa bawat industriya. At wala po tayong at wala, wala pa tayong ginagawa sa Senado kahit matagal nang nakasalang ang OADT o Open Access in Data Transmission Bill. So yung uh, una sa last two questions ko sa ngayong hapon, Mr. Chair, sa palagay po ba natin ay papasok ang kapital, Pilipino man o dayuhan, kung nakikita nilang may dalawang higanteng nakahambalang at walang ginagawa ang Kongreso upang payagan ng iba na ayusin ang serbisyo sa mas murang halaga. So... To Mr. Africa still, uh, Mr. Chair. Favorite resource person, uh, Sunny. So, uh, please listen to the question. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, pa, I can't speculate okay. if a big telecom provider will come here. But I think historically, um, a lot of transnational corporations have come in, even if my corruption, as long as they have the connections to be the ones taking the, getting the inside track. Um, so that's a general statement lang po, but kung dun sa specific na question yan, um, I, I don't know. But also to be clear, even the big telecommunication firms, they do have substantial foreign capital already. So they know how the business operates. So it's not like, again, it's not like bulag sila, na mag table read pa sila kung kumusay mga bagay-bagay. They know how things operate. And I think if it, that is going to be an advantage for them, they will use that. And last point po, in a lot of ways, a lot of the anti-corruption um, campaigning the last years has been led by foreign transnational corporations sa mga jurisdictions na wala silang kilala. Sa mga jurisdiction na may kilala sila, gagamitin na lang same connections nila, just the same as any domestic um, provider. Salamat, uh, Mr. Africa. Tuling tanong ko para ngayong hapon, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, alam po ba natin na uh, sa, sa Thailand, lubhang mas mura ang serbisyo at mas mabilis at malawak ang internet. Pero sila po ay may batas din na nagsasabing bawal maging majority owners ang dayuhan. Uh, gayon pa man, yung apat sa top five na telecoms companies nila ay nakapagpasok ng kapital. Uh, like you were saying earlier that many of these big transnationals, kahit sa telecom sector, uh, may sarili ng uh, foreign uh, capital na, uh, sa sa resources nila, nakapagpasok ng kapital mula sa mga kumpanya sa Singapore, China, at saka Norway. So, alam po ba natin ito? And could you please uh, enlighten us further uh, about this? I think but that's, that's a very good point kasi um, sa aming pagkwenta, um, Thailand has a 49% cap on foreign ownership. Malaysia has 30%, um, 49% for certain services. Vietnam is capped at 49%. Um, Indonesia is also capped at 49% um, for, the, for the infrastructure, for the infrastructure, the facilities. So I think that is a good case in point. Um, yung demonization ng publicly own corporations and also demonization of local corporations. Pinakita na maraming mga kumpanya dito sa, dito sa ating region, hindi actually balaki doon. As long as pinapatakbo ng tama. At para sa amin, kung bubuksan lamang yan, yung ilang beses na nabanggit na lack of control over a strategic industry, actually mas delikado yun. Kung di natin alam ang ginagawa natin, mas mahirap actually ibigay sa dayuhan yon. Kasi kung di na nga natin na monitor yung Local. What, what more? Wala tayong kakayan to monitor yung di hamak, mas makapangirin, mas malakas, mas nakakalamadayuan. So delikado po yun in terms of national security interest natin. Salamat, Mr. Chair. And uh, when I come back in the second round, I'll take off from that point. Precisely yung reaction ko sa ideya ni Presidente ngayon magpasok ng third party, posibleng foreign. Eh, hindi nga natin mapabehave ng maayos pa yung NGCP. Ano pa kaya kung may third party at uh, kung foreign pa yun. So, uh, marami salam. And, and lastly, uh, I think what you've pointed out, Mr. Africa, is it, it's not one single or most important factor, FDIs. It's a whole package of policies and uh, practices uh, para uh, uh, mapakinabangan talaga ng bansa, ng public good, uh, lalo na dito sa mga public utilities natin at saka critical industries. Salamat at thank you very salamat, much, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Deputy Minority Leader Ontiveros. I'll give you two minutes, uh, Mr. Dumdum. -Dum. Please uh, be brief. Okay. I just wanted to interject that, um, so first of all, the question on the other countries that have uh, restrictions, the question is, are those restrictions in their constitutions? The answer is no. Only the Philippines has such economic 
anti-foreign direct investment restrictions in the Constitution. Yung po yung pinagkaiba sa atin nasa Constitution, sa kanila nasa legislation. Ito pa, uh, yung isa pa about the pledges. Magkano po yun? Mga trillion, trillion, something trillion. Two diba? something trillion is trillion, what I heard. Diba? Dollars, okay. dollars, no? Dollars. Okay, ang, tanong, ang tanong, bakit nga bakit ba ginagawa natin itong constitutional reform na ito? Unang-una, tanong ko, kasi yung, ang sagot ko ay tanong. Eh, ilan dun, ilan dun sa mga investment pledges na yan ay naging totoo na? Ilan ba yung mga planta na natuloy na na, 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 na itatag? Ilan na ba yung mga pabrika? Ilan, ba, ilan, ilan na ba yung mga kumpanya o yung mga operations, yung mga opisina na nagbukas? dahil dun sa mga pledges. Mukhang pledges pa lang yata eh. At dun po natin makikita dahil mga pledges pa lamang sila. Kaya natin ginagawa itong pagbabago na ito dahil mara madalas kapag nag-iimbita po tayo ng mga investors, hindi po natin nasasabi sa kanila may mga problema tayo na ganyan, yung mga restrictions na yan. So eventually, dun sila nag-aalma. Ay, may restrictions pala kayo. Kaya kailangan natin ayusin. Yun po yun. Maraming salamat po. Uh, Sir Dum -Dum. Uh, next is uh, Senator Win and after him Senator Bato and Senator Aimee, Senator Pia in that order. Thank you. Uh, Senator Win. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to direct my questions to our esteemed uh, justices. Uh, I was listening intently and there seems to be two schools of thought. No? One is to convene physically as a constituent assembly. And then number two is we can go through it just like any other ordinary legislation, meaning we pass the resolution here, then we transmit it to the House, they pass it, uh, they, 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 they either adopt it or they pass their own version. And then if there are no uh, disagreeing provisions, we can just uh, continue on with the uh, plebiscite. Um, I just want to ask our experts, it seems to be two different uh, approaches. What will be the best way to move forward with these two different approaches. And I would like to direct to any of our uh, justices if they have any um, opinion on this uh, or any answer to this question. Yes, uh, go ahead. Uh, anybody would, would care to answer? Parang pagod na yata ang ating mga resource person. <laughs> Your Honor. <laughs> Yes. No. For, for Anybody me, can, uh, Mr. Justice Chair, Ascuna, yes. the best is what you are doing now uh, through a joint resolution of both houses, uh, passed separately uh, in the manner of ordinary legislation, but with clear signals that you are acting uh, as a constituent assembly. Uh, and then adopt it by the required number of votes. Uh, and also when you vote, uh, you have to vote uh, by, uh, by, by what you call this nominal voting so that the three-fourths vote is very clear. You cannot do it by consensus or viva voce. Uh, it has to be by nominal voting, recording uh, individual votes. If you can have that, three-fourths of the Senate voting uh, to approve resolution of both houses number six, and uh, pass it to the House, and the House also after deliberation uh, adopts the same resolution uh, by three-fourths vote, uh, nominal voting of uh, the members of the House, then it's ripe for referral to the COMELEC uh, for uh, upon certification by the, uh, by the secretaries and the uh, Senate President Speaker uh, to, to the COMELEC and the COMELEC will be mandated to hold the plebiscite within uh, the required, I think, uh, uh, 60 days uh, from the adoption, not later than 90 days, within 60 to 90 days to hold the plebiscite. Uh, that's the best way and the fastest uh, for me, Mr. Just, Chair. Just so you, you, what you're, in your opinion, there's no need to physically convene as a single assembly. We can go through this just like we are doing now and just like any other ordinary law. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. The uh, only difference is we have to vote, uh, we have to uh, obtain three-fourths in terms of votes and at the same time ratify it through a plebiscite. Uh, 
Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, there's no need to, for both houses to meet physically. Uh, this is the uh, interpretation of Father Bernas. You can do it like the way you're passing an ordinary law. That means you can do it without meeting together, provided, uh, as I said, it's very clear that you're acting not to make a law, but to propose amendments to the Constitution. But uh, also, again, the quorum and the required number of votes must be observed. I want to, with your permission, Senator, we just to acknowledge the presence of our chairperson of the Public Services and Economic Affairs Committee, Senator Grace Poe. Your Honor, just on that particular issue. Ah, yes, Chief Justice, yeah. please. The best really is the one you recommended in your uh, Senate, uh, uh, both houses resolution number one. You are proposing for a joint session, and therefore it must be voting separately, but three fourths for each side, for each house. That is in your resolution. Thank you, but that calls for a physical uh, convening of both houses in one area, in, in, in one location. Um, so do we need to, do we need to satisfy that physical um, assembly, uh, Chief Justice, in your opinion? One, uh, the Senate President and uh, there are no rules yet, no, in both the Senate and in the House in calling for a joint session. So probably the Senate President and the Speaker will agree to call the two houses together in a joint session. The other way is probably for the Senate now to file a resolution requesting for uh, the approval by the lower house of a joint session. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, another question, uh, again, to our esteemed um, legal luminaries. Uh, and this was partly opened up earlier in the discussion, that um, we are now treating the resolution as an ordinary resolution. And this is uh, the Committee on Constitutional Amendments. Uh, after the hearing, uh, the committee will now submit a, a committee report uh, and sponsored by the chairman or the, both chairmen uh, to, the, to plenary. And I am of the, um, I, but what I gathered from the hearing is then on, the Senate will now convene into a constituent assembly. You know, therefore, the, the, the earlier our Senate president mentioned that there'll be a separate time for that constituent assembly. My question is, can the constituent assembly be limited by the committee report submitted to plenary? because the committee report will contain very specific provisions on the economy. But when you convene the co constituent assembly, can it be limited by those topics alone? Because it's now a, a separate body from the lawmaking body. So I, I just want to pick on the uh, wisdom of our esteemed uh, justices and um, resource persons. That is the reason why I suggested two ways. Either that uh, the Senate President and the Speaker shall decide to call, no? And then the two bodies, the lower house and the upper house, may decide to a joint session, precisely for the purpose of presenting these proposed amendments. So the other way is uh, right now, for instance, you can either proceed to continue and then at the end of the day, when the matter is submitted to the mother committee, the mother committee may recommend to call for a joint session precisely to consider this. And that is exactly the reason in my pre preliminary statement, I asked the question whether whatever is the recommendation that the subcommittee should still be submitted to the mother committee, which is the committee on uh, constitutional amendments and revisions of codes. That is exactly the proposal you made in Senate, uh, uh, both houses, uh, resolution number one. And in the, in the organization of the Constituent Assembly, just here in the Senate, it can be limited by that committee report because it will consider 
that committee that particular committee report meaning it will not consider the other political um, uh, proposals or other proposals other than that committee report that, yes that it would be limited exactly to what is being proposed but yet the whole trouble is during the hearing thereon, somebody may oh, move to amend to add it has to be there, there has to be discipline among the, the members. Best, the best example is, in your proposal, you included media. In the discussion of uh, resolution number uh, Senate uh, joint, uh, or rather the, uh, the both six. houses resolution number six, number one may be taken into account, and therefore the four may be taken into consideration by the mother community. And I understand also in the previous Congress, I think 18 Congress, the House also submitted, uh, although this is in the previous Congress, uh, three additional amendments to its economic provisions, no? uh, which is uh, land ownership, natural resources, and um, I think it's the uh, uh, ownership of um, economic enterprises. No? Can that be included once they also convene into a constituent assembly. My, my point of the matter, Chief Justice, how do we limit the constituent assembly to only certain provisions that we want to amend so that it will not be unwieldy when it convenes? Let's consider when you are doing this as a regular uh, legislation. What you approve here would be an, uh, an ordinary law going down to the lower house. I rather disagree with uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Mendoza on this regard, that it is already a constituent body. It is an ordinary legislation going to the lower house. The lower house acting on their own will consider possible amendments. It could add other areas of amendments. Like for instance, as I mentioned earlier, the proposal in uh, the lower house, uh, both houses resolution number two of uh, Congressman Salceda. We'd just like to, with your permission, Senator Wynn, just to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Senator Alan Peter Cayetano, the former Speaker of the House and our former Majority Leader. Good afternoon, sir. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for that, uh, Chief Justice Davide. Thank you for the answers. And my last question revolves around uh, the specific industries uh, or sectors that we're trying to liberalize. No? Uh, in the proposal here in the Senate, there are two resolutions. Uh, one is to liberalize the education sector, advertising, mass media, and then public utilities. May I ask um, our esteemed legal luminaries, what was the reason in the past? What was the discussion and the reason in the past to limit these four sectors? Um, I might have uh, my own idea on, on why, but during those times in 1986 and even earlier, what was this discussion to limit those so that we can enrich the records? And also, I want to, to, to appreciate um, uh, the discussions earlier that might lead to unintended consequences also when we do this at, at this present day. So any, any of our steam resource persons can respond to that question. We have to consider the spirit behind uh, all the proposals here in the Constitution. It's the spirit of nationalism and patriotism, or the Filipino first policy. We, we thought all along that uh, we could manage to improve our economy, our social conditions, through these provisions on the fundamental principles and policies and uh, the implementing uh, articles uh, in the Constitution. You have provided, for instance, uh, the article on social justice, so broad enough, on labor, on many things. If only these are fully implemented, you could see how progressive the Philippines would be. For instance, on foreign investments, uh, our uh, dear Senator Ontiveros uh, uh, had already mentioned of what had come in, even just through the visit of the president abroad. So foreign investors are coming in, not because of any provision in the Constitution which would be an obstacle, but because we have become attractive. In other words, ease in conducting business, no corruption, 
then uh, predictable uh, government policies, and so on. These are the keys to progress, not the provision of the Constitution as an obstacle. Uh, I think Mr. Dumdum wants to... Yes, sir. Go, uh, again, uh, please keep it brief. Sir. Yeah. So, um, so back then, during the, uh, the, the drafting of the 1987 Constitution back in 1986, I think the prevailing uh, ideology at the time among many Filipinos was that um, being protectionist was the way to go. But unfortunately, I think that's where we kind of went wrong because at that point in time, that was when Vietnam had decided that their way of doing things, the communist, Marxist, Leninist way was not working. And they realized that, oops, I think we need to open up to foreign direct investors, hence their adoption of the Doi Moi reforms. And everyone else was also doing the same. Singapore had already become very liberalized and everyone else in the region was doing so. We were the only country that decided to stick towards economic nationalism and unfortunately, we have uh, been left behind. We are continuously getting left behind because of that. Thank you, um, Sir Dum Dum. Uh, proceeding from the constitutional questions of uh, Senator Wynne, before I recognize uh, Senator Bato, what is the value, Your Honors, of the U.S. experience uh, in exercising their constitutional amendments or uh, uh, enacting constitutional amendments uh, since uh, Justice Mendoza quoted the uh, seminal case of uh, Marbury versus Madison earlier? Uh, may I ask, is, would their constitutional experience have any uh, persuasive uh, uh, effect or, or, on, or would their jurisprudence have any effect on our uh, interpretation of laws and constitutions, uh, Your Honors? <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, the U.S. Constitution has been amended several times. I think more than 20 times. Uh, in fact, the Bill of Rights... 27, I believe, Your Honor, 27. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Bill of Rights was not in the original Constitution. There are amendments. That's why they're called First Amendment, Second Amendment. Uh, I would, what I want to point out is that uh, their process of amending their Constitution is through uh, adoption by s separate states. Uh, and this, uh, the legislature of separate states uh, passes a resolution adopting the proposed amendment according to the requirement of the respective constitution. So uh, there is no meeting together of all the more than 50 states legislature so that they can hear each other. They meet separately. So there's nothing wrong with uh, the Senate and the House meeting separately. In the U.S., the individual states don't meet with each other. They adopt the amendment uh, uh, by themselves. Uh, and after a certain number of states have acceded to the amendment, it is effective. So that's what I know of their procedure. And, and if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Your Honor, but I think the Senate and the House do not also sit together in a joint assembly, tama ba? Meaning the Senate passes the amendment separately, the House passes the amendment separately, and then it goes to the uh, state legislatures, as you mentioned. Tama ba, Your Honor? Uh, I'm not sure on the federal level, uh, Mr. Chair. I think they, it is, uh, they meet together. But uh, what I mean is the individual states, all 50 states don't meet together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Just so wanted to add there, um, what he's talking, what uh, the good justice is talking about is the process of ratification, which is different from ours. Ours... No, but I'm, I'm, what I'm asking, uh, since it yeah, was yeah, my no, question, so was, Your Honor, I, I was is saying, uh, the process of uh, approving the amendment, yes, yes. not so I, just, I just wanted to point out that yeah. what he was describing yeah. about the individual 50, sta the, the 50 states is actually the process of ratification, That's correct. which, which comes correct. after That's the Constituent Assembly That's process correct. Thank has you. been done. Thank you. That's Mr. All. Chairman, uh, one line on your question. Uh, can, can we ask the justices to answer the question before we go to you, uh, Senator Allen? Yeah, any other, uh, no, if not, I'll go to any other, anyone else want to weigh in on the uh, import of U.S. Uh, practice on our constitutional uh, interpretation, Your Honors? If there is none, uh, Senator Allen, yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a point of information, because the U.S. Constitution was a reaction to royalty, diba? to the uh, absolute power of uh, kings and queens in Europe. So it was really made that the Congress was more powerful than the president, the presidency. So if you look at the U.S. Constitution, mas powerful kasi yung uh, legislature. So my protection against absolute power, because in the Philippines, it's usually the executive branch, whether it's the mayor, governor, or president who wants the change. It's not always absolute, but just to put that into the discussion, Mr. That's, a, that's a good point. Uh, thank you, Senator Allen. Uh, Senator Bato, you have the floor. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have no question, Mr. Chair. Ang sa akin lang ay isang uh, taus-pusong pagpasalamat sa ating mga resource person, sa kanilang mga insights, sa kanilang mga binigay sa atin na informasyon na ito yung napakalaking uh, justification sa United Stand na ginawa ng 24 senador, uh, 24 independent republics, nagkaisa na i-oppose itong uh, lumalaganap na People's Initiative. Mr. Chair, because yung kanilang, kanilang uh, punto palagi is uh, voting separately. So tayo naman, ang ating opposition doon sa lumalaganap na PI is that uh, we don't want to both uh, jointly, separately. So, maraming salamat po sa inyo, sir, sa inyong mga insights. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tama po, Senator Bato. Klarong-klaro na po yun dahil sa uh, sinabi ng ating mga uh, magagaling na resource persons. Thank you. I join Senator Bato's manifestation there. Uh, next is uh, Senator Pia Cayetano. Uh, Senator Pia, perhaps you... Uh, you had some questions earlier. It's, it's, uh, you're free. I just want to mention also, Senator Pia is the author of the recently enacted, well, about two, three years ago, the CREATE law. And there, uh, a lot of what was mentioned, that things that we need to do, meaning to incentivize technology transfer, uh, scientific development, uh, not just the jobs created and the amount of investment, but also the future growth. Uh, meron tayo mga provisions, so thanks to under the stewardship of Senator Pia, uh, former Ways and Means Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to also greet our uh, esteemed uh, resource persons. Um, my my uh, professor, uh, Vivi Mendoza, if you remember me, sir. Uh, of course, uh, Chief Justice uh, Davide, we worked very closely when you were uh, uh, our emissary to the United Nations. And of course, um, uh, Secretary Tevez, who I recently have been seeing on the golf course, but then I stopped, so goodbye to my golf career. <laughs> Anyway, to everyone else, um, good afternoon, um, Justice Ascon as well, and Dr. Sikat, and everybody else. Um, Mr. President, a few, Mr. Chairman, a few questions. Um, as you said, no, my, I'm coming from my experience as uh, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, and one of our resource persons, I was, by the way, um, listening, uh, thanks to technology, I was listening to YouTube, so I, I heard the opening statements of our colleagues and the statements of our resource person, so I may not have been physically present, but some of my questions come from the statements that were made that I caught uh, on YouTube. Um, one of the resource persons mentioned the flip-flopping of, uh, of our, um, our uh, rules or our... Uh, um, uh, the way we conduct business and the way we we encourage the uh, the uh, foreign business um, community, and that is exactly what we tackled during the hearings in the Committee on Ways and Means. And so, when we talk about flip flopping positions as we speak, and th th this is no um, critique or anything on the ongoing hearings uh, now, but in fact, we are reviewing again uh, the the create law. <laughs> And one of the revisions being, one of the proposals there is to go back to the incentives that were, that were, that was given to some uh, investors that have been there for 30 years or more. And this has been thoroughly discussed. Um, we appreciate that the investments have been made, but it's also time for us to gain a little bit from the taxes that would have been gained. So if we're going to go back to that, then that is our main problem, if I may. As I'm not the resource person, but I'm sharing my uh, experience having uh, chaired this committee and going back and forth, and many of our colleagues here uh, were also present during that Congress. So that to me is, is the flip-flopping of, uh, of uh, business um, policies that the foreigners have to deal with. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is 
uh, one of the examples given by my seatmate here, Mr. Africa of uh, Ibon, um, is the example of the jeepney modernization. It happens to be one of my favorite topics along with Senator Grace Po, um, because I am a proponent of electric vehicles, EV for short, but I am not a proponent of destroying this jeepney industry, which is ingrained in our culture, and changing them with imported vehicles when we could very well be revitalizing this jeepney industry and then making it EV. It's a no-brainer. I'm sure DOST can easily do that. In fact, I have, I've had discussions with the Department of Science and Technology. Why don't we do that? And there is no prohibition for, for um, um, foreigners to participate in that, but it is a lack of political will to save this industry. It is lack of political will to coordinate between DOST, Department of Transportation, the barangays and the municipalities and the cities that have invested their lives in building uh, a community around this jeepney industry. It takes time. It's easier to import. That is our problem. It's just easier to import. We didn't make it hard for them. They can come in, but we're destroying this industry. So that's the second point I'd like to make, Mr. President. Um, the other one is just a quick uh, observation. I share the observation of Mr. Dum Dum that uh, he mentioned Vietnam, but other countries, um, Thailand is one, uh, China is another. They are harping on the need to improve their English so that they can capture the English speaking market. But you don't need to change the constitution for that. That's been my advocacy for decades. Uh, I speak on behalf of our EDCOM chairman members. It's part of the agenda. Let's not lose our competitive advantage by giving up on uh, us being a dual language or even um, multi, multi language speaking people. Many of the Filipinos can speak three languages uh, English, Filipino, and whatever province they come from. And we're giving that up because of various reasons. Don't have enough time to discuss that. But you don't need to change the constitution to focus on our primary, uh, one of our primary assets being multi multilingual and English being one of them. Um, just a quick observation. I think one of the resource persons said, and I asked my staff, are you ready? Yeah, I just want to put on record. Okay. So according to the World Economic Forum, and this is already in the Senate, um, uh, this is already embedded in our archives because we took this up in the Committee on Ways and Means in the debates on CREATE. Uh, most problematic factors in doing business. Number one, inefficient government bureaucracy. You don't have to change the, the constitution for that. Inadequate supply of infrastructure. Don't have to change the constitution for that. Three, corruption. Don't have to change the constitution for that. Tax regulations. We can handle that here. Tax rates, we can handle that. When I say here, Congress can handle that. Policy instability, I'll point to the administration. Not this administration, any administration. Access to financing, policy decision. Government instability and coups, all this is creating that possibility. Uh, restrictive labor regulations, policy decision, maybe Congress. And poor work ethic in national labor force. None of this requires constitutional change. Um, I, I quote, not, not in exact words, no, but as I said, I was listening. Sabini, Justice Davide, our problems are not due to the restrictive economic provisions. I humbly concur, and I, in, in my second round, would like to get into more details, but I think we would, it would be nice if our justices can bear with us and join us when we have other um, other resource persons from the business side, no? Because we'd really like to get a a, uh, a nice um, exchange, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you will allow. No, what I'd like is to hear the uh, not now, but like I said, in a in a in a succeeding hearing, an exchange of ideas or where our justices who know what the constitutions allow and do not allow can hear and exchange ideas with the business community on on what they feel they need 
so that either it comes from the constitutional experts themselves telling them, but you don't need to change the constitution to do that, or you do need to change the constitution to do that. This is just my opinion. I don't, it's not my, my intention to put words in the mouth of our esteemed uh, resource person. Um, the other thing that I took note of is uh, Justice Mendoza's statement, the constitution is the alternative to a revolution. And I, I, I felt that was such an emotional statement. We're sitting here today, we are already late for our Senate um, session. Uh, on the floor is... Um, that might be my cue to tell us that... Uh, for me to end the, No, 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 the <laughs> SP extended us to four o'clock, Your Honor. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, but so I, I, he's but extending us to four o'clock, yeah. Exactly, so. but I mean, I mean, we are eating into <laughs> our time yes. to work on bills. Yes. Which no? just shows that the Senate is really prioritizing this issue. Uh, exactly. Go ahead, ma'am. Sorry, sorry for interruption. No, 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 no. Uh, totally okay. And, and on a personal note, I was recently elected Blue Ribbon Chairman, and I had a choice to be working on this all morning or to listen to this debate. So these are the, these are the things we give up to have this debate. These are the things we give up so that we don't have a revolution. Anyway, I think I will rest on that high note because that was a, an amazing uh, statement from Justice Mendoza. I have, I have a few more comments, a few more observations, but I think I've made my point clear, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Pia. Next is Senator Grace Poe, uh, if she has any questions. Uh, if not, uh, Senator Allen, uh, I'm sure has some. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, but at the proper time, uh, I would like to discuss uh, for the next hearing, the Public Service Act, which I believe addresses a lot of the concerns uh, supposedly being raised on the economy. I feel that one of the roadblocks also is the legal impediments that it supposedly faces in the Supreme Court. So I'd like to know our, from our uh, legal advisors and luminaries present what their view is on the Public Service Act, because actually it is not quite an amendment of the Constitution, but rather a carved out and a definition of what a public utility and a public service is. And this was uh, drafted with the help of uh, our brilliant expert here in the Senate, Senator Frank Grillon. So that will take a whole uh, discussion. So I will give way to our colleague here, Senator Cayetano. Thank you. Very much. We will call a hearing specifically on the public service and public utility. Let me welcome your inputs as the author, principal author of the Public Service Act amendments. Uh, Senator Allen, please, sir. Magandang hapon, Mr. Chairman, and again to our esteemed guest. Uh, we are very, very honored to have all of you. And uh, parang extended po talaga ang service nyo sa bansa. Every time you think that you've uh, retired or that you've given all, uh, you're called back. So we thank you for that. Um, sirs, I think we can really debate on facts. Dapat nga walang debate sa facts, eh, di ba? Kasi facts eh. Pero in a world of false news, uh, alternative facts, nagdi-disagree din tayo sa facts. Especially if it's statistics, then hindi siya facts. No? Um, we definitely have to debate on opinion. And it's always good to hear each other's uh, opinion. But I think uh, dapat walang debate sa principle eh. Diba? Kasi hindi mo mababasag yung or mababali yung principle. You, you cannot really say magtatanim ako ng manga and then you expect uh, santol yung, yung bunga. Diba? Kasi kung ano itanim mo, yun ang yung... So, so lo, let me look at it as a different perspective. Ah. As a Christian, I believe the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible and you cannot amend the Bible. So I tell people, if you don't want to believe the Bible, I respect you. If you believe other holy books, I respect you. But don't try to amend the Bible because that, to me, is what God wrote. Uh, no one is saying, don't amend the Constitution. Because no one said, it's not a perfect document. But what is the underlying principle uh, behind the, the Constitution? And why did the framers of the Constitution make it difficult to amend the Constitution. And sir, feel free to correct me after this statement. No? Correct me or to elaborate. No? Because the, the underlying principle all throughout history, it started with Adam and Eve, and even before that, it started with Lucifer, who rebelled against God, and then Adam and Eve, who did not follow God. Nimrod was a, a brilliant leader 
and he wanted to to erect the, the Tower of Babel and to reach heaven. No? And the principle was simple. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if you're going to ask me my personal stand, meron pong kapareho nung ating uh, ma distinguished guest tonight. Meron din pong iba. For example po, one thing we're not talking about, the elephant in the room, is actually political reforms. I know we're limited here to economic, but the reality is people are concerned regarding political reforms. Ako being, mayor, be, being married to a mayor, I see the problem with a three-year term. Eh? You get into office June, ubus na pondo mo, you just finish out the year, the next year is your year, your year to plan. The year after, everyone saying it's the election year na, the year after, year, ano na, di ba? So I would rather have a four-year term uh, or a five-year term, three-year um, term limit or a four-year term na walang term limit. I don't know the former mayors here like Senator Wynn kung anong tingin nila. But the problem is we can't discuss it because everyone is discussing it from the point of view of what's good for them rather for the country. No? So even if many of our congressmen, mayors, governors are sincere, Hindi na sila tatakbo, magre-retire na sila. But people will say, but you're thinking about your husband, you're thinking about your wife, you're thinking about your children, di ba? So, Mr. Chairman, the only way I think that we can actually amend the Constitution in a way that the preamble describes us as binding together, wanting... Maybe I can end with that, no? I'll, I'll, I just want to read the preamble just to honor not only Chief Justice Davide, but, but everyone who worked on the Constitution. But my point is this po, no? If we can find a way to amend the Constitution, but it is effective 10 years from now, I don't think anyone will accuse any one of us na we're doing this because of power, etc. Pero pagka next month na yung plebiscite, uh, 2025 na yung plebiscite, I mean, oh, come on. Everyone's looking kung sinong malakas na next presidential, and if hindi ka presidential, pero cabinet ka, or speaker, or SP, and you can be prime minister, but you cannot be president. I mean, it's normal. You name the country, people, they say, because the principle is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely, that's why the Constitution was made to temper this power in the three branches and to make sure that not one powerful group can manipulate our legal system. No? So, but let me, let me conclude just, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I really you know, want to honor everyone who worked on the preamble. We, the sovereign Filipino people, imploring the aid of Almighty God in order to build a just and humane society and establish a government that shall establish, that shall embody our ideals and aspirations, promote the common good, conserve and develop our patrimony, and secure to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of independence and democracy under the rule of law in a regime of truth, justice, freedom, love, equality, and peace, do ordain and promulgate this constitution. I hope throughout this debate, Mr. President, this will guide us, kasi opposite ng truth, justice, freedom, love, equality, and peace ang nangyayari ngayon. But I, I hope, uh, Mr. Chief Justice and all our distinguished guests, you, you could elaborate nga on why the constitution was made very protective that you can't just change it on a whim. No? Uh, I know that's part of the human spirit we don't want to talk about, but it's there. Eh? So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this time. Thank you very much for the biblical wisdom in addition to the legal wisdom, uh, uh, Senator Allen. Yeah, um, any other, maybe Senator Risa wants to ask a few questions. I you can have two to three minutes maybe for a second round. Uh, and then I think uh, if it's all right with our distinguished resource persons, we've. Uh, Thank, we thank you profusely for uh, sharing with us your time, uh, Your Honors. Yeah. Salamat, Mr. Chair. I, I'll not refuse <laughs> that kind of an offer. I, I do have two to three more questions. Uh, economic, but then if I could return to uh, Mr. Africa. Mr. Africa. Yes. Uh, uh, if he's listening. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, sir. It's yeah. okay. It's okay, Paul. Yeah. If I could ask maybe two or three more questions about uh, the economy in relation po dito sa RBH number six. Two minutes. Two minutes. So, um, 
sa, sa power generation sector okay. naman uh, within the whole realm of uh, public uh, utilities, public ser and public services. So, brownout pa ng brownout, uh, parang uh, uh, shades of the early 1990s. At sa huli, tatlong araw nag-blackout uh, hanggang sa Panay at sa Kagimaras Islands. So, uh, alam po ba natin, and uh, of course by this, I, I mean, if you could please elaborate on this for us, na higit dalawang dekada ng bukas ang power generation sector, as Chris Monson also mentioned earlier, para sa 100% na pagmamayari ng banyaga. Pero sa dalawang dekadang iyon, ay hindi naman naingganyo na maglagak ng kapital dito yung mga dayuhan para suplayan ng kulang at pupundat-pundat nating kuryente. So, bakit po kaya? I Amin mean, po, balik kami dun sa earlier na point, mahirap i-manage ang industriya na wala kang alam. So, kung uurungan ng gobyerno yung pagkakaroon ng direct interest sa industriya ng, ng kuryente, tapos aasa ka lang sasabihin sa'yo ng kumpanya, parang weird, di ba? Parang sabihin mo dun sa kumpanya to be self-incriminating. So, sa amin, it is a starting point. That's also why I think, bakit sa Malaysia, sa Indonesia, maraming um, may restriction dun sa foreign investment, but also may direct stake yung governments in utilities because it's easier to manage things you know about eh. So, sa amin, we don't know what happens sa Visayas. Siyempre, nakakatawa yung pakinggan yung balita. But bottom line, it's hard to manage but you don't know anything about. And sa amin, that whole trend towards privatization, isang nawala yun eh, yung kakayanan natin bilang gobyerno na responsibly manage ang isang industriya. So much worse nga yan. Hindi maganda na hindi mo kontrol ang lokal na negosyante. I think even worse, hindi mo kontrol ang dayo negosyante na may ibang dimension ng strategic interest sa bansa. So I guess, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Africa, ibig sabihin din, uh, magandang may uh, paghuhunos dili din ang gobyerno in terms of privatization, especially in sectors na may mas malaking public interest at stake. And umalam. No? We can't forever give the excuse na hindi yan alam ng gobyerno, mas alam lagi ng private sector. Maganda kung mag-upscale uh, din ang capacities ang gobyerno precisely to take care of and to regulate areas na siya yung pangunahing magbabantay ng public good uh, for, the, for the citizens. And balance yung Siyempre, profit uh, orientation naman ng, uh, na nasa kalikasan ng private sector. Mr. Chair, yung next question ko, kung pwedeng matanong si Christian Monsod, if he's still online, since... Uh, yes, he, ay, salamat, he's Mr. Still Chair. still online, uh, yes. Aunt Teresa. So, Sir Chris, uh, to, to continue and to ask you to... I'm circling back to the point you, you first made uh, about the power generation sector in your opening statement. Sorry, uh, oh, yes, I received uh, just the information now. Aunt Teresa, he's logged out already, huh? Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if uh, Mr. Africa, you could bear with me just to complete this uh, maybe last two questions about the power generation sector. So, alam po ba natin na sa Vietnam naman, tulad dito sa Pilipinas, nagbukas sa mga dayuhan para sila pumasok sa generation sector. Pero generation, hindi sa transmission, hindi sa distribution. Pero bakit po kaya, kahit halos sinlaki lang tayo ng Vietnam, population-wise, um, bakit ka yung installed capacity nila ngayon ay lumaki ng halos tatlong beses, 2.86 times, halos triple, na ang laki kumpara sa installed power generation capacity ng uh, Pilipinas. So what was the uh, decisive factor there or factors? Yung infrastructure, magastos talaga siya. Um, so napakataas ng, ng startup loan. Kaya nga kaya natural monopoly sila. I think Vietnam is a good case in point kasi much as maraming naiinis dun sa pakikialam ng, ng Vietnamese government kasi socialista, komunista, whatever, hindi pa masasabing terorista. Ang bottom line, there were and are state-owned enterprises at kung state-owned enterprise yung papasok, una, masababa yung cost of capital. <laughs> Ikalawa, Mas madali yung mga licensing, all the regulatory issues, parang that's ironed over eh. So I think magandang point yan at um, siguro kailangan din i-correct. Hindi totoo na bukas na bukas yung Vietnam. Um, Doon sa aming PowerPoint, sabi din namin yung report, yung restrictions across the Vietnamese economy from um, telecommunications to power to transport, very strongly restricted pa rin siya apart from having state-owned enterprise, even sa manufacturing. So, um, 
hindi totoo na free market economy in Vietnam. Um, hindi rin totoo na pumasok yung foreign investment dahil free market economy siya. Pumasok ang foreign investment kasi may mga pagkakitaan siya dun sa Vietnam. Under, not necessarily free market economy, under whatever um, economic regime na meron nila. Kumikita sila eh. And I think that's the bottom line for any foreign investor. And like uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Africa, you were um, showing how in different countries, sa uh, home region natin, may iba't ibang um, percentages uh, set or cap set on uh, foreign investments. Dito, sa particular na halimbawa ng Vietnam, pinapakita nyo rin, yun na nga, the, the package of policies and uh, business practices either allowed or supported and regulated by the state na the companies can turn a profit pero merong ding standard set by the government para sa mamamayan nila na mas strictly na ma-observe. Um, and then, kagaya po ng telecoms na pinag-usapan natin kanina, may nakahambala sa pagpasok ng kapital sa power generation at uh, hindi ang border restriction o ang constitutional provisions na naman ito. And as you were talking about, pinapatunayan din ito ng Vietnam na kahit Ha, as you were also describing, hawak pa rin ng gobyerno at lokal na kapital ang transmission at ang distribution ng kuryente. At kahit nga as you were enumerating for our, a region earlier, may maximum na 49% limit ang foreign capital dito sa transmission at distribution, ay maglalagay pa rin ng dayuhan ng kapital sa, sa power generation. Because given the whole environment uh, created by government and uh, what exists of civil society in Vietnam at yung private sector participation, domestic or or uh, foreign, ay kumikita pa rin yung mga kumpanya. So, just to bring it home, ano po kaya yung pumipigil uh, sa dayuhang kapital na magpundar ng mas maraming kapital sa power generation sector natin nitong nakaraang uh, dalawang dekada, Mr. Chair? <laughs> Siguro correction muna, as far as we know, yung in Vietnam, yung distribution and transmission ay sarado to foreign investment. As far as we know, I mean, we, we can double check that. Um, pero, I'm sorry po, I can't speak for foreign investors here, pero I think it makes sense eh, yung sinasabing predictability, even predictability of corruption, um, it, it, it's a big thing eh. Um, so whether it's predictability and the... Um, um, ease of doing business. I mean, there are different ways to package it. Um, mas more infrastructure, less corruption have been abide from our permits, less cumbersome. I think that actually might be what, what should be addressed. Eh. At gusto ko namin stress talaga, may mali sa pag-iisip na yung flexibility ang hinahanap ng foreign investors. Kasi because precisely in so many utilities in most of the region, at least in the major economies, Marami pang foreign restrictions, but they have more investment than us. Malaysia has thrice, I think, than us. Thailand has double us. Despite the restrictions in the utilities, it means hindi yung restriction yung nakabara sa pagpasok. So that's so simple-minded, I think it's a very reductionist argument to absurdity talaga. And I think it's so easy to repeat something over and over again and believe in it. Pero I, I think the facts show otherwise talaga. Salamat, Mr. Chair, Mr. Africa. So, sabi nyo nga... Uh, may I interject? Uh, Mr. Chair, my last question is still for Mr. Yeah. Africa. Uh, this is the time of right, uh, Senator Chair. Risa, so uh -huh. uh, will you allow Mr. Dumdum -Dum to interject? It's your call. <laughs> uh, it's your discretion. Just, yeah. Mr. Chair, I just, uh, you yeah. gave me time for two to three questions. Yeah, we, and my we'll, last we'll stop at four o'clock because that's, oh, the, that's the authority given to us oh, by and the And my last question is really for Mr. Africa. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, ma'am. economy, if, if I may. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And salamat, Mr. Africa, for pointing out yung... Uh, it's not the restrictions, it's not the so-called flexibility, but really more of uh, predictability, restrictions they can live with, but also enough space to still conduct their business there and, as you said, remain uh, sustainable, if not profitable. So, yung huli ko lang po for today dito sa power generation sector. So, uh, ngayon naman po sa pamamagitan ng legal opinion ng DOJ, ay madaming dayuhang kapital na ang nagplano at pumila para punan ang power supply gap na matagal ng sanhi ng napakamahal na kuryente dito sa atin. So, yung huling tanong ko for today, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Africa, pero nababalitaan po ba ninyo na maari daw madiskaril ito? Uh, ayon sa BDO, halimbawa, at ayon din sa mga bagong uh, renewable energy players dito sa atin, baka pala dobleng laking kapital ang 
kailangang ilaga kada megawatt ng renewable energy kaysa sa inaasahan nila. Alam po ba natin ang dahilan nito? RE was supposed to be the game changer uh, in the energy sector. So bakit ngayon there's a sudden unpredictability about that positive uh, next step that we'll be able to take? Heard about that po, but uh, I'll, I'll reserve comment lang po muna. Pwede naman may habol, but we want to study it further. Pero nabalitaan na nga po namin yan. So um, not, not now, sana po. Salamat, Mr. Africa. Salamat, Mr. Chair. Uh, abangan ko na lang or uh, konsultahin ko diretso si Mr. Africa once they've completed their study on, on that issue. All right. Uh, on that po, note, uh, I think uh, the sec gen has already come up to me, the sergeant at arms rather, uh, reminding me of the Senate, Senate President's reminder. So you can submit whatever you wish. Uh, we'll take cognizance of it, Mr. It'll Tum -tum. be very fast. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. okay. We're, we're adjourning. The, we're suspending the hearing already. Uh, please submit na lang. Uh, thank you to our justices, uh, Chief Justice Davide, Justice Mendoza, uh, Justice Ascuna, uh, Dr. Sikat, Sunny Africa, Mr. Dumdum, Secretary Tevez, Attorney Destura. Thank you very much for uh, your patience and for sharing your wisdom. So we'll suspend this with the permission of our members. Salamat po. Thank you, Chairman Robin, Idol. <laughs>